But my task today is to highlight his virtues and to pay tribute to the man, the person I knew from my interactions with him and my observations of him over a period of 37 years. Who was James Fitzalan Mitchell? Fundamentally, he was a human and a humble one at that. A humble man who loved, appreciated, cared about, and respected people. Many who served with him at different levels during his years in politics and government continue to refer to his outstanding attributes and to thank him for the positive role he played in their lives and in the development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Moments ago, before arriving at this church, I received a message from a friend in the USA, former senior public servant, who said to me, when I was leaving St. Vincent to go to the U.S. to study many years ago, Mr. Mitchell took off the watch he was wearing and gave it to me. I scarcely knew him. in 1985 when I was sitting in the public area in Barbados at the airport reading and I felt a light hand on my shoulder. When I looked up it was the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines accompanied by a Barbadian protocol officer. He said to me, I was sitting inside in the VIP lounge and I saw you out here and I came out to ask you to join me. We went in together and we chatted for a while until our individual flights were called. And on parting company on that day, I tried to thank him for the humbling experience and I shall never forget what he said to me then. He said, my friend, always be nice to the people you meet on the way up because you will meet them on the way down. It is a statement attributed to one Mr. Misner from the USA. I heard it then for the first time and have never forgotten it. His own published reflections highlight many positive relationships with people from all parts of life. He cherished good relationships and promoted the importance of healthy family relationships. Those close and dear to him testify that the bond between them grew even stronger during the years following his retirement from public office. The loving relationship he shared with his daughters and their families was especially evident in the final weeks and days of his life. During his illness and hospitalization, at least one of his daughters was with him 
at all times. Who was James Mitchell? He was a man with deep admiration and respect for women. He believed in the equality of the sexes and promoted the empowerment of women in politics, the public service, business, and other organizations. His excellent relationships with the late Eugenia Charles, former Prime Minister of Dominica, Miss Mia Motley, the much respected current Prime Minister of Barbados, who is scheduled to speak today in Bekwe, and other outstanding females over the years, bear ample example and testimony to his convictions regarding women. I recall his discussing with me the difficulty he had with the Genesis chapter 2 creation story about when and how woman was created. He could not accept the insinuation that the creation of woman was an afterthought by the omniscient, omnipotent God in whom he believed. He preferred instead the Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 declaration which states, quote, God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them. And if you knew James Ritchell well, when he quoted that, he said, full stop. That was the James Mitchell I knew. He was a very principled leader. A good judge of character who led and managed with a sense of decency, fairness, and justice. Here now, my dear friends, a sample of my own experiences of him in this regard. Sensitive as they may be to some people, they speak convincingly about the qualities of the man who served this nation in the high office of Prime Minister for 17 years. Shortly after his government took office in 1984, I was appointed chairman of the Central Water and Sewage Authority, the CWSA. I was 30 years young at the time. At successive meetings during the early months of my tenure, written instructions were issued to the manager by the minister responsible directing certain actions with which the board disagreed. One such disagreement was the directive to terminate the employment of certain named employees and to employ certain named others. There was no justifiable reason for the termination of the employment of those employees and the board instructed the manager to so inform the minister. One prominent member of the board, at the time an executive member of the governing party, visited the prime minister, complained 
that I was anti-government and recommended the revocation of my appointment. Mr. Mitchell looked him in the eye and smilingly said, thanks for bringing this to my attention. I wish I had two more like Monty Ball. The rest is history. I served as chairman of the CWSA for the 17 years of his government. And the results speak for themselves. You ask me today who was the Mitchell I knew and why I respected the man? Several years later, as chairman of an important government project, the minister whose ministry had oversight of the project wrote directly to me, literally instructing for stated political reasons the dismissal of certain truckers and the appointment of certain others. I immediately tendered my resignation. Upon receiving a copy of my resignation, Mr. Mitchell called me, advised his agreement with my position and action, told me that he was not accepting my resignation and that he had instructed the minister to get in touch with me as soon as possible and apologize for his behavior. I accepted the minister's apology and the project progressed well thereafter. That was the Mitchell I knew. I repeat, he was a highly principled man who led with a sense of fairness and decency. The board appointed to oversee a very important national project had determined for good reason that the services of two senior persons in management positions, in fact, they were the two senior managers of the project, should be terminated. The perceived difficulty with that decision was that one individual was the general secretary of the NDP and the husband of a cabinet minister and the other a contemporary friend of Mr. Mitchell who had been invited by him to return to St. Vincent from abroad for appointment to the position he held. The board, which included the distinguished Carl John, Beverly Brisbane, and Kingsley Lane, considered it imprudent, or certainly considered it prudent, to apprise the Prime Minister of the decision. And as chairman, I was delegated so to do. Embarrassing as it would have been for Mr. Mitchell, he agreed to support the decision, but indicated that in the circumstances, it was important for him to discuss the matter with his cabinet. The cabinet was scheduled to meet later that day. At approximately 6 p.m., Mr. Mitchell called me from the cabinet room, indicated that he was unable to persuade his colleagues to support the decision, and invited me via speakerphone to put the case to the cabinet. Later that night, 
after the meeting ended, he called me, advised the approval of the cabinet, but with the humble request that in our implementation of the decision, we do our best to avoid any embarrassment to the individuals concerned and to the government. Who was James Mitchell? He was the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the leader of government business in the House of Assembly, who on several occasions, when his colleagues collectively or privately expressed to him their dissatisfaction with the rulings of the then speaker, Mr. Moore, in favor of the opposition and suggested that the speaker, oh boy, some people love this term, suggested to the speaker, to, to, to the prime minister, that the speaker was anti-government. He counseled them. He said to them, you may not like his rulings against us, but the important thing is that he is right. Two very instructive, instructive examples of the principal leadership of James Mitchell in this regard were the occasions when I reversed at the meeting immediately following a ruling I had made supporting the government's interpretation of the standing orders in relation to the number of questions allowed. The other was when, notwithstanding strong opposition by the government and solid representation by senior legal counsel, including an imminent former Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago, I held to my position and allowed the presentation and debate of a no confidence motion submitted by the opposition. His colleagues were visibly upset and embarrassed that the rulings went against them. But the Prime Minister was pleased that the rulings in his judgment were the correct ones. James Mitchell? Who was the James Mitchell I knew? He was a man with a profound belief in one, in the one true living God of this universe. And from this vantage point, I simply want to repeat that. He was a man with a profound belief in the one true living God of this universe. His vision, aspirations, and his legitimate, sober actions in this life were grounded in that belief which was planted and nurtured during his early active membership in the Anglican Church and fortified over the years through his varied experiences. Like any sensitive, discerning person, he had his disappointments and difficulties with certain masqueraders in the church. But these did not in any way impact negatively his faith 
in God. On at least a couple occasions, when I found it necessary to challenge him from a Christian perspective concerning certain actions, his response was, and I quote, I hear you, my friend. And I respect your view, but you need to remember that I am a politician. Please continue to pray for me. I recall when in 2020, he ended a live national address in relation to the unrest in the country at the time with the statement, and I quote, if it's war they want, is war they would get, unquote. I called him and expressed my deep disappointment. At the end of the discussion, he respectfully said to me that he understood my position, but I needed to appreciate the political nature of what was happening and to remember that unlike myself, he was a politician. He requested again that I should pray for him and the nation. Two nights later, he addressed the nation again regarding the ongoing problems. But on that occasion, his tone was very reconciliatory. He called me early on the morning after the address, and he began the conversation by saying, quote, you see, I do what you say. Unquote. That was the James Mitchell that I know and who positively impacted my life. He often admitted that he suffered much from the ingratitude, betrayal, and ignorance of others. But he remained to the end a very positively sensitive, decent, highly principled man pursuing noble objectives at all times. His love for St. Vincent and the Grenadines and this Caribbean region and his undimmed vision of the possibilities and opportunities for our development took precedence over personal ambition, pride, and at times political expediency. The song he commended to us in the days preceding his departure beautifully and touchingly expresses what he felt from the heart. Don't cry for me, Argentina. The truth is, I never left you. I loved you, and you loved me. Thank you, James Fitch Allen Mitchell. Thank you. One of your favorite poets, the great William Shakespeare, through the character Macbeth, suggested, and I quote, that life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour on the stage and then is heard no more, unquote. A century or so later, the renowned hymn writer Isaac Watts echoed similar sentiments when he declared in a well-known hymn, 
quarter Time, like an ever-rolling stream, bears all its sons away. They fly, forgotten as the dream dies at the opening day. And Shakespeare also contended that the evil that men do lives after them. And the good is often interred with their bones. I believe that this will not be so in your case, Sir James. You have truly made us proud, and we will remember you. The well respected Blazer Williams, my excellent English literature master in secondary school, sums it up truthfully when he wrote in his tribute printed in the news newspaper, quote, we have lost a great man who has made a tremendous contribution to the development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, unquote. I believe that in time, history will confirm and the majority will agree, using appropriate words borrowed from Shakespeare's Mark Antony. Quote, he acted from honesty and for the general good. His life was gentle and the elements mixed in him so well that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. So long, my friend, until we meet again. I thank you. We now have a tribute from Dr. the Honorable Ralph E. Gonzalez, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Your Excellency, the Governor General, and Mr. Duggan, my Lord the Archbishop, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and members of the family of our deceased brother. Good morning. Sir James Mitchell died on November the 23rd at the age of 90 years. His core biographical data are well known and thus need no repetition here. Save and except to reiterate that he served as parliamentary representative of the Grenadines and Northern Grenadines for some 34 years and as Prime Minister of our country for 16 years. The length of his public service and his contribution to nation building mark him out as a true servant of the people. He loved the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and our Caribbean and repeatedly they returned their love and respect during his long period of active political service up to the year 
2001. And thereafter, in his retirement years of public engagement. Sir James and I were active political competitors for more than a generation. From 1975 through to the general elections of December 1979, the first after independence, up to the dawning years of the 21st century, immediately preceding his retirement from active representational politics. I am currently the only member of parliament who sat in that august body while Sir James was there. And I'm the only person alive in our country who, like Sir James, has served for a lengthy period of time as prime minister. As such, I have more than an idea, perhaps more so than anyone else, of his travails, his joys and triumphs, his defeats and pain, his setbacks and advances, his challenges and achievements, his service to our nation, his private angst, and his public glory. More than once, he joked with me that he and I are in an exclusive club of two, two PMs who are elected to the office and have served so long. Now I feel lonely. But my brother Arnim Eustace and I are still here together in the land of the living. Through all the changing scenes of life and the vicissitudes thereof, amidst all our years as political combatants and adversaries, Sir James and I never lost respect for each other. We held each other in high regard despite our political differences. Indeed, neither of us was capable of political malice against each other, even at the times of intense conflicts and barbed commentaries. Anyone interested in my assessment of Sir James's political practice, that is to say his theory and practice, can read my book published in 2019 and entitled The Political Economy of the Labor Movement in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thus today, you will get none of that. Indeed, following the sage advice of Pericles' funeral oration, as recounted by the ancient Greek historian Thucydides in his Peloponnesian Wars, when a son of distinction falls, and before the day of his memorial, all contestation ceases. And Sir James was a great son of distinction of our nation and of our Caribbean civilization. We shall best remember him not in engraved marble, nor in the stone of his beloved Bequay, but in the hearts and minds of countless men and women whose lives he touched for the better. When a great man dies, there is invariably a debate of his life's work, and that is in order, but that is not for today. In any event, it is still too soon to pronounce authoritatively and with finality on the full impact of Sir James's immense contribution to our country and our Caribbean, the integration of which he was deeply committed for all his life. Moreover, it is always important for us to remember that great men and women make history, but only to the extent that the circumstances of history so permit them to make. They do not make history just as they please or under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given and transmitted from the past. As one philosopher once remarked, 
even the tradition of the, all the, the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living. Still, the impact of the personality of the great man or woman impacts significantly on historical development. And undoubtedly, the giant and iconic personality of James F. Mitchell has impacted immensely upon our people's lives, living and production over the years of his active public service and engagement. His legacy is significant. So James's legacy includes his founding and nurturing of the New Democratic Party, one of the two great parties of state in our country. His policies on land reform and agriculture, tourism, post-secondary education, women and inter regional integration. His efforts at providing basic services to certain neglected communities, including the Grenadines, and the further modernization of the state administration, building upon the foundation laid by his predecessor, Right Honorable Robert Milton Cato of blessed memory. So James and I shared many interests and commonalities beyond politics. These include our scientific approach to governance and administration, our love of research, reading, and books, our deep and abiding love for the people of our country and the region, and our recognition of the necessity and desirability for strong leadership with a clearly defined developmental narrative in communion with the people, acting in their interests, and to so act even at times when they, the people, do not as yet know their own interests. I know he detested hypocrisy, humbug, self-righteousness, and rank selfishness. All of these considerations which I've mentioned and more have led us, he and I, to hold an identical position on a robust vaccination program as the best bulwark against the coronavirus and the ongoing dangerous pandemic. Indeed, this was the last public issue about which he was exercised. And as a tribute to his patriotism and love of country, he sided fully with my government on this issue, even against his own party's leadership. I first met James Mitchell on the streets of Kingston sometime in, the, in early 1966, when I was not yet 20 years old. Over the years since then, 55 years, we have been in each other's lives in one way or another. We have had long, friendly conversations and many quarrels on this or that matter, including a major quarrel which ended with the famous Grand Beach Accord. We shared each other's writings and other people's writings, and we discussed them frequently. In opposition to each other, we nevertheless cooperated on major policy issues including his yet unrealized dream of developing Isle de Catch, of which he and his family are the joint owners. During my prime ministerial years subsequent to March 29, 2001, Sir James and I have held countless conversations. Oftentimes, he offered advice, and on other occasions, I sought out his views. Many times in this period we were in agreement, other times not. We developed a good friendship. When on August the 5th, 2021, I received an injury to my head, he called me on FaceTime video as I rested on the hospital bed. And he gave me and Eloise full support against this egregious assault upon my person. When he fell ill, 
I was there for him all the way. I am still there for him. In every material particular, I visited him and spoke to him at the ICU at the Milton Keaton Memorial Hospital before his transference to Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Barbados. Today we say farewell not only to a towering Vincentian and Caribbean leader, but also to a devoted family man and a friend of countless persons across all walks of life. James Mitchell loved his daughters and his grandchildren dearly. He spoke of them with love and joy, and they are today the guardians of his public legacy and his private being. It will be difficult for them, for you, the family, to come to terms with your loss. But he prepared you well for a time like this. And I am sure that you, the children and the grandchildren, the immediate family, are taking everything in their strides and leaving it all to God. On behalf of the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and on behalf of my family and myself, I express sincerest condolences to the family and friends of Sir James. May he rest in perfect peace. I know Sir James, my friend's son, you hope to see your pilot face to face. Know that at the sunset and the evening star, you have crossed the bar. Thank you. Our next tribute as, uh, would be given by the Dr. The Honorable Tide Benedict. And, uh, loved his people and the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines loved him in return. The call has been made for the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, Dr. The Honourable Godwin Friday, and uh, we'll take you now for his tribute. Excellency, Governor General, Dame Susan Duggan, and Mr. Duggan, to the Honorable Keith Mitchell, Prime Minister, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. To all my parliamentary colleagues present here today, to the family of Sir James Mitchell, my friend, to all his colleagues who served in government and who are here to pay tribute to him and last farewell. To the members of the diplomatic corps, members of the clergy, the members of the general public whom he loved so much. Good morning, church. I have come not just to bury Sir James, but also to praise him for what he accomplished in his life 
is truly deserving of praise and to reflect on what Brother Monty Mall said, must not be interred with his bones. In life, politics divides us, but not, must not do so indefinitely. For when the bell tolls, it is necessary for us to stop, reflect, and give honor where honor is due. Now is such a time. For in the death of Sir James Mitchell, we have lost a political giant and a true nation builder. As colleagues from his government over the years have agreed with me, we have come to the end of an era. It is difficult to fathom his absence. Being quiet and still was not his thing. He was a vital part of our politics during the 35 years that he spent in Parliament and remained a force to be reckoned with until his death a few weeks ago. It seemed that he was always there and so would always be there for us. And perhaps he will in other ways. Growing up in Bequia, my first awareness of politics was simultaneously an awareness of the name Son Mitchell. Back then, everyone, adult and child, called him by that name. Even after he became Sir James, an honor earned for exemplary public service, many of the older heads held on to that name. They loved the name Son Mitchell. He happily answered to either of them. Looking back, it is clear to me that his entrance on the political stage was a leap forward for the people of the Grenadines, whom he would go on to represent from 1966 to 2001. Not many of us or anyone of us now will match that record. He kept their hopes and dreams with his own and made them a constant part of his life's work so that they would become reality. During the late 1960s and throughout the 1970s, his legend grew it took hold and took off. In the Grenadines, we followed his exploits in Parliament, like cricket on the radio, and reveled in his marathon contributions to the debates in the House. We felt that nobody could talk like Son Mitchell. From the beginning, therefore, he was our champion. Soon, he would earn a place in the hearts of Vincentians all over our country and abroad, who saw in him a man and political leader who would make life better for them. Over time, his hard work bore fruit and yielded a rich and proud legacy. Everyone now speaks of his land reforms that transformed the life 
of people in the countryside transforms in Vincent and the Grenadines. This great work was conceived during his time as Minister of Agriculture in the Labour Party government between 1967 and 1972. It was pursued during his time as Premier from 1972 to 1974 and reached its full expression during his time as Prime Minister from 1984 to 2000. The land reforms led to a veritable land-owning revolution in our country that in turn transformed the agricultural sector. Large estates of traditional landowners were subdivided into small farms owned by ordinary people. The result has been an enduring legacy of economic empowerment of our people. Lives were transformed in the countryside as parents worked their newly earned, owned lands and used the proceeds to give their children better opportunities for education and for starting businesses than they had. So James took great satisfaction from that. As it confirmed in him his belief in our people and their capacity, given a chance, to transform their own lives for the better. When I visited him in the hospital in Kingstown, after he fell ill, in the short time that we were permitted together, he chose to speak about those reforms. He hoped that the people would understand and remember. I told him that his legacy was safe because the people were grateful and they loved him. As evidence, I also told him that many had come to the hospital that morning to give blood for him after the public appeal was made. He smiled and he said, tell them thanks for me. Indeed, a friend in discussing Sir James's death with me, reflected on his life and summed it up simply. She said, he did a lot. And she nodded her head repeatedly for emphasis. Sir James was a visionary of great ability and courage. So much of his political work that he did in those early days, before he had an organization in the NDP to support him, depended on his determination and on his skill, his power in motivating people to join his cause. He traveled every village in this country, first in his old Volkswagen Beetle, and then by other means, with trusted friends and fellow dreamers. Those efforts laid the political foundation upon which he stood for many years thereafter. During his time, he saw it all and he did it all. Minister of Government, Premier, Opposition Leader and Member of the Opposition, Prime Minister, and then for 20 years as retired elder statesman. He liked to say, I left, my wicked, I left with my wicket intact, with my bat under my arm. 
His political life spanned milestones in our country's history. He started out in the colonial administration, then in 1969, as part of the Labour Party government, led by Robert Milton Cato, a blessed memory. He saw our country move to internal self-government via statehood. And a decade later, while in opposition, participated in the move to national independence. Meanwhile, in 1975, with friends and like-minded Vincentians, he founded the New Democratic Party. Over the years, he built it into a formidable political institution that won four consecutive elections between 1984 and 1998, achieving in 1989 the unmatched distinction of winning all 15 seats. Today, his party stands proudly on its record and work for the people in and out of government and continues to pursue his vision of a prosperous and free country that adheres to the rule of law and the principles of democracy and that provides for all of its people. So James never stopped working. He wanted others to know what he knew so that they too could dream big and believe in those dreams. He had a passion for writing and for recording his times for posterity. And he was a great writer. The last time I visited him at his home, where he was recuperating from a fall, he pointed to a shopping bag near the chair that I was about to sit in. He said to me, lift that up. I did. And I said, heavy. He said, yes, that is my new book that I told you about. It's finished. Needs a little typing and cleaning up. But it's all there. It was handwritten, of course. So he added that the publishers must do their work and the editing must be done, but he hoped for publication soon. I'm told that the night before he died, he was giving instructions to his family members about the book. No doubt those will be followed. And in time, we will hear from Sir James again. So he's still working. Throughout his long political career, Sir James remained committed to regional integration and unity. Indeed, the constitution of his beloved NDP states the pursuit of regional unity as one of its objects. He collaborated with Caribbean leaders over decades, defining what, as Caribbean people, we must aim for and negotiating what was possible. His experience in regionalism and his understanding of the politics in each country made him invaluable as an advisor to political leaders in and out of government throughout the Caribbean. As a nation, We were fortunate that Sir James chose public life, public service throughout his life. We all know he was a brilliant man, well-educated and possessed of many talents that could have taken him along other paths, successful paths but he chose to use his talents, training, and energy to serve his people and develop his country. He was a true nation builder who came at a time in our history when our newly independent nation, starting out on its own, needed courageous and visionary leadership 
to instill confidence in our people that indeed our faith and works would see us through. He was made for such a time. And he did not shirk his responsibility. He served willingly and well. While we are saddened by his death, we also know that we must celebrate his life and proclaim his achievements. We must recognize and acknowledge his legacy and ensure not only for his sake, but for our country's sake, that we build on it and move our country forward. We must never forget that many of the things we enjoy now, some taken for granted, came about because of the work of Sir James and those he toiled with for so many years. Of course, his family will not forget. They were the ones most intimately involved in his ups and downs of his political life. While many of us may speak confidently about Sir James's accomplishments in public life, only his family members, his children, Sabrina, Gretel, Louise, and Gabia, can truly speak of the sacrifices his political life exacted. Looking back, they will say it was all worth it because they know that their father profoundly changed our country for the better. But it could not have been easy for them. Thanks may not be enough to give in return, but it is the best that I have. So, on behalf of a grateful people, his former constituents in Bekwe and Mustique and in the Southern Grenadines, whom he represented in Parliament for so long and with such distinction, and on behalf of an entire grateful nation whom he loved and served with all of his heart, I say thanks. We appreciate what your father did for our country. I trust that hearing that again, for I know many have duly said it before, I trust that it brings you great satisfaction. So we say so long, Sir James, advisor, mentor, and friend. We will miss you and will long cherish your memory. May God bless him and keep him. May he rest in peace. A tribute from the leader of the opposition in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. the Honorable R. Ralph Egan Sells, uh, the leader of the party which was founded by the former Prime Minister, Sir James, in 1975. A very touching uh, tribute who spoke about, of course, the, uh, his commitment and his contribution to land reform, among other things. And uh, we've just heard from uh, heard the call for the tribute by the Prime Minister of uh, Grenada, the Honourable Keith Mitchell, who served uh, with uh, the former Prime Minister, of course. Uh, so James was the head of the OECS Authority and as chairman of the authority in 1988, 1995 and 1996, yes. which means that they worked together. So we take you to the podium. My colleague, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez and his wife. Ministers of Government of the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Speaker of the House of Representatives 
and other parliamentarians. Lord Bishop Leopold Friday and other distinguished members of the clergy. Distinguished members of the diplomatic community. Distinguished citizens of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Caribbean family as a whole. Sisters and brothers, all. I know in listening and Brother Friday, sorry, the leader of the opposition, Dr. Friday, and I was going to mention him briefly here. He gave me the title of St. Vincent and the Grenadines Prime Minister. So, <laughs> Brother Ralph, you have some serious competition <laughs> in your life, so it's not to distant past future because <laughs> I'm getting ready to retire from the Prime Ministership of Grenada, Cairo Kumpiti Martinique. <laughs> Friends all, today of course it's an honor to stand before you to, to pay tribute to a friend and a mentor, but more so, for me, he was a genuine Caribbean patriot. And all of the people of Bekwe and the wider community of St. Vincent and the Grenadines can lay claim to him as one of their own. We, the people of the Caribbean, can also jealously pro pronounce him as one of ours. An outstanding Caribbean national, greatly revered for his political acumen, his love for country, his humility in service to the people, and his commitment to regionalism. Sisters and brothers, I cannot help but smile a little <laughs> despite the sadness of the moment. Because he was right. Years ago, when he traveled to Grenada to pay tribute to the former Prime Minister of Grenada, the late Sir Eric Matthew Gary, He told me then, Keith, you have to speak at my funeral. Could you imagine that? That is in 1997. I asked him, how could he be sure that he would not, that I would not go first? He said to me, that is the natural order of things. That is James. So yes, he was right. And I'm here today, fulfilling my duty, for it was not a question. And even if it was, how could I say no? Sir James expressed his desire, and most of us have to be guided accordingly. In fact, he said so to Louise, who spoke to me immediately after his death, that, that he reminded me to remind you while he was lying in the ICU section of the hospital that you have to speak at his funeral. Immediately, after Prime Minister Mia Motley visited him at the hospital in Barbados. She called me and said, James, tell me to remind you that you must speak at his funeral. <laughs> and 
I called him the week before he passed. And I'm trying to speak to James. And before I leave, he said to me, remember, you must speak at my funeral. Therefore, as a true friend and an appreciative mentor, mentee, I'm here to fulfill that wish. Therefore, I hope my heartful words do justice to this very special individual. I'm also here today to honor his family and to say to th thanks to each and every one of you for sharing him with us. I'm well aware that all of the benefit St. Vincent and the region gained through his service, this equated to a corresponding sacrifice for family life. To Sabrina, Gretel, Gabaja, and Louise, you can be comforted knowing that Daddy did his best, and he did his family proud. He lived a full life, and in the word of Frank Sinatra, he did it his own way. To the wider nation. Sir James is the quintessential Vincentian son, in whom you should be forever be well pleased. From the humble beginnings in Beckway, St. James maintained his humility throughout his life and, on, and turned out to be a Caribbean leader of the highest repute. Humility and love are essential attributes as far as I'm concerned of any successful politician or any successful service-oriented person. And any display of arrogance, in my view, is likely to undermine whatever goodwill is created among supporters. Sir James was the epitome of a good politician. He was not only well respected at home, but he also played a significant role in the political and other developments elsewhere in the Caribbean. I recall him being asked to do a tribute to the funeral of the late Errol Barrow, the first prime minister of Barbados, because I was then a student at the University of the West Indies in Barbados. We always remember the role he played in assisting Guyana's then President Hugh Desmond Hoyt to address concerns over the free and fair elections. His role in ensuring that genuine democratic principles were returned to Guyana should never be underestimated. So James brought President Hoyt along with Prime Ministers John Compton and Eugenia Charles to Mustik for that famous summit. And in the end, I believe he saved Guyana from the brink and ensured a new era of free and fair elections in the South American and Caribbean neighbor country. The life of my friend Sir James is littered with many examples of him being his brother's keeper. St. Vincent, he was your proud son. But for us in Grenada, Kiaraku and P.T. Martinique, he was like a godfather who throughout his career as a politician and even after his retirement, provided advice and counsel through crucial periods of our history particularly in the last 40 years. And I can tell you this, every time an election was due in Grenada, and I wanted to know what was happening in Karaku and Pity Magni, I called James. Well, I don't know who I'm gonna call this time. <laughs> Ralph, I might call you, you know. <laughs> I personally owe him 
an eternal debt that could never possibly be repaid. I credit Sir James with being a central figure in, in guiding my emergence as a leader. He was consistently available and always willing to provide advice and encouragement in the good times and particularly and more importantly in bad times. He was certainly not a fair weather friend's as a lot of persons I know. I remember when I lost the Grenada general elections in 2008. Sir James was the one who was there to comfort me. And he even invited me and my family to Bekwe, which I accepted and spent a few days in Bekwe with him. But our acquaintance, friends, began long before that. I first met Sir James in 1972 while I was in St. Vincent as the captain of the Grenada cricket team to play against Michael Findlay-led St. Vincent team. He was also the premier at the time Little did we know that we'll be forever linked as politicians and leaders of our respective countries. He said to me then, you are the captain of the Grenada cricket team and I am captain of the political team of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Our relationship was rekindled and bolstered after 1984 when I returned home to participate in local politics after being 13 years abroad. Sir James and his cousin, the then Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Sir John Compton, and I recognize Janice's wife here today. They always made themselves available to support and to provide mentorship to me, a young politician at the time. And I'm eternally grateful for this particularly his long-standing example of humility and service to the people. He was a central figure in providing advice and guidance to many other Grenadian politicians in the post-invasion -inv era of 1983. His constructive role in ensuring that the Grenadian society was held together and Revive will always be remembered by every patriotic Grenadian. And I recall when I was asked to lead the Caribbean back to the strong relationship with Cuba after the events and collapse of the revolution in 83. And I had to pay an official visit to Cuba then. Um, because the colleagues, my colleague heads of government of the CARICOM community urged me to take that step. So James was one of the first person who called and said, you must go. It is time to heal that wound because the Cuban people had been good to all of us. So James was a peace-loving man. That's the person I knew. Fiery in his defense of his people and his promotion of inclusive, de inclusive development. What a, prop, a firm proponent of peace and stability and togetherness. He was a stalwart of the regional integration movement as was articulated before. And a champion of peace and social justice. He was a central figure in bringing together the leaders of the different political forces in Grenada post-1983 period, providing guidance that help us to come together in the interests of the country. In fact, he played host to a pivotal meeting in Union Island that gave birth, together with John Compton and others, 
gave birth to the new national party, which still remains the dominant party in Grenada, Caraco, and P.T. Martinique, which I happen to lead at this time. In 1989, when our commission of police was shot dead, Sir James was also there for his Grenadian brothers and sisters, providing comfort as we dealt with the traumatic situation. In that same year, friends, when I challenged then Prime Minister Hubbard Blaise, and won the leadership of the new National Party. Sir James joined Prime Minister Eugenia Charles of Dominica, Kennedy Simmons of St. Kitts and Nevis, Sir John Compton of St. Lucia, to meet with myself and Robert Blaze in Grenada to urge unity. When that initial meeting yielded no results. Sir James returned later at the bidding of the other leaders for a further meeting with Mr. Blaze. At a session which lasted an hour and a half, as he told me. Mr. Blaze, of course, obviously did not take his advice. So when James, as he told me, said to Mr. Blaze, what should I say to my other colleagues at the region who sent me here? He said, told them, he, he, he said to tell them that you came and I listened. <laughs> Years later, in 1995, when I became Prime Minister, Sir James was the first to reach out. And his advice and guidance was pivotal, especially in those early days. And throughout my career, he always made himself available to give advice. Reflecting on this long-standing friendship, I can say in all honesty that Sir James is one of the regional politicians that I have had the closest relationship with. Our enduring friendship was also mutually beneficial to Grenada and St. Vincent, as we constantly forged united positions at various fora in promoting our joint interests and the interests of the subregion. In fact, as an example of that close relationship, Sir James signed on behalf of Grenada at a meeting where the Geese Line, the British company, was taking over the interests of the various banana societies in the Windward Islands. I could not make the trip, and I asked James to sign on behalf. He was there representing St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but also acted on behalf of Grenada, Caracou, and P.T. Martinic. It may seem, friends, that he was always coming to my assistance and providing guidance. And there were occasions when we merely, we were merely counterparts, attending meetings together, both as government and political leaders, throughout the region and further afield. There was never, in my view, a daylight between us. The firm of Mitchell and Mitchell was always in full flight. I fully admired and respected him for his guidance. Sir so James was a founding member of the Caribbean Democratic Union, an organization he also led. And of course, he was a strong promoter of democracy throughout the region and the wider community. Sir so James made several appearances during every political campaign of the new National Party in Grenada since I became leader, inserting both his wit and wisdom and accentuating 
our efforts with infusion and encouragement and confidence. But let me just add, he never did this during the period that he held the office of Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He made sure he was out of active politics in doing so. I mentioned earlier that he was there for the state funeral of Sir Eric Matthew Gary in 1997. I recall that in his tribute then at the funeral, Sir James revealed that Sir Eric told him that he envisaged visioned me as a natural successor of his base. That revelation had a profound impact on me personally, and I believe to some extent I've benefited tremendously from the political support of the former Prime Minister's base in Grenada Karakou and P.T. Martinique. My friends, I've personally, as I've said over and over, learned a lot from St. James, including the enduring value of friendship and the redeeming nature of political tolerance, something I believe is sadly lacking about, about many of our politicians today. We can be political opponents, but when it comes to matters of national interest, we must be able to put those differences aside and do what is best for the country and our people. I go further to say this virus we're facing cannot be about partisan politics. It's about the life of the people of our country. Life comes first. Party politics must take second place. It's a message I'm giving throughout the entire Caribbean. because I'm making it a point here today because I'm speaking to some of my friends in Grenada too. So James had many epic political battles at home against Brother Ralph Gonzalez. I think Ralph said it already. But one thing I tell you this, I never sensed that he had bitterness towards Ralph. He highly regarded the skill and acumen of Prime Minister Gonzalez. And I was always mindful that to have to beat him, you have to do extra work. His legacy is one of country above politics. Indeed, we all will do well to honor him by the way we show respect to our opponents and to understand that political battles are not among enemies, friends but among patriots who are determined to promote their own vision for the development of their people. There are difference among patriots who have different views and they're political opponents, but they're not political enemies. They're not enemies, sorry. His own vision for St. Vincent and the Grenadines has stood the test of times. Sisters and brothers, lying here before us is one of our greatest. In fact, our greatest. A Caribbean hero. A Caribbean hero. A legend. A stalwart. An exemplary leader worthy of emulation. We who had the opportunity to walk with him had the privilege to watch a transformation leader in action. His, ex his legacy will not only inspire us today, 
but generations of Caribbean citizens to come. The Bible says in Romans 14, verse 7, and I quote, for none of us lives for ourselves alone. And none of us dies for ourselves alone. Unquote. Sir James embodied, embodied that. And as a modern day architect of, his, of ascension and Caribbean civilization, we shall be forever grateful for this unmatched service in the vineyard. I regret not having that final visit with him which I was planning a few days before his passing. And for many conversations over the years and my final chat with him. I know he was well aware of the immense gratitude for his guidance and friendship over the decades. Walk good, my friend. There is a special place in my heart for you. In fact, you will be forever entrenched in the hearts of Vincentians and other Caribbean nationals. Your contribution at the local and regional level is immeasurable and at the same time invaluable. You have lived a full life and a meaningful life and you have led us by example. We should always lift you up and therefore on behalf of the government and people of Grenada, Karaku and P.T. Martinic and the members of my own political party and my family I say to the children, all of you, we know your pain, but you'll be comforted by what he has left you and left all of us. I pray that his soul rest in peace. Amen. We feature a tribute at this morning's uh, state funeral for the late James Mitchell done by the Prime Minister of uh, Grenada who worked along with uh, Sir James Mitchell and he spoke of course of the other regional leaders at the time in particular the Windward Islands uh, Eugenia Charles, Dame Eugenia Charles who was dubbed the Iron Lady uh, the late John Compton, the late Eugenia Charles that is uh, John Compton and Keith Mitchell not only kept your promise to my father, but you made him proud today. Thank you very much. My father did not like to keep people waiting, so I have been busy trying to scratch out bits of my tribute along the way. Tribute to my father. The first thing I remember daddy teaching me to do was how to swim and then to sail. It did not take much to get me swimming, which living on the beach seemed as natural as walking. He commissioned the building of a Beckway double ender named Pumpkin, made from local cedar and imported pine, on which my sisters and I learned how to sail in Admiralty Bay. Proud son of a sea captain teaching us how to sail was of utmost importance to him. To tack and come about, trim the sails, and shift the ballast stones, how to read the wind. These were things we learned from Daddy. Navigation was important, and he showed us every reef between Canawan and Union Island. He taught us the importance of having the sun behind you when approaching a reef, so that you could see the colors of the water. Our sailing trips on Sapphire, a 36-foot catch he owned with Uncle John and Uncle Junior, and later Pelangi, a 44-foot sloop, were the cornerstone of our childhood memories with Daddy. When Uncle John wasn't with us, 
Daddy would bring along a good friend to help run the boat. In the early days, it was Sinclair Robinson, better known as Robbie, and Kelvin Bunyan, and in later years, his mates were Bamosto and Gaston Bess. I remember Daddy saying, up the road, Robbie, up the road, as we beat the rough seas and the easterly winds on the petty can of one headed back to Beckway. On these sailing trips in the Grenadines, we had three places we always stopped, Canawan, Tobago Keys, and Salt Whistle Bay, Myro. Every time we anchored, Daddy would grab a mask and snorkel and jump off the boat to go and check the anchor. And either Sabrina, Gretti, or I would accompany him. He dove to confirm that the anchor was deeply embedded in the sand so that when night came and the winds picked up, he could sleep soundly knowing that the boat was safe and the anchor would not break free. Hence, when I hear the hymn, Will Your Anchor Hold?, I always think back to Daddy and his obsession with the anchor's purchase. On one of those trips to the Tobago Keys, Daddy and I swam ashore to his favorite island, Baradal, and as usual, climbed up on the eastern side where you have a spectacular view of the Horseshoe Reef around the Keys. Looking out, Daddy said, My eyes will never tire of the beauty of the Grenadines. I sensed in that moment that Daddy's attachment to these islands ran as deep as any emotion in him ever would. As a family, we had one, and I repeat only one, overseas vacation together, where we explored Canada's beautiful west including visiting places like Bam Springs Hotel where mommy had waitressed in her teens and learned the hotel business enough to embolden her to establish their own hotel together many years. So rare was this experience for us that each one of us recalls every detail like if it were yesterday. Soon after that, our days at boarding school began and family vacations were put on hold permanently. <laughs> They were replaced, however, with us accompanying Daddy on state visits, Taiwan for me, Japan for Sabrina, Kuwait for Gretel. Gabby later traveled with him as former prime minister to Cartagena. On my trip with him to Taiwan in about 1988, we visited a monastery located in a most beautiful mountain setting. I was mesmerized with the place, its tranquility and sense of peace. I made a comment by mistake to Daddy, telling him how much I love this place. Next thing I know, Daddy was speaking to the protocol people, arranging for me to stay on at the monastery for a few months. I said, Daddy, I find it fascinating, but I'm not ready to begin my life as a monk. Daddy had no fear of distant lands. He always encouraged us to travel. Daddy's own journey was shaped by the decision of his mother when he was about 10 years old. It was shortly after his father, Captain Reg, had disappeared at sea north of Cuba that she remarried and moved to St. Lucia where his brothers George, who is with us today, and Junior and his sister Gloria, leaving him in the care of his paternal grandmother, Sarah Oliver on Beckway. However, as he was attending grammar school, his mother and grandmother relied on the kindness of strangers in Kingstown to take him in. He lived in five different homes in different parts of Kingstown during his time at grammar school. The first lady to take him in was named Nellie Cropper, daughter of Maggie Cropper. The only other child in the household was Elsa Velux, and she welcomed him into their home on Middle Street. That child is here with us today and we all owe her and the other guardians that nurtured daddy during those years. Thank you, Elsa. It's that decision of granny to leave daddy behind for whatever reason she did that led him to grow up as a Vincentian and not a St. Lucian and to have his political career in St. Vincent. My earliest memory of my father's political life is hearing him sing the, song, the hymn Oh God, our help in ages past. Usually I would be at home in Beckway and hear his voice bellowing the hymn coming across Admiralty Bay. My father was a terrible singer. 
And when he would sing this song, he would literally drag the words. And it was very embarrassing for me as a youngster. He always wanted us to attend political meetings, but I made sure and wait until I could hear him finish the hymn before I would leave home and go to the meeting. So I didn't have to listen to him sing. It wasn't until many years later that I grew to appreciate the words of that hymn, the hope that they presented and the meaning they had to my father and to the seafaring people of the Grenadines. As we face this COVID pandemic today, these verses resonate more than ever. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Still be our guard while troubles last. Another childhood memory that stands out is sitting in the kitchen table, at the kitchen table at Frangi, listening to election results. And of course, there always came a moment where somehow magically daddy knew that they had won the election. And within about two minutes of that, the whole of Beckway had descended on Frangipani. I recall the morning of the 1984 election, traveling on the ferry with daddy, with my sister to St. Vincent, when we were greeted by a jubilant crowd who actually lifted him up all the way from where the ferry docked to Bay Street. His feet did not touch the ground. It was a scene I would never forget. Similarly, years later, he won the elections in 1998, and I accompanied him to Parliament to be sworn in. This time was very different. The New Democratic Party had won the election but lost the popular vote. And we drove through the angry crowd, shouting and hurling objects at our vehicle. We sat in the car, just the driver, my dad and me. I do not remember him saying a word. He was just quiet. That day was etched in my mind, and so it came as no surprise when perhaps just over a year later, when I was working in South Carolina, I got a call from Daddy saying that the opposition had blocked the roads and business had come to a standstill. He said he had lost the confidence of some of the men closest to him, and he was considering cutting short his term in office. It was the first time he ever asked me what to do. I told him, Daddy, you always know best. Soon after, the Grand Beach Accord was made and the rest is history. Daddy always knew that power was transient. Living in the Prime Minister's residences, he never made it a home, per se. Any gift that was given to him, even some flowers, he would take them to Beckway. But what did make those houses special were the, the men that looked after him, the security guards, who became like family, men like Samson of blessed memory, Gordon and Pompey. You didn't only keep Daddy safe, but you treated him like family. We thank you for your service. Daddy's retirement allowed him to enjoy the company of friends and family. He became gentle once again. The man that used to bark at us as children softened. Daddy thrived around people. He developed new friendships like that with Alicia Lavia and cultivated old ones like Sir Philip Graves, Sarah Blundred, Sir Kennedy Simmons, Ali Mijahid, and Artist Davis, to name a few. He took pleasure in spending time around people. Be it someone who used to work with him who happened to travel to Beckwith for a day, he would spend the whole day with them. He embraced everybody's story and enjoyed, and enjoyed being allowed into their lives. What will we as a family miss about him? I'll miss him showing up at my house with a new sapling to plant, or more likely finding him actually planting it in my garden without even asking me where he should put it. His most recent gift to me is a plum rose tree he planted next to my home in Belmont Beckway. My children will miss his stories. James Ty and Chavez will miss going down to his home for the weekend, taking all of their friends with him and taking over his house, which he loved. He loved being around young people. At James's 16th birthday recently, he had an audience of about two dozen young people and he told them the story about how his best friend from Kittel's used to walk to school every day and challenge them to say which one of them would do that now. Bing will miss his daily two-hour con 
conversations, catching up with every political issue, and of course, trying to tell him what he should say on radio the next day. Of course, those conversations would be followed by several emails and articles that would be sent in early hours of the morning, just in case Bing wasn't totally convinced. When we took him by air ambulance to Barbados and settled him in at the ICU, Dr. Michael Fakuri there told us, after examining him thoroughly, that he had days, weeks, or months to live. Sadly, I know when a doctor says days, weeks, and months, they actually mean days. During that time, he talked a lot about his beloved party and the Caribbean. He said to me, tell the people of St. Vincent that I was always honest with them and I never left them. And that's when he started asking me to play for him the song, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. Thank you to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines for allowing our father to live his dream, and that was to become a successful prime minister and statesman of this country. That dream would not have been possible without the support of the Rock of Gibraltar. That is the community of Paddy Farm Beckway. You stood firmly behind daddy and you brought the rest of Beckway with you. To the Rock of Gibraltar and to Beckway, I salute you. You made son Mitchell a hero. To the people of the Southern Grenadines, Canawan Union and Myro, you two lit your candle for daddy and kept it lit for the last 55 years. I thank you. To the people of North Leeward, you always had a special place in daddy's heart because you were the first constituency on the mainland to vote the NDP and he never forgot this. I thank you. To the people of North Windward, daddy had asked me to take take him to see you after the recent eruptions. Unfortunately, he left us before I was able to do that, but know that you were in his heart and he never forgot you. When daddy fell ill, he was hospitalized in Beckway and then in St. Vincent. He was pleased with the love, care, and attention he received from the nurses, the interns, and the doctors. He begged me to get everybody's name because he wanted to write an individual thank you card when he got better. He felt nothing but love in the last days of his life. My family and I would like to personally thank Prime Minister Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonsalves for going the extra mile, for holding our hands, for being with us, giving us love and support, and for doing everything possible in your power and personal capacity and in the capacity of the government to give daddy the best medical care and attention he possibly could in the last days of his life. Thank you, Prime Minister. Also want to thank Prime Minister Mia Motley for also receiving Daddy in Barbados and making sure he got the best possible care. I also want to thank the NDP family for their love and support and for rallying to give him blood when it was needed. My father in the end, as he did in 1989, had the whole country behind him. He knew that, he felt love, and after the jubilation of the victory years and the humility of his party losing power, he ended his political stewardship as he began, a man loved by his people. What more can one ask for? You all know me as Louise, but my name isn't just Louise. Louise is my middle name. My first name is Sarah, after my father's paternal grandmother, Nan Sarah Oliver. When I was at daddy's hospital bed in Barbados, he was talking to one of my friends, Nisha, who I was staying with in Barbados, and he said to her, thanks for taking in Sarah Louise. It was the first time in my 51 years that my father ever called me Sarah Louise. I knew then that he was leaving. But there was something so sweet in hearing him call my full name. And finally, I owe daddy this one. This one is for him. Vincentians, please get vaccinated.
and wear your mask consistently and properly in public places. Both of these things are acts of kindness and love. Do these to help the world recover and to help us love and be together. I will close by saying Daddy wanted a musical farewell and asked that the fugal horn be sounded at sunset when he's being laid to rest. The same fugal horn played by Sheikh Keen that sounded in the hills of Petit Baudel when Daddy, with a constitution drafted by Emery Robertson, held the first convention of the New Democratic Party. That same fugal horn will sound in Beckwith this evening when the Royal St. Vincent and Grenadines Police Band gives him the musical farewell that he wanted and closes the circle of his life. I know that as you say goodbye to Son Mitchell, former Prime Minister of this country, you are feeling that you too are saying goodbye to a father. We as a family are comforted to know that we do not grieve alone, that you grieve with us, and as you comfort us, we will seek to comfort you. I end with the song that I sang for Daddy in the last three weeks of his life. No matter how much pain he was in, whenever I sang this song, even though I sing as terribly as he does, somehow he would fall asleep and be at peace. Sweet dreams till sunbeams find you. <laughs> Sweet dreams and leave all worries behind you. And in your dreams, whatever you do, dream a little dream of me. Dream a little dream of me. Tribute there by the daughter of Sir James Mitchell as we go to continue coverage of the state funeral of former Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Sir James Mitchell. Up next, we have a poem by Thai Sarah Mitchell Joseph, granddaughter and a child for the Beckway Easter Regatta by Richard Day as we go back to the microphone. Good morning, um, my name is Ty, and a few weeks ago when my grandfather was sick, my mother was reading some poems, and um, he said he wanted me to read this one at his funeral, so here it is. It's Chant for the Beckway Easter Regatta by Richard Dive. I call forth the bright Beckway two bows and all their festive regatta prime. Country girl, memory, Beckway sweet. I call you out from the cool deep shade of mango, almond, and sea grape, pumpkin, wendy, iron duke. I call forth the brightly painted two bows from beneath the tricolored Vincentian flag, missile, arrow, cream skin, dart. You at the taut distinctive sails, sprits raised, sprit held, and four-sided, thunder, dreadnought, more worries, hard to beat, bullet, I call you. Descendants of the Yankee whaleboats, double-ended and modified by these hills and seas, these fish and whales, and chafing now at the water's edge, Spritz raised, rudders ready, sheets started, trio, why ask, I call you. And not only you, but all the sloops, like Mermaid, Plumbelly, Just Now, Calypso, Skywave, Wave Dancer, and schooners with their proud proportions, like Gloria Kalita, Mildred Wallace, Water Pearl, Friendship Rose, and all the independent vagabond yachts and yachtsmen from around the world. I call forth the bright Beckway two bows in all their festive regatta prime. Thunder, divine love, double O, Balthazar, Beckway sweet, sweet, I am trade wind, jealous god of these Caribbean island seas, and I implore you, Beckway bow, two bow sailors, 
to sail before my chant forever, this chant now. Thank you. Our next tribute is by Mr. Joseph Burns Bonnady. The next tribute by Joseph Burns Bonnady, just at the introduction, a short moment ago we had a poem by the granddaughter of Sir James, Ty Sarah Mitchell Joseph. Your Excellency, the Governor General, and Mr. Duggan, Honorable Prime Minister and Mrs. Gonsalves, the Bishop, uh, Friday, Honorable Keith Mitchell, Prime Minister of Grenada, members of the Mitchell family. It is indeed a privilege and an honor for me to speak to you today at this solemn occasion. Sir James Mitchell and I became very good friends. I learned a lot from him and I had the distinct feeling that he expected much of me. I would say to you that we both had the same early experience in life. I lost my father at sea, he lost his father at sea. So we had that bond, so to speak. But then Sir James Mitchell, I always admired him. I tried to save him or save the Labour Party from throwing him out. But I didn't have the influence that I had in later years. I asked the former Prime Minister, Milton Cato, who everybody in St. Vincent knows is my uncle, my mother's brother, to hold his horse on the expulsion of Sir James from the Labour Party. They indicated to me, let the man go back to Beckwith Fish. Let him go back to Beckwith Fish. But we developed a relationship over the years. I left here. I took up a new post in Trinidad and Tobago as head of the regional labor movement. And we had accreditation to the heads of governments in the whole region. I knew every prime minister, every president, not by reading about them, but in interacting with them. And Sir James saw me over those years. In Barbados, the same holds good for the successor to Sir James, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez. But I will say this. Sir James told me a lot that he didn't tell other people. For example, he said, Burns, he invited me to Beckway. He said, you see this house, which is his house now that he lives in. It was only one room. He said, you know I built that room? They libeled me in the newspapers in Barbados. I sued them. And I used the funds to build one room. So he started his house in Mount Pleasant. Sir so James would call me after he appointed me as a minister. And I want to make a disclaimer that I was not the minister that the Honorable Speaker Monty Mall was speaking about because I had jurisdiction over the Water Authority, but it was not me. <laughs> I want to say this, that Sir James took me on many sojourns in Europe. I was not unaccustomed to the, being in Brussels, for example, but he would take me, he would introduce me to important people, and I observed his movements. We would go to eat, and he'll say, what are you having for dessert? I want ice cream. Him now, sorbet, sorbet. That's what he would say to me. We went all over. We went to the palace in Lichtenstein. We met with Prince Adam. And at the time, the offshore sector was under pressure. And Prince Adam said to him, listen, don't buckle to the Americans. And he said, I didn't buckle. The Prime Minister said, you didn't buckle because you're a prince. I'm a politician. 
two, two different things. But the one thing that Sir James had was a love for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I am not speaking in any particular sequence, but I will say this. He demonstrated his commitment that he always put country first. The first day that Dr. Ralph Gonsalves was sworn in as Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Sir James Mitchell called him on the phone. He said, Ralph, there's a matter. You're not going to see it until maybe two, three, four months down the road. But it's a matter of the country being on a blacklist. And we have to talk. The Prime Minister said, come now. And Sir James visited the Prime Minister's office and called Switzerland and asked Mrs. De Bonavish to come to St. Vincent, Prime Minister, when do you want me to come? He said, as soon as you could come. Within two days, she was here. And we were able to take St. Vincent and the Grenadines off the blacklist as a result of the behest of Sir James. That didn't sit well for supporters of a party that just lost an election. Nevertheless, he was forthright. You know, I traveled in the Grenadine Islands with Sir James. And one day he called me and said, let's go to Canada now. So I got to the airport, the flight picked us up, we went to Canada. And he said, I'm going to visit my friend Tommy. Tommy is Sir John Compton's brother, who was the captain of the boat that took Sir James in his early years of campaigning. When he was nobody, nobody knew him, but he was ill, sick. And he said to him, Tommy, we have to make another rounds. We have to go to Myro, we have to go to Union. And on his dying bed, he had a new lease on life. And he said, you finish all your business, you put your... All things in order and he said well yes Sir James said call Nella Dorishid over there Nella came to the house whatever they did they fixed up and we exited the house on the way down we heard a screech Tommy had just died I tell you that to give you a picture of the relationship between Sir James and I when I became the Minister of Health, we had some problems. I built a new uh, clinic in Bayabu and one for Canawan. We had problems in terms of the funding. And I went back into the declaration that was signed for the Canawan developers. And I called Sir James. I said, Sir James, the developers promised to fix the pharmacy and the, and the, and the, and the hospital facilities. He said, well, you the minister, call him. That's what he told me. So I called Mr. Saldino and reminded him of the commitment in the arrangement with the government. And he said, you know, we will do it. So I just give you that as an example of the relationship that we had with Sir James. I want to say for those aspiring politicians, if your name does not start with M, there's no way that you could win all the seats in a general election. Mitchell, Mitchell, Motley. So remember that. So James, I love you. I know I try not to disappoint you. May your soul rest in peace. Tribute uh, by Mr. Joseph Burns Bonnady. We expect to have a solo presentation shortly as part of the album tribute system. Tribute in music. As we invite you to stay as well, we will join us from whichever platform. We invite you to stay tuned.
that followest all my way. I yield my flickering torch to thee. We would now have a video tribute by the Honorable Kennedy Simmons, former Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis. This would be a video tribute. I have been in deep reflection. Since, Since I received the sad news of the, of the passing of Sir James Mitchell, he holds, he holds pride of place in the history of Caribbean economic, social, and political development. He was highly regarded and respected as an astute and unique political leader and statesman, not only in the Caribbean, but throughout Europe, the Americas, the Americas and, and Africa. My, my wife, Lady, Lady Simmons, Simmons, joins me in extending deepest sympathies to the family of Sir James at this hour of great sorrow. My, my relationship with, with Sir, Sir James, son, son as, as his friends called him, has, has been, been one of the most memorable and treasured of, of my political, political career. I was, I was privileged to have served with him and, and other Caribbean icons like John Compton and Eugenia Charles at a time when, following the failed West Indies Federation and the stillborn unity of the Little Eight, the Caribbean people were still trying to find practical meaning and substance in the principle of Caribbean integration. Sir James, Sir James Mitchell was a fiercely committed, committed champion for the people of St. Vincent and, and the Grenadines. He was, he was a practical, downworth, outspoken leader who became, who became very adept at navigating, navigating the corridors of power in Europe, America, America and, and multinational organizations in search of economic, of economic development for his country. country. He always applied the simple, direct, common-sense approach even to complex problems with amazing success. In his book, Beyond the Islands, he recalls, and I quote, The governor of our central bank once inquired of me how I had succeeded in finding so much financing out of Europe 
Simple, Simple I, told I told him. Call you up, up at three o'clock in the morning and be, and be the first on their agenda. agenda. Don't, Don't wait, wait until, until you get into the office at nine o'clock and, and then Europe is at lunch. lunch. Unquote. Unquote. James, James Mitchell was, was just, just as comfortable moving, moving among the kings and potentates and, and leaders of renown as, as he was in the, in the company of the farmers and fishermen and ordinary hard-working people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thus, he remained steadfast in his pursuit of the end game, which was improving the quality of life of people by ensuring their access to the essentials for human development, like education, health care, opportunities for personal growth and development, and necessary infrastructure. James Mitchell was not just about his own country. He was a true Caribbean champion. I can still vividly recall that after Desmond Hoyt became president of Guyana in 1992, after the death of Forbes Burnham, there was great political turmoil, mainly about the fairness of the elections. So serious was the concern that some Caribbean leaders, myself included, declined to attend meetings in Guyana and others had even called for Guyana to be expelled from CARICOM. This, of course, was never likely and certainly not desirable. However, James Mitchell sought to calm the troubled waters. He invited a group of Caribbean leaders to Mustique Island to meet with President Hoyt to try to find a way forward to a more functional and united CARICOM. The meeting was held with no media presence. A significant agreement was reached. That agreement proved to be effective in calming the troubled waters within CARICOM. Present at that meeting were Desmond Hoyt, President of Guyana, Bernard St. John, Prime Minister of Barbados, John Compton, Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Herbert Blaise, Prime Minister of Grenada, Eugenia Charles, Prime Minister of Dominica, our host, James Mitchell, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I too, then Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, was also present. So James also helped us in St. Kitts and Nevis. He used the experience gained in fighting for the Beckway Airport in the halls of the European Economic Commission to fight tooth and nail to help St. Kitts and Nevis to secure the funding for the expansion of the Vance Amory International Airport in Nevis. He also worked assiduously with us to get the funding from USAID for the Southeast Peninsula Road, now the Dr. Kennedy Simmons Highway in St. Kitts. His life was a demonstration of regional cooperation at its finest and most practical application. His greatest influence on my life was as a friend. Our friendship went beyond the courtesies of political colleagues. We remained friends until death did us part. He encouraged me to keep up my three times a week tennis as he assured me that he was keeping up his three times a week swimming. Whenever we spoke, which was often, he insisted that I should write my own story. He was himself a prolific author, having written several books, and he was working on another one. I am not certain if it was finished. Eventually, I succumbed to his advice and wrote my only volume, 
the making of a national hero. He was happy when he received his autographed copy. Sabrina and Greta, I thank you for reaching out to me at your time of great anxiety when your father, my friend, was taken ill. I and my family extend deeper sympathy to you and all family members. Your father was an amazing man, a great man, not because of his many accolades, but he was great because of the salutary impact he has had on the lives of so many people at home, in the wider Caribbean, and further afield. Shakespeare never met Sir James Mitchell, but he described him as if they were friends and contemporaries, when he said his life was gentle, and the elements mixed so well in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. As my friend James Mitchell demits the stage, we who remain are witnesses to the end of an era. I salute the passing of an icon and a legend. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Imagine the words the used local by Dr. Kennedy Simmons to describe his friend, the late Sir James Fitzalan Mitchell. We now have a tribute from uh, Mr. Stanley John, QC, followed by a tribute and song. Your Excellency, the Governor General and Mr. Duggan, Your Lordship the Bishop, Honorable Prime Ministers, Honorable Leader of the Opposition, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, members of the Mitchell family, friends. A brief look at the program, we'll see that we are running way behind time. So I will be briefly brief. Sir James's life was an epic. And he embraced his successes in public life and defended those things for which he was criticized with equal aplomb. Much of what I intended to say, I will skip because of the time constraints. Rather, I'll ask that we say goodbye to Sir James at this time in recognition of his vision and service by reminding ourselves of what he himself said in relation to his vision and the experiences from which he drew his perspective on our island state's condition and its future within the wider Caribbean nationality. Reference was made to his writings and particularly to the anthology of speeches titled Caribbean Crusade. And I would ask that we remind ourselves from the introductory remarks 
that he made in the article which was first published in 1976 and which was republished in the Caribbean Crusade subsequently in relation to what shaped his vision. I think, if I may say so, that although history will determine the extent of his contribution, one would not be anticipating incorrectly if one was to hazard, indeed one was to assert, that perhaps the most profound aspect of his legacy, which he left with us, is the manner in which he transitioned from the pinnacle as prime minister to elder statesman. The circumstances which ensued after the 98, 1998 general elections and which, as Louise outlined, resulted in him making this transition convinced Sir James. He demonstrated a recognition that he acknowledged that the country and the people in the country were more important and were bigger than he is. And that vision, that understanding, that perspective clearly is articulated in these words that he has left with us. And I want to quote. He wrote that the real threat to our liberty today is not from the grandiosely styled metropolitan presence in the Caribbean, but from tyranny within the narrow confines of the island state. For all its evils and the legacy of colonialism, it includes certain institutions whose function is to protect the rights of the individual. As the independent authority of these institutions wither away, gradually, but not so subtly, we are creating a vacuum. One day someone will fill that vacuum for us, and we will be starting all over again. My experience as Premier Involved as I was and continue to be with the Caribbean scene, revealed to me clearly the degree to which our institutions are threatened by the ready and unruffled acquiescence of our people. In November 1973, in my mini state address, I spelled out the problem in these words, and he quoted himself. Make no mistake about it, horrors of hatred, the denial of reason, the loss of a sense of beauty or the right of personal choice and the collapse of our fundamental freedoms may well take our indifference and complacency by surprise. He continued, caught up in the momentum of independence, the former anti-colonial politician acquires the art of control, an art that continues to be refined after independence. At some state, we have got to ask the question, how do we reconcile government's quest for control with the citizens' pursuit of freedom? The pursuit of independence is the pursuit of home rule. We indeed end up with rulers who are preoccupied with ruling rather than the proper administration of our affairs. It is in this context that we must need or that we need to understand how our system should work and to recognize the failures of our institutions. And so, to determine the courses of action which can guarantee our freedom. For no final refuge will exist in the right language of a constitution when the institutions upholding it have collapsed. 
Hopefully, the significance of those observations will inform our consciousness as we negotiate the challenges ahead following the passing of Sir James. May I repeat today the sincere condolences expressed privately to his daughter Louise, her sisters Sabrina, Gretel, and Gabby, on behalf of my family and I, that as you mourn the sad passing of your departed father, in your moments of shared grief, may you, your families, and those loved ones who survive him find comfort in God's blessing and grace and in the fond memories which you share with him. Be assured, and I'm sure that you're confident of this, having received the benefit of the tributes that have been paid to him, that he gave distinguished service to his generation, that he stood tall among his peers. His memory will endure in the numerous lives that he touched, many of whom today share your loss. Rest eternal, grant unto him, O Lord, and may light perpetual shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Thank you. We will now have a song for Gerlie Gamsh in Dira. We now have a tribute in the song that's following the tribute by Mr. Stanley John QC. Following that, a series of tributes before we get into the Ministry of the Word. As we have. de souffrance Pourquoi ce chat tu commences Je ne suis qu'un essence sa portance Sans lui je suis on peut pas moi j'ai dit on me le dans le métro un dernier danse Pour oublier ma peine immense Je vais m'en faire et tu recommences Oh mon tout je de ciel et jour et nuit Je danse avec les vents, la pluie Au plus beau, la voix de miel Et je danse, 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 danse Et dans le bruit, je cours et j'ai peur Et ce mon tour est bien Ton absence, je peux trimer ce soir valide qu'un déco qui brille de décence. Cher de ciel, jour et nuit, je danse avec les vents la pluie. Après vous la pas de miel et je danse, 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 danse. Je couche et je perds Et ce mon tour est bien à tout l'air Dans tout Paris, je m'abandonne Je m'envole, vole, 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 vole Je danse, 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 
tribute or music by uh, Luna Kade, granddaughter of Sir James Mitchell, doing his As we continue with the program with more tributes, vocal tributes, Mr. Artis Davis is next on our program, followed by Mr. Glenford Stewart, then Mr. Richard S. Hutchinson. And later on, we'll have another poem, and then the ministry of the word. My respect to the deceased and all who mourn his passing. The death of a prime minister of a country is equivalent to the passing of the father in a family. The loss of Sir James Mitchell, also known as Son Mitchell, is the loss of a father of the peoples of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and is personal to me in more ways than one. I share his loss with the closest of his family and grieve with my countrymen and women with moment momentous sadness. I am privileged to be afforded this opportunity by his family to bid farewell to Sir James due to my close association with the former Prime Minister, in particular after he went into retirement. I am proud of my years of public service to my country, most of which was spent during the tenure of the late Prime Minister Sir James Mitchell. In my capacity as public relations officer of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force, I was called upon to brief the Prime Minister on a regular basis on various matters and soon developed a relationship of trust with the Prime Minister. That relationship continued after retirement, and I have been the benefactor of countless stories told by Sir James. He had an incredible memory and was by his deep knowledge of things past an institution in his own right. He was during his lifetime and now after his death an inspiration and a role model for all Vincentians. He rose from humble beginnings to become the number one person of this land for many years. We have lost a great son of the soil. Those more endowed than I am will chronicle Sir James's greatness, but I wish to say many heroes became heroes after their lifetime. History will be kind to the former Prime Minister, and his name will endure the test of time. His works will forever be etched in the annals of our history. I had the honor of celebrating his 90th birthday in Bekwe with him. It was a joyous occasion, and Sir James was in a jovial mood. In September of this year, Sir James summoned me to his house at Cusson Hill, where he wrote 33 events of his life in chronological order, which he termed his milestone and gave to me. I will be pleased to pass those on to the historians. I last spoke with Sir James on November 6 from his hospital bed in Barbados via a video conference facilitated by his daughter, Sabrina. He was in good spirits, and I was really looking forward to seeing him again, but that was not to be. My sincerest condolences to Sir James's daughters and other family members. Be comforted that his life was one well-lived and, be, and will be in the memory of our beloved country forever. As family and friends of Sir James, we will surely miss the sobering atmosphere that he was able to give even in difficult and stressful circumstances. Put God, but God has called him home to rest 
a while. As we accept God's will, we pray, and with faith we know that although we are apart from Sir James, his spirit will live forever in our hearts. My, may his soul rest in peace. I thank you. Uh, emotional tribute to the Mr. Artis Davis. We expect uh, the tributes to continue for the uh, ministry of the world. I see a change in the order. The tribute to the one of the daughters of Sir James, Kabija Mitchell. So we go back to the microphone for that tribute. has played a factor sorry in the change of the tributes and we've just uh, had a significant jump so Good we're going morning. to take you to the lectern for the youngest Thank daughter you of the former prime here. minister what a few weeks it's been for my family and i and it's uh, you're all distinguished guests in our opinion for showing up here for your love and respect for our father I want to first clarify <laughs> that my name is Gabia. <laughs> Gabia with a J, the J might throw you off, but it is a name that he gave me and he found the spirit within it, which is the Lithuanian goddess of fire. <laughs> so I hope that I embody just that in his name. Whether you knew him or just beginning to understand my father's story, one thing is for certain. He has been all of our fathers. <sighs> and I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. <sighs> because what a sun shining example of a father he has had the capacity to be for us all. <sighs> Give me a second. <laughs> There's so much in a name. <laughs> when my father was born, men weren't allowed in the room at the time. They yelled out, it's a son. And the name stuck forevermore. If I'm not mistaken, it's the catchphrase his early, one of his early campaigns used when he was a member of the Labour Party. Son, our star. <laughs> Which I then understand meant he knew that he held the key. I'm aware that many of the younger generation of Vincentian may not know how beloved a leader my father was and why even in his passing he will continue to be a resounding force for our country's success because he believed so much in the goals of each and every drop of Vincentian's sweat. So for those of you who don't know him so well, Allow me to tell you the tale of a young boy from Bekwe. <laughs> you know, the, the ones that you see running down the beach into the water off the jetty. A boy who lost his father before they got to know one another. A boy raised by his community, which perhaps is the genesis of this inspirational story. This story of one of the greatest fathers and community builders this nation has ever seen. <sighs> like many of you, this young child had a desire to further his education and world exploration, seek out world exploration, and this led him to leave our shores and spend a few years abroad. He traveled both regionally and internationally for school and then traversed his way through Europe, where I imagine his appreciation for fine wine and good food from different cultures began. There he immersed himself with the language and traditions associated with many different people, forever curious as to how other societies did things. He did this as he figured out his place in the world. 
And then came the aha moment. Like in every good superhero movie or novel. <laughs> the moment of resolve where a young man or woman where a young man or woman's life purpose becomes ever clear to them. For him, it was that he must return home this knowledge and help his community, the community that he grew with, to prosper, to continue to prosper. <laughs> he felt the calling and his vision began to emerge. His moral compass etched in stone forever pointing north over Bekwe and for the people of this country. Politics would then make sense. To pay tribute to my father, one cannot look alone at his political career as the full picture. Politics was simply the tool he used to keep his vision for his beloved Vinci alive. Maybe it's because he and I began to know each other once he retired and the work I've done on myself spiritually. But I believe my father's greatest achievement was that he knew his earthly purpose and pursued it every day. His spirit being able to transition with a clear conscience. What was his purpose, you ask? If I could put it into a sentence, to use his skills to provide opportunities for the success of the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He never rested without thinking what he could do tomorrow to help someone from our community achieve their goals. You must always have an agenda, <laughs> he, he says. When he looked at you, he looked for your potential in a way and a way in which he could be of service. So many of you here and tuning in around the world can testify to that. Growing up in the Grenadines teaches you to make something out of limited resources. So naturally, his vision for Vinci was that as a community, we equip ourselves with the tools and the ability to serve one another by, and by virtue uplift this nation. His dedication to Vincentian excellence is what led him to defeats and triumphs in every sphere. My father and I came from very different generations. <laughs> he was born in the 30s, I in the 90s. <laughs> Something we had to learn to appreciate about one another. He didn't quite understand my direction in media and the arts as, at first but he was also a fantastic writer, <laughs> a poet, some may even say a fashion designer, <laughs> a singer, terrible as that, <laughs> a swimmer, an activist, a scientist, and what I enjoyed most, a wise comedian. <laughs> he was a true alchemist. One of all of these Mathiers contributed to his vision and stemmed from his goals for this country. So to every young boy and girl listening to this story, what I, can, what I hope you can take from my father's life is that you have the power to do anything once you align with the purpose within you and figure out the best version of yourself along that journey. Allow every experience to inform your path and do not limit yourself within any boxes expected of you. My father certainly didn't. On his 90th, I had two large balloons that said nine and zero and I placed them, admittedly, in a walkway. <laughs> My father saw that and boom, bulldozed right through the 90, <laughs> knocking them down to the side. The path of a visionary is neither simple, nor is it straightforward. As we look back on a year of great trials and tribulations, let us look heavily towards the abundance that is possible for our future and take inspiration from the life of one of our nation's greatest architects. A man I am so blessed 
to have called my darling daddy, <laughs> whose sun-filled spirit will forever shine protectively upon each future of this, of the future of each citizen of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Not to copy my sister, but this too is the song that I would sing. I'll do another one. <laughs> and if you know it, you can join in. First, I want to preface that I do believe that a rainy cloud is a good omen because my father being a Grenadine man, he taught me to love the rain and believe it to be a blessing. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You never know, dear, <laughs> how much I love you. So please don't take my sunshine away. Thank you. A tribute there, followed by a short rendition of the song by the daughter of Sir James Mitchell. We're now learning the correct pronunciation of the Mitchell. And uh, we expect a few adjustments to the program as it relates to the main that we have in front of us. So we have to be guided uh, by uh, what is happening at the lectern. So let's go back and listen in for any further adjustments rest of the proceedings. So, we thank them for being present here this afternoon, but they would understand the situation. We now have the collect, which would be done by Father Jones, and that would be followed by the Ministry of the Word. May we all kindly stand. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, remember before you today your servant James Fitzallen. And we pray that, having opened to him the gates of larger life, you will receive him more and more into your joyful service. That, with all who have served you in the past, he may share in the eternal victory of Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. The Ministry of the Word, we have our first reading from the Old Testament by Miss Beverly Reddock. And it, oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have our first reading from the Old Testament which will be done by Miss Beverly Reddock, reading from Ecclesiasticus chapter 44, verses 1 to 10 and 13 to 14. Let us sing the, the new song. Let us sing, now sing the praises of famous men our ancestors in their generations. The Lord apportioned to them great glory, his majesty from the beginning. There were those who ruled in their kingdoms and made a name for themselves by their valor. Those who gave counsel before they were intelligent, those who spoke in prophetic oracles. 
those who led the people by their counsels and by their knowledge of the people's law. They were wise in their words of instruction, those who composed musical tunes and put verses in writing. Rich men endowed with resources, living peacefully in their homes. All these were honored in their generations and were the pride of their times. Some of them have left behind a name so that others declare their praise, but, but of others there is no memory. They have perished as though they had never existed. They have become as though they had never been born they and their children after them. But these also were godly men whose righteous deeds have not been forgotten. Their offspring will continue forever and their glory will never be blotted out. Their bodies are buried in peace, but their name lives on generation after generation. The word of the Lord. Our next reading is Psalm 116. It will be done by Senator Chevron John. I love the Lord, for he had heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and the sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was Bartolo, he saved me. Return to your rest, O soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. The New Testament lesson is written in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 5, verses 4 to 16, and it would be read by Mrs. Shafia London. Blessed are they that mourn, 
for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do, do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his faith savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it on their bushel, but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Here ends the scripture reading. Her Excellency, Dame Susan Duggan, Governor General and Mr. Duggan, Dr. The Honorable Ralphie Gonzalez, Prime Minister and Mrs. Gonzalez. Dr. The Right Honorable Keith Mitchell, Prime Minister of Grenada. Honorable Dr. Godwin Friday, Leader of the Opposition, and Mrs. Friday. Honorable Rochelle Ford, Speaker of the House of Assembly. Members of Cabinet, Members of Parliament, Visiting Dignitaries. Members of the diplomatic community, former parliamentarians, members of the clergy, senior public servants, senior officers of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force, family of the late Right Honorable Sir James Mitchell, ladies and gentlemen, representatives of the media, brothers and sisters all. Prime Minister Mitchell, good to see you, sir. A while ago, I thought you had a peek into my sermon, because you quoted from my text. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Romans 14, 7 to 9. St. Paul has been dealing with two specific problems. The observance of special days and abstention from certain foods. These basically speak of a principle which ought to govern our attitude towards life. None of us, he states, lives to ourselves. We may take this to mean that we are interdependent and that as human beings, we are bound together. Although this is in keeping with Paul's conviction that we are related to one another in such a way that we have a responsibility to care for each other. On this occasion, Paul is referring to something which is more fundamental than this. What he states is that we are bound together in mutual dependence because we are related to God. We have a responsibility to care for each other because of the fact that everyone is a child of God. This surely affects our lives and attitude to others and to ourselves. 
For it makes us aware that living our lives to our own dictates and interests is contrary to what is required of us as children of God. The fact that we are a part of God's creation emphasizes that we are always dependent upon God's sustaining grace. Our life as children of God is possible only because we do not trust in our own strength and resources, but look to God in whom we live and move and have our being. We live to the Lord when we submit ourselves to God in loving obedience in all things and seek to glorify him in all things. This is not only true about some aspects of our lives, it is also true even in death. For in death, as much as in life, we are dependent on God. If nothing can separate us from God's love, then nothing can limit God's authority over the lives of his children. For Christ, by his death and resurrection, became Lord both of the dead and of the living. This emphasis on life and death is Paul's way of demonstrating the unique claim of Christ upon the believer. Christ is with us in death <coughs> as well as in life. Indeed, in death, who else is with us? Nothing lies outside the scope of Christ's authority. Jesus himself had declared in Matthew 22, verse 32, that God was the God both of the living and the dead. Inherent in our faith is the assurance that it is God's will that we should never fall out of his care and keeping. In John 10, 27 to 30, Jesus is quoted as saying, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why is there such a fear of death? It is suggested that this is so because in the face of death, the naked truth of the human condition stares us in the face. And we are frightened by our knowledge of our helplessness, defenselessness, and the fact that we are powerless when we are confronted with the reality of death. None of us had any say nor anything to do with coming into this world. However, we want to have control, some say, over when we leave this world. We fail to appreciate the mystery that life is. Through life's journey, we tend to forget that we are creatures. We are all a part of God's creation, no less than the trees and stars, cows, sheep, fish, birds of the air. 
From the very beginning of creation, we human beings have misused our freedom and made wrong choices. Rather than acknowledging that we are creatures, we have sought and continue to put ourselves in the place of the Creator and acting as though we are in total control of our lives and the world in which we live, failing to accept that we have limits. But when death steps onto the stage, it creates a conundrum, a challenge, a struggle. As Job says, remember life is but a breath, or for inquire now of bygone generations and consider what their ancestors have found, for we are but of yesterday and we know nothing, for our days on earth are but a shadow. As Francis Bacon has said, men fear death, as children fear to go in the dark. And as that natural fear in children is increased with tales, so is the other. Plato said, no one knows whether death, which people fear to be the greatest evil, may not be the greatest good. Paul Tillich, in the depth of the anxiety of having to die is the anxiety of being eternally forgotten. Aristotle, death is the most frightening thing, for nothing is thought any longer good or bad for one who is dead. Aristotle also called death the thing to be feared most because it appears to be the end of everything. But for those who believe, those who believe in Jesus, those who believe in God, life begins and ends in God. It is the divine one allowing us to participate in his divine mystery. The purpose and meaning of life and death is found in God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. For those who believe, life begins and ends in God. It is the divine one allowing us to participate in his divine mystery. The purpose and meaning of life and death is found in God. Therefore, our lives ought to be fashioned in accord with this truth. Lives in which we endeavor to deepen our relationship with Jesus Christ by a life committed to the worship of God and to the study of his will for us as this is revealed in the Holy Scriptures. By giving of our time and talents to expressing the love of God through service to our fellow human beings, by responsible use of the earth and the rest of creation, so that neither human nor animal life is endangered, by using our money and other material possessions prudently, providing for our families and in promoting the church's ministry to the world. I remind you that living our lives to our own dictates and interests is contrary to what is required of us. The fact that we are part of God's creation 
emphasizes that we are always dependent upon God's sustaining grace. Our life as children of God is possible only because we do not trust in our own strength and resources, but look to God in whom we live and move and have our being. The question is, are you trusting in your own strength and resources? Are you trusting in a false security? We live to the Lord when we submit ourselves to God in love and obedience in all things and seek to glorify him in all things. This is not only true about some aspect of our lives. It is also true even in death. For in death, as much as in life, we are dependent on God. If nothing can separate us from God's love, then nothing can limit God's authority over the lives of his children. For Christ, by his death and resurrection, became Lord both of the dead and of the living. This emphasis on life and death is Paul's way of demonstrating the unique claim of Christ upon the believer. Christ is with us in death as well as in life. Indeed, in death, who else is with us? Nothing lies outside the scope of Christ's authority. Jesus himself had declared in Matthew 22, 32, that God was the God both of the living and the dead. Inherent in our faith is the assurance that it is God's will that we should never fall out of his care and keeping. As he said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. I take this opportunity on behalf of the Diocese of the Windward Islands to extend to the family of the late Sir James Mitchell our deepest sympathy on his passing, and to leave these words of faith with you in this moment of sadness and mourning. For those who believe, life begins and ends in God. It is the divine one allowing us to participate in the divine mystery. The purpose and meaning of life and death is found in God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Christ is with us in life as well as in death. Indeed, in death, who else is with us? For those who believe, life begins and ends in God. It is the divine one allowing us to participate in his divine mystery. The purpose and meaning of life and death is found in God. So James have gone before us. We have heard the eulogy and the tributes. We are here, still alive. And as you mourn, remember these words. Christ is with us in life as well as in death. For indeed, in death, who else is with us? 
But we do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Verse eternal grant unto Sir James, O Lord. May he and all the faithfully parted to the mercies of God rest in peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Reverend Bishop C. Leopold Friday of the Windward Islands. The call, of course, and uh, we've heard it express. If we, whether we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's, the final hymn. Standing on confidence and hope, confess the faith into which we were baptized, as we said, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. 
please be seated. After each bidding, your response will be, hear us, Lord. Please sit. Almighty God, you have knit your chosen people together in one communion, in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear us, Lord. May all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection die to sin and rise to newness of life. And may we with him pass through the grave and the gate of death to our joyful resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith that your Holy Spirit may lead us to holiness and righteousness all our days. Lord, in your mercy, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Lord, in your mercy, grant for all of us who mourn the sure confidence in your loving care that casting all their sorrows on you, they may know the consolation of your love. Lord, in your mercy, give courage and faith to those who are bereaved that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a holy and certain hope and in a joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you our brother James, who was born by water and the spirit in holy baptism. Grant that his death may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow where you have led the way and where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Rest eternal grant unto him, O Lord. May he and all the faithful departed to the mercies of God rest in peace. We bring you continued coverage of the state funeral for the late James Fitzalan Mitchell from Hopkins Town Village Church. Now we see the Hopkins Town Corral now preparing to do the rendition of the Argentina, the late service on the We are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind. We are mortal, from the dead, and the dead shall be returned. For so then you are here, you created me, saying, You are dust, to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, but even at the grave we make our song. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
As we end our service this evening, we would ask the Kingston Chorale, sitting upstairs in the choir loft, to sing Sir James' favorite song, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, as we lead him out of the service. That was his favorite song.
But all you have to do is look at me and know that every word is We finally close now with the Nung Dimitis. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and giving life to those in the tomb. The Son of Righteousness is gloriously risen, giving light to those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. The Lord will guide our feet into the way of peace, having taken away the sin of the world. Christ will open the kingdom of heaven to all who believe in his name, saying, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Into paradise, may the angels lead you. At your coming, may the martyrs receive you, bring you into the holy city, Jerusalem. May the choirs of angels receive you, and with Lazarus once poor, may you have eternal rest.
listening to live coverage of the state funeral for the late Sir James Fitz Alan Mitchell as we conclude the service here in St. Vincent on mainland that is and uh, the next stop will be in Equi, uh, his home soil, the land of his birth and I'm sure that those in Bequi will be eagerly awaiting the arrival of the final mortal remains which will be taken down via private charter ferry and uh, not too long from now we of course recognize all those joining us on the various platforms we are joined uh, by uh, various local stations and I suspect some other regional stations will join in as well on the visual end this is a joint production of VC3 Television in collaboration with the Agency for Public Information and the National Broadcasting Corporation with additional coverage provided by SVG Television, IKTV and also UE Television as we witness the moving of the final mortal remains of Sir James being moved by the pallbearers to the hearse which will then proceed uh, up to the Bredenine's Wharf there will be a salute there before his remains are taken on board uh, the chartered ferry the Vecker Express which will sail down to the Grenadines a trip that is expected to take uh, about 50 minutes to an hour there his body will be received uh, in a ceremonial fashion at the wharf in Beckway. From there, taken to the almond tree for a symbolic, a symbolic singing of two songs by and performance by two of that should be by members of the. Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force Band, so the band will provide uh, those renditions uh, there. As we see the slow march happening at the moment, there are six sergeants of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force bearing the casket carrying the remains of Sir James and it's now being lowered and placed into the waiting hearse for the next portion of Sir James's send-off. In case you didn't know, Sir James also held uh, the accolades as a Privy Councillor, PC, and also as KCMG, Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, in addition to him being former Prime Minister, second Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, he also served as a Foreign Minister for an extended period. He served in Parliament, as a matter of fact, from 1966 until his retirement in 2000. He was 53 at the time he became this nation's second Prime Minister and uh, he won four consecutive elections between 1984 and 1998 when the NDP swept 15 parliamentary seats in the general elections of 1989. Since his retirement in 2000, he has been an advisor to the New Democratic Party along with an author. He has written several books mentioned earlier on in the broadcast, uh, Beyond the Islands, an autobiography in 2006, Reaching for the Future, in 1991, done in collaboration with Erskine Sandiford and Michael Manley, two regional leaders at the time of the publication. Guiding Change on the Islands, a collection of speeches, 1989-1996. This was published in 1996. A Season of Light, a series of messages on development in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 2001. These are the publications done by St. James and we heard this evening about or this afternoon rather about the book that he was preparing to 
send for publishing and we await uh, that will be published posthumously. And I suspect that will be the case. As we see the outriders who will be traveling with the hearse and uh, the party upwards to the Grenadines Wharf and uh, the traffic has been diverted for the moment to allow for a smooth flow of the procession up to the Grenadines Wharf. We began here just after 8 o'clock this morning at the Kingstown Methodist Church, a service held with full Anglican rites been overseen by the officiant, the Right Reverend C. Leopold Fry, the Bishop of the Windward Islands, with assistance from uh, Reverend Philbert Delaney, Superintendent Minister of the Kingstown Methodist Church. As the body moves to Beckway, there'll be a second service for those who are attending in the Grenadines, Beckway, the Northern and the Southern Grenadines, as a, as a family had encouraged uh, those in the Grenadines to attend the service on the island of Beckway. So those from the southern Grenadines will come up to Beckway and those on the island of Beckway will remain for that portion. The feature tribute at that service is expected to come from the Honourable Mia Motley, Prime Minister of the Republic of Barbados. And uh, today, uh, earlier on rather, we had uh, the feature tribute delivered by the Prime Minister of Grenada, Dr. The Right Honourable Keith Mitchell. As we see, the movement begins for the procession to the Grenadines Wharf, where the hearse and the contingent will be welcomed and uh, ceremoniously board the ferry, chartered ferry, the Beckway Express, that will then sail onward to the island of Beckway. Later on, we anticipate that following the church service at the St. Mary's Anglican Church, that the body will move onward to the private estate of the family, the Sir James family, the Mitchell family rather, at Mount Pleasant, there the body will be interred later today. Full honours being given to Sir James on this occasion as a former Prime Minister and a senior statesman been accorded a state funeral and uh, as the procession gets ready to move we would have our cameras follow what is happening on the streets and hopefully we'll have some visuals uh, from the air as well as we continue with our coverage. Our coverage continues on all the various platforms uh, well into the evening as we will have our team taking care of the Beckway leg. Uh, later on you'll hear the voices of uh, Jennifer Richardson and uh, Don Collins who will take you through the happenings on the island of Beckway. As we see the procession now moving off towards the Grenadines Wharf and uh, moving at a rather quick pace for a start. Uh, we already well beyond the time that was allotted in terms of the planned time frame. It's 23 minutes after 1 and uh, it was expected that by this time the remains would have been on the express and possibly already on the way to Beckway or close to arriving in Beckway but uh, that's not the case. We are moving now towards the Grenadines Wharf at a quick pace. There you have it, a bird's eye view of the movement, a very quick pace. Uh, vehicles all spaced with the two outriders from the police force. As they move past at this time the courthouse and uh, onward to the Grenadines Wharf. As you, yes, the hearse moves past the Parliament building 
At this time, as you notice, the traffic has been diverted and cleared to uh, allow for a smooth flow of the procession. The traffic officers placed strategically to allow for a smooth flow as well. And in a matter of a few minutes, I suspect that the body of Sir James will be arriving at the Grenadines Wharf for departure to Beckway. It's been a very warm morning here in Kingstown. We had some very strong winds earlier this morning. It's uh, since subsided somewhat. And uh, we know that the seas are pretty roughed up at this time with the strong winds. We do pray for a safe and sound journey downward to Beckway for those who are traveling on the high seas uh, with the remains of Sir James for the next portion of his send-off. Uh, we continue to view the bird's eye view of the movement of the body to the Grenadines Wharf. At this time, the procession now passing the post office building, the ministerial building, and uh, heading up to make that diversion a view of the traffic situation in Kingstown, it's uh, smooth sailing it appears all the way up to the Grenadines Wharf. I can see on the other side on Bay Street that there's a, a backlog of traffic there. That's, that's expected as the diversions happen. And uh, we expect that this process will be completed shortly and uh, the regular flow of traffic will resume at some point in the not too distant future. In the distance we can see the uh, ferries on the on shore on the Grenadines Wharf awaiting. Uh, there is actually a scheduled ferry uh, and uh, the chartered ferry both leaving uh, in, in close timing as there's been delay with the finishing of the mainland portion of the proceedings in the service, the funeral service. As you see in the distance, the, all the vehicles accompanying the remains of Sir James, family, close friends, those who are doing official duties as members of the protocol committee, ensuring that all relevant protocols are followed and that uh, the dignitaries and everyone involved from an official standpoint is taken care of. In the distance, uh, we see beyond the buildings the hearse disappearing in its onward quick journey up to the Grenadines Wharf. Momentarily, the hearse should be arriving at the wall. Uh, in the distance, I noticed that uh, it's just approaching the area of the NIS building, and uh, that is just outside of the just outside of the NIS building, right, and just outside the gates of the entry to the terminal, Kingstone cruise terminal and the Grenadines Wharf. A beautiful day, sunshiny day, there's a cruise ship in port. The Aida, uh, one of the Aida ships I believe, uh, there in port today, beautifully painted and as viewed from this standpoint, uh, quite majestic in its appearance. It's a you know, windy morning, so there's some visibility uh, issues as you go further out. Once again, for those who are viewing, this is live coverage of the state funeral of Sir James Fitz Allen Mitchell. We're finishing up the mainland portion of the coverage today and uh, onwards to Beckway. Now you see a shot of the awaiting ferry. And uh, shortly we will have the departure I suspect in a few minutes the departure of the ferry down to Beckway. 
and uh, from the distance you can see that uh, there's a, an area where persons are gathered waiting to see uh, what happens next but just to give you an idea as to what would happen as the body moves to Bekwi the mortal remains will be received at a ceremony on the wall in Bekwe. From there onward to the almond tree where two songs will be rendered by the police band. The track Oh God or Help In Ages Pass by Isaac Watts. Don't Cry For Me Argentina by Andrew Lloyd Webber. You heard a performance earlier from the Kingston Choral doing a beautiful rendition of the song a favorite of sir james don't cry for me argentina and uh, we know that the police band will of course do justice to that rendition on the back leg of our coverage and later on we'll hand over to the team in uh, beckway for coverage which will be spearheaded by itfx of course, it will be continuously relayed on all of the various platforms, so you can continue to listen to coverage on NBC, uh, view on BC3 television, API, IKTV, SVG television, and the other platforms joining in today. We hope that you'll be able to stay with the broadcast. Reflecting on uh, the life of Sir James, he wrote an autobiography that was published in 2006, and I highlighted some very interesting points. Uh, the fact that he was called Son Mitchell, that was explained by his daughter, Gabia, earlier. Um, but he made some very other sterling points in his autobiography. It speaks a lot about his family and his childhood and uh, his candidacy for South Central Windward. And unfortunately some of the threats that he received to his life while doing so he spoke extensively about the party that he founded the new democratic party in 1975 on december 3rd his relationship with regional leaders such as eugenia charles eric williams Errol barrow edward siaga to name a few he had a love for europe and that was captured as well in his autobiography the european architecture its culture and also about his trek across Europe with his late friend Philip Graves. So as we continue to view a lovely aerial shot of Kingstown looking towards the cruise ship terminal and uh, the Grenadines Wharf, we await some further visuals as to what's happening with the transfer onto the ferry of the remains of Sir James and then the onward journey to Beckway. Coming into the shot you can see now uh, the financial complex on the right of your screen. The complex of course was constructed during his tenure as Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and uh, also the vegetable market another of the project constructed during his tenure as Prime Minister. Two buildings that we are seeing in our shot, the fish market uh, that done in collaboration with the Japanese government also falling into our shot or visual. They are now all projects done under his leadership as Prime Minister from 1984 till 2000 when he retired. As we get a broader view of what Kingstown looks like today, uh, the Kingstown Methodist Church captured there and the St. George's Cathedral, the Anglican Cathedral, uh, the funeral service ended uh, just under half an hour ago and uh, we continue with our coverage here on the various platforms as we look in the distance and uh, observe the traffic that is backed up on Bay Street. Uh, so for those who are traveling around Kingston, you'd want to uh, look out for the 
changes in the traffic flow. I see we have some visuals now from the Grenadines Wharf. The security persons, along with a representative of the Foreign Affairs Ministry, and is in charge of the protocols on one two back way. Uniformed uh, officers of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force. You see the Decker Express already loading there some of those traveling down to Beckway. Of course this is a private charter and uh, it is not expected that members of the public would be allowed uh, on board as uh, there's a uh, very large contingent going down inclusive of family, friends, uh, parliamentarians, other officials who will be traveling on that. Uh, we're also told that uh, the Coast Guard, a Coast Guard vessel, uh, Captain Humalzak, uh, would also be traversing down to Beckway, taking along some officials as well. I'm not sure if that vessel has departed as yet, but we do know that the vessel carrying Sir James is still in Port Kingstown, still at the Grenadines Wharf. I'm seeing now members of the family, some of the children, grandchildren, friends of the family on the Grenadines Wharf. And uh, as we see now, they are boarding the vessel, the Beckway Express 5, it appears, yes. As we would up imagine that the journey down takes about uh, 50 minutes, roughly. Depends on the sea conditions, maybe a bit longer. Uh, we were scheduled to start the funeral service in Beckway at 2.30. That doesn't look possible at this point. Would start a bit later than that. Of course, we also remember the portion of the proceedings which will take place under the almond tree well, a favorite spot of sir james and two of his favorite songs also will be rendered there as our a video stream now captures on board the vessel we get a, a view and hopefully we'll be able to stay with this feed for at least part of the journey down to Beckway. Um, depending on connectivity, we should be able to stay with this feed for a bit before we segue to the rest of the program. But we say good afternoon, good morning, good evening to those who are just tuning in. You missed the first part of the broadcast if you are now joining the funeral service on mainland. The next major happening is the funeral service in Beckwith, which would also uh, carry as well on our platforms. We invite you to, of course, stay with us, and as we get uh, more of the visuals, we expect uh, continued coverage as the body of Sir James arrives in Beckwith. And also, as we welcome back Dion, John, who just went out for a bit, but she's back with us. Welcome back. Thank you very much, Colvin. Um, I thought the funeral proceedings uh, this this morning into the afternoon were a very fitting tribute to the uh, man whom we are here to pay respects to and to say. Thank you for all that you've done for us as a nation, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, this country's second Prime Minister, who just at the, I, I suppose you can use the tender age of 53. We know other leaders have taken up a leadership post, even at a younger age, but 53 uh, became Prime Minister of this country after getting involved in politics from about 1966 or thereabout and uh, no doubt has made an overwhelming contribution to this nation of ours, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And as we make where we transition from mainland, where he spent much of his professional life, 
as Prime Minister, of course, the office of the Prime Minister is basically uh, housed at mainland. The financial complex uh, is on mainland, which where his office is, where his office was then as Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and now they make the they, they, they move across the waters to the Grenadines and I'm sure this is something that he would have done several times, many times, several times per week during his tenure as Prime Minister traversing from mainland to the Grenadines. So this is no stranger or this is nothing strange this was in terms of travels. the happenings. And I suppose that informed his wishes when he actually conceptualized and put in place the arrangements for the funeral service which we are having today uh, his daughter Sarah Sarah Louise Mitchell as she told us uh, today uh, would have told us today. yes we, we learned a lot about that and, and we did say that we anticipate that when we had the tributes that we would hear a lot more about the man in terms of his professional life the work of his family and everything like that as we recognize the leader of the opposition of uh, the honorable godwin friday making his way on i noticed uh just observe uh, jennifer richardson the yes. director of the api who is just heading on I just board and uh, go. she's going to basically take up arms in the grenadine island of beckway when we transition our broadcast i recognize as well donny collins donny will be joining jennifer as part of the broadcast team in the Grenadine Island of Beckway. So we, we are expected to have continued coverage, no doubt, of the proceedings. And we thank all our listeners who have remained with us. I have received several comments since I, I nipped out just for a bit about persons who are following the coverage in many countries across the world, persons whose lives he is impacted in one way or the other and then those who have friends in St. Vincent and are aware of his contribution in terms of, of his writings and so forth in the tourism industry and of course shipping and boat building and all of that and they are here to pay tribute. I'm not too sure if you've mentioned Colvin. Uh, there is going to be a uh, 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 Okay, and the word is evading me now. A welcome in uh, Beckway. Yes. Uh, what, yes. What's the word I'm looking for, Calvin? Uh, uh, it is I, evading sure. me. <laughs> that word is evading me right now. There will be a grand welcome in Beckway in terms of the... Uh, the yes, I, it's, it's evading me again. I had it and then it's jumping that's, that's ahead. That's but, but yes, <laughs> yes we, we, we will have hours. that. Yes, all the boats will be welcoming, would be lining up on the ferry. Uh, yes, the word, that's yeah, the yeah. word I'm looking for to welcome uh, the <laughs> Beckway Express when it comes down. And we notice the guard of honor remains intact. And the last vehicle that will make its way onto the ferry is, of course, the cortege. The, yes. the, sorry, the hearse, the hearse bearing the cortege of the body of the former prime minister. And this is this. This is so because, of course, that would be the first vehicle to 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 then come off in in Beckway, of course. And this would be led by the outriders. There would be. Uh, a water salute of some sort. I yes, we don't know the full Beckway. detail, but there will be a yes. quite a welcome with a flotilla. Yes. Uh, of of particularly the Grenadines ferries. Yes. Uh, those and there are, are some there are some there are some other yachts that I understand yes. are now joining They'll that and have come from across of Europe yeah. who would be doing that as well. And so we expect that, and there would be some semblance of a ceremony. And there, there should be a firing party at some point where there would In be the salute of, I think it's 19 gun salutes. Yes. And we expect that our team would be able to bring coverage of, of, of that as well. Similarly, the procession to the almond tree where the two hymns, two of his favorite hymns, uh, one is her favorite song, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, which was expertly done by the uh, Kingstown Chorale with over 60 years of experience. Uh, Andrea Games Mohairs and Addison Studdard, two lead vocalists with the chorale out front in terms of the singing of that. And then the playing of Oh God, Our Help 
in ages past and we learned this morning into this afternoon that that was a song that he he sang at his political meetings and rallies yes. and uh, you could understand therefore the significance and the importance of them being featured prominently a part of today's our funeral service for the late prime minister and uh, you're looking at visuals we actually have a a uh, roving camera on board the vessel, Metro yes. Express, that will be giving us uh, a live feed as, as long yes. as it allows us to. And of course, we do recognize technical limitations as we traverse the region between the mainland and uh, Bekwe, but we're able to have visual as a boat departs, boat uh, on the Grenadines Wharf and on the ferry. As we see now, the hearse moves towards the ferry for boarding, being the final vehicle to do so. And then the the hatch will be taken up at the back and the boat proceeds down through the Becker Channel mm. and into the beautiful island of Beckway. Island of Clouds. Island of Clouds. Yes. yes. <laughs> we said at the same time. And 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 there's earlier on we recognized that there were just blue skies. I didn't see much clouds. I'm not too sure what would ensue over there as they traverse down to the Grenadines. And we see the official vehicles as well as part of the... Yeah, so uh, that sums up the final boarding Yes. for the vessel uh, I from now. I think on the other end, mm -hmm. I'm I'm just trying to clarify some notes here. On the on the other end, um, there will be, of course, uh, putting out um, the uh, gangway to allow the officials who are boarding the coast guard to uh, to get on to the coast guard because the coast guard is making its way down the police band also will be traveling on the coast guard down to the grenadines um i i i think uh ministers of government other ministers of government are expected to be on the coast guard other officials ambassadors etc and i i i believe as well i i saw the leader of the opposition and the other members of the opposition side of parliament also boarding this uh Liquid private Express, chartered yes. vessel which is going to the grenadines for this service uh, so we see the security officials members of the media just smelling about i noted earlier on some members of the corral i recognize as well the daughter of uh, sir james louis mitchell uh, there as well and other family members his youngest daughter who I thought did a very fitting uh, tribute one which uh, most of us in terms of uh, uh, should I say younger um, yes <laughs> yes <I> wish, <laughs> we, we, we were able to to appreciate in terms of uh, the generations of hearts and, and everything like that but I really thought it was a very fitting tribute and her father will be justly proud as we heard as well uh, that uh, Mrs. Mitchell Joseph also did say that he would be proud of the tribute, the featured tribute which was delivered this morning by the Right Honourable uh, Keith Mitchell out of the Caribbean island of Grenada and with whom he worked very closely. And they, so, so we are here and we are continuing to provide coverage to you for as long as, as long it lasts. As our, team, <laughs> our, our team is still in, in place here at the Methodist Church in Kingstown. And we have a wonderful team of uh, workers from the Agency for Public Information, VC3, and of course NBC Radio. And we recognize the work of Alonzo Sears on camera earlier on this morning into this afternoon. Uh, I almost said I'm the lone female member of the team, but I, I know you, you can't not recognize the efforts of uh, the, one of the masterminds, brilliant masterminds behind the camera, Simish Oliver, who also featured on one of the main cameras on the ground floor of the church this morning. Some excellent shots. We uh, also on. had uh, Clinton Bostwick, a part of the team. Uh, Dylan, is your surname still Richards? 
Robertson. Robertson. Yes. <laughs> Dylan, Dylan, you'll forgive me for renaming you on this uh, it, on, on this day. Oh, oh, the two cameras are on board now. Yes. Yes. It appears that way. And and I notice fantasy tours are just uh, just just there on the side. I'm I'm trying There's to. There's a cruise ship in port. So oh, there is a cruise ship yes, in port. The Ida Pearl, I believe, is there. Okay, so I believe that they are uh, they will be going sailing. I am not too sure if they know the historical significance of what is happening historical in St. Vincent and the Grenadines today. We also had as part of the team Christopher Etienne and he's on board traveling down to Bekwe and as well as Simeon Kamabach who is also traveling down to Bekwe our roving cameramen. On our roving cameramen and they were on the streets they were responsible for the excellent shots we had earlier this morning from the House of Assembly and on the streets of Kingstown and uh, working behind the scenes we also had a uh, driver uh, uh, Brad Harris You'll remind me of the names as well as, as we go through. Um, I'm seeing a young man here. I'm not too sure of his name, so someone will slip his name to me. Um, Jennifer Richardson, the director of the API, is en route to Beckway. Donnie Collins of NBC is also en route to Beckway. Um, the mastermind and the mixes and the selection of shots, the editors, uh, Rohan, Zorro, Bennett, Morgan. Oh, we so love Zorro. Names. So many names, so many and, names. And, and it is fitting. Uh, Jeremy Duncan. Jeremy Duncan, thank you so much, Der Jeremy, for being here with us and for being a part of our team. We're happy to have you here with us. Uh, Antonio Anz Richards, as well, a part of the team and providing and making sure we have excellent uh, background. He's always thinking outside of the box and ensuring that the team is is well put together these two guys antonio richards and zoro morgan when i tell you they're the best believe you me they are among the best uh colvin richards colvin harry sorry <laughs> and, and and myself as we continue as we see christopher etienne uh, make uh, making his rounds and i'm sure hi chris Hi Chris, just give us a give us another shot if we know that you're listening yes, uh, and listening you're and you're hearing us happened. because we expect the sprinkling of petals as the boat travels down and we certainly look forward to that as well. They're just about getting ready to 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 leave and to make sure that all the all the vehicles on board are properly secured and fastened. Generally, it takes about an hour to get down to Beckway on ferry, but I've been on these ferries where they've taken shorter times. You remember that particular incident well, of which I, I am speaking I, it's, about? It's one of the reasons it's called, why <laughs> called um, I wasn't um, too keen on, on traversing the waters, especially this weekend, but I'll reserve the rest of the comments there. But I'm not too well with boats, by the way. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hide from saying that. That's, that's a given for those who know me. Um, so... It is best that I remain on solid <laughs> ground, at um, least for things to continue um, yes. in its true fashion over the next few days. Well, well, well you needed to be here for the continuity that's required mm. as part of the broadcast. We're, we're really not I'm taking a that. break. We're, definite, we're, we're more or less doing a transition from main, a seamless, what we anticipate would be a seamless transition from mainland St. Vincent to the Grenadines. And, and, I, and I believe... Oh, I, like I said, all of this is very symbolic. Uh, this is a well orchestrated plan by the former Prime Minister who we are uh, laying to rest today at a private cemetery at uh, Mount, Mount Pleasant, Pleasant in, in, in Beckway. And we uh, anticipate and we hope that the lights will allow us to have coverage of, of that part of it. Um, because we are we are a bit behind, and with the Our with the ladies. yes, and with the the nightfall nightfall comes in a little bit earlier now ah, uh, with the times, and we anticipate that we would we would be using we would definitely have to use the generators to to, to ensure that we be able to do that. The team from ITFX is is on they're, they're as we by see the 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 I, I believe these are the Beckway. The back wheel leg of the uh, what you call those again? The, the pins. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, the back wheel just, leg. Uh, brought one up close to our cameras here. Um, oh, okay. We did have a close-up view of one a while ago. 
beautifully done. And we notice our Brad Harris, our driver Brad Harris, is, is on board with the team and ensuring that they get around safely ah, and back another way. Close up. Thanks another very much, close Cameron. up. Another close up. Thank you so much. If we can just go in a bit more so that at least we can see what the words are. Thank ah, you. Excellent. 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 So I see, I recognize sunrise, May 15th, 1931, sunset, November 23rd, 2021, J.F. Mitchell. And there are two sunflowers on both Yes. Hands. Lovely. And lovely picture, a lovely picture of him there. Uh, he's smiling. And thank you so much. Cameraman, thank you. Simeon or Chris? Uh, I'm not sure which of them. That's it is Chris. Chris. Okay, yes, we're told Chris. it's Chris. That is there. So, uh, final few moments before the hatch goes up in the back of Beckway Express Five chartered ferry down to Beckway. Everyone is already seated. Those who wish to have a seat, they're already seated. And uh, in the distance, I can see a. Uh, Donnie, who's having a look at what's happening on the other side of who's the that? ferry. Donnie is in uh, at the distance there. And uh, I believe that's Chris we're seeing there as well. But we we his Father Ballantyne. Yes. He's one of the officiating ministers down to in Beckway, in addition to uh, the Venerable Christian Glasgow, Archdeacon of St. Lucia, who would be uh, the two officiating ministers at the service. So in terms of the rights of the church, we will have, we're expected to to, to have them, uh, the, um, the scripture reading, which will be taken from Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 3, the Apostles' Creed, uh, the intercession and the commendation and the service will end with a solo by Seanel Mackenzie, reigning Calypso Monarch in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and she's been reigning over the last two years, and like the fact that we're unable to have carnival as a result of COVID-19, she will be doing the song by Roberta Flack, the first time I ever saw your face. A lovely song, another oh. lovely song, beautiful hymn, beautiful music, I must add. Uh, all throughout today's proceedings no doubt a testimony of uh, the the life and the vivaciousness of uh, the of, of, of the Vincentian son of the soil who's been laid to rest today how well, many your thoughts yes and uh, speaking of rain in a different context and um, speaking of rain okay in a, in a different, as in a different meaning r-a-i-n this time oh there is rain no 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 oh. we, we, we were just happy that we haven't had that in terms oh. of an interruption that's, okay. that's what i was going to say okay. um the brilliant sunshine has been there since we started this morning even throughout the service a few sprinkles right in here we had brilliant sunshine yesterday on, as well too roof. if because our coverage started from yesterday yes yes yes, yes. so we, we've had um we've been blessed with the weather of course it's like with so many different areas a heavy shower can the entire program off by, by, by minutes or probably longer if it has to do with something that's out in the open um, so hopefully we wouldn't have that issue with rain and hope we're not um, as they say calling the rain now mm -hmm. as we say this we don't know what the weather is like in Beckway so maybe someone can so send we us hope a we're not message. doing the commentator's curse I, I hope not I think that applies to sports um, mm -hmm. and, and yes to sports and I, I do hope that that is not the case here um, but as we await the departure of the chartered ferry, we have live views on board uh, the vessel. And uh, as we're back into view now, we see the gates being closed at the back of the ferry and uh, preparations being made for the movement of the ferry down to Beckway. In the shot there, you see the hearse facing to mainland all the vehicles are facing land as they depart and it will be the first to come off it was the last to come on board it's reverse yes, order yes and uh, there'll be a, a welcome on the island of Beckway as son Mitchell comes home for the final time mm -hmm. and I think it's safe to say uh, we can we can refer to him from time to time outside of the formalities of son Mitchell as he, he, he did he always appreciated being referred to 
as that. We got the explanation as to yes, how yes. that name came about. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's a son. It's a son. <laughs> Interesting. So then son Mitchell was born. As, as, opposed to it's a, it's, as opposed to it's a boy. Yeah, it's a son. Yes. I, I want to go back to, to one of the tributes in song from this morning's uh, funeral service by uh, granddaughter Luna Cadet. And um, I, I, I know we were, you know, we were, we were here in shock because I, I thought she, she has a beautiful, beautiful voice, voice, beautiful yes. voice. And uh, they, in terms of the song, very popular. Uh, she did the French version of it uh, this morning. And uh, I, I, I think I, I've, I've, I've since rehearsed the words with, with all the available technology. technology. Um, oh, my sweet suffering, why do you hound me incessantly? I am just an unimportant person. Without it, I am a bit lost. I wander alone in the subway, a last dance to forget my immense sorrow. I want to run away for everything to begin again, all oh, my sweet suffering, as we see the final departure indeed. of the body of Sir James as he is moved to his home down yes. in the Beckway. So He's so going to home, land to literally Vincent. and figuratively. And as his motto remains, uh, the horse we are seeing now, facing to the mainland. Yeah. And where he once held office, and sat in the offices where just on shore at the financial complex. Well, well they, they tend to, they, the vehicles normally when they go on to the ferry for ease of uh, they, when, when departure, when they arrive in the Grenadines, uh, they order. generally reverse onto the board so they'll come off in drive position. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, we see the Vincentian flag as well as the uh, flag of the funeral home flying merrily in the gentle breeze or is it a gentle breeze well uh, it wasn't gentle earlier i'm not sure about now i haven't been outside since we started uh, this morning but i know it was windy and uh, breezy and windy uh, during the course of the last 12 or so hours especially over the, the, the last 12 hours and as i see the ferry picking up pace down yeah. to the beautiful I, waters uh, of the uh, channel. I uh, would it would it would it be ah, would it be appropriate? Go. Oh yes. Thank you very much, cameraman. Thanks, Simeon or Chris. Simeon, Simeon yes. excellent shot, Simeon. That's an excellent ah, shot. That's a huge ship. Oh, that's a huge ship in the ferry, in the cruise ship berth. That's a uh, that's the, the Aida. Aida. That's a German. That's a German vessel. Uh, that has been coming to St. Vincent for quite some while and the underground agent, uh, the, the Corres, uh, Corres are the ones who would generally uh, take care of the ship once it is in Port Kingstown. And uh, I suspect this is the Polar. There are several Ida ships in this. I'm, I'm not sure but I know it's the Ida. Regularly. And it's, 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 it's a regular feature here in St. Vincent uh, in terms of uh, the tourist season. And As we, uh, the seas look uh, okay ah. so far. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure. It looks a bit choppy, yeah, but um, so. that's for Donnie and Jennifer to tell us what that tran that ride on the ferry was when they commenced their leg. I yeah. see the Coast Guard vessel trailing in the distance. Yes. Is that the Humalzak? Not sure which one of the vessels there. I I, I reckon, and I would confer shortly. We can, we can confirm the vessel from the Coast Guard. That's that's there. It doesn't look like zero seven. Um, zero seven we'll, is a we'll, larger. We'll find vessel, out in a bit. But we'll find out. But continued coverage on the various platforms. Once again, we say welcome to you via the platforms of the Agency for Public Information, NBC Radio. VC3 television on the various pages, the Facebook pages, on YouTube, on VC3, uh, to the television channels uh, we have with us VC3 television, IKTV, SVG television, and UVTV, uh, taking our broadcasts all around the globe via cable and satellite systems. We say thanks to you as well for 
joining us and being a part, being a part of the coverage as we move further away from the island of St. Vincent, majestic mountains in the distance, Mount St. Andrew. And it's always, uh, it's, it's ah, always, always a, a very breathtaking to look back once you're on the ferry and you look back at uh, the mountain peaks and see the greenery mm. that is synonymous with St. Vincent and the Grenadines and, 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 and Dominica, for instance, the Commonwealth of Dominica, the nature isle of the Caribbean, uh, land of the blessed. Uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines as we see the Coast Guard vessel pretty shortly I should be getting the name of the vessel as we have members of the comms team who is also uh, on board the Coast Guard and on uh, the Beckway Express who will provide uh, key information for us when we inquire about that I believe that's another vessel that is making its way yes. now into Port Kingstown and yes. we would have the departure of that uh, very shortly. Um, I think they're moving at a, a, a decent pace though, yes. uh, because of the time that we have as well. We yes. don't have a lot of it uh, for the Beckway leg of the send off, which uh, also has a number of, of tributes, including uh, by the Honorable Mayor Motley, Prime mm -hmm. Minister of That's Barbados. That's a feature tribute. A feature tribute. Additionally, there are several other tributes. I suspect there may be some, some adjustments in the program and that way just Yes, to, to see if there could be some facilitation of probably yes, those who didn't yes. get to do uh, a tribute on, 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 um, on mainland. And we also know that uh, following that, the burial will be on the private family cemetery, at the private family cemetery at Mount Pleasant. Uh, that should take some time as well as you know mm -hmm. you have to they have the formalities associated with a state funeral where the police is, 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 is concerned and uh, uh, as we as we recognize uh, uh, someone's just probably alerting brad that he was in the shot so brad is, uh, is getting out of the way um yeah yes and and uh we, we have an excellent shot still on several uh, oh, yes. couple <laughs> views still on board of the um connection ensuring that you have a lovely view of the King Garden Point is it yeah, yes King Garden yes. Point as we sail and, and that's that's away. where I started messaging you the last time ah yeah <laughs> so let's see how far we can go in uh, uh, is it, uh, as did we, we did we uh, did, what time did they leave just about two o'clock or just I, about just five past two, two. okay two i understand it's a captain hugh mulzak it is, uh, okay. that is going that is making the trek down um i just got that information from someone on board uh, the coast guard vessel svg 01 yes oh one yes. svg yes, 01. 01 the captain mulzak uh vessel and uh, other photographers using the opportunity to get some of the photos in land as they travel down. I, I could only imagine the breeze and, yeah. and, 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 and smelling the fresh uh, the sea smelling salt, the sea salt <laughs> as, 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 you, as, as you travel down. Uh, going to Beckways is, 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 is one of the most exciting experiences you can ever have in any given day, whatever time of year that you decide. Uh, to make the trip across on, on to, to one of our Grenadine Islands, whether it's Beckway or any of the other one, but because the focus primarily today is on Beckway, you would note the significance of the island of clouds yes. as we share this information with you. Well, uh, it's, it's easier to say when you encounter difficulties with seasickness. So, mm -hmm. um, whenever the, the seas are very calm, that's a very, very good experience, I would add. Um, but if it's not, uh, it might be a bit of a, a, an issue for some. And the that swells as you encounter the Beckway Channel in particular. Uh, our camera guys are doing quite well in stabilizing their, their shots, despite the, the movements of the boat as well. So we have some very uh, stable shots coming to us here at uh, Master Control at the Kingston Methodist Church. Now you see the back of the boat is now up. When we left, what it was being pulled up yes and it's now completely up i do notice that a barrier was installed as well at the back of the the boat so that uh, for safety reasons on this particular boat the express 5 and uh, it's now smooth sailing 
Yes. On the Tobacco. Mm -hmm. Coverage, continued coverage, extended, extensive coverage of the state funeral of the late uh, Sir James Fitzalan Mitchell, the second Prime Minister of St. Vincent Town, the Grenadines, born on the 15th of May 1931, died on Tuesday, November 23rd, 2000. And 21. The first of two services uh, today at the Methodist Church in Kingstown, according to Anglican rites, and we're now awaiting the transition to the Grenadine of Island of Beckway, home figuratively and liter literally, and uh, we will uh, bring you the funeral service uh, at the St. Mary's Anglican Church and also the the procession to the Alvin Tree where two songs his favorite song uh, don't cry for me Argentine and his favorite hymn oh god our help in ages past would be played by the members of the Royal St Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force Band and they have been led uh, this time by Inspector Vaughn Miller Inspector Vaughn Miller is uh, leading uh, the, the band. Around Christmas time, it is common for the police band to travel to uh, communities, as we've witnessed the members of our team there, to travel to communities to bring Christmas chair. Yes. I'm not too sure how much of that they'll be able to do, given the nature of things as it relates to uh, the pandemic. And we haven't heard much of that. And... Uh, but uh, they're on route now to Bekwe for the final part of today's uh, funeral service, the service of Thanksgiving, as we recognize the senior, the chief protocol officer, uh, Mozart Carr, yes. and with whom we have worked very closely over the last uh, several days in terms of putting all of this, uh, all of this uh, that we are witnessing here together. I gather that the Honorable Prime Minister, Minister Frederick Stevenson and the Honorable Salute Caesar are on board on the Captain Hugh Malzac SVG-01. I will get some more information in terms of the other uh, dignitaries and officials. The members of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force Band are also on board of uh, the Hugh Malzac and I believe the members who will be falling in in terms of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force Band who will be falling in in Buckway, they will be on board as well. So we continue to bring uh, you coverage as we recognize our other media colleagues on board. I just recognize uh, Kenton Chance, uh, the COP as well, Commissioner uh, Colin John and other senior officers are also on board the Coast Guard as they make their way down to the Grenadines. Oh, thank you so much for joining us and for being a part of our extended coverage as we bring this uh, to you from the Methodist Church in Kingstown. Uh, the technology is now certainly available, uh, even though we're coming to the table a little bit late in terms of making use of the available technology but one day you must make a start and so today we have uh, added to our broadcast team additional suite of equipment which we are using to allow us to do this to be at the methodist church in kingstown and to be making commentary on the on the ferry yeah. as it's heading to into to the Beckway. Beckway channel yes and, and that's that's a, a communication that zone there yes uh, so so I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised that we're able to have full visuals as we head into the Beckwith channel and maybe it's an indication that there's been some upgrades by our mobile providers uh, and on maintaining that connection as you traverse the Grenadines uh, waters. I, I, I think a, we, did a make a re we, did, we did make a request. Uh, mm. For some for for some additional uh, bandwidth, I think. Or, or what 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 should we say? How how should we? Well, I think they were aware mm. of of the plans. Yes, uh, we. To <laughs> <laughs> I think they're testing some microphones um, <laughs> downstairs. Uh, see, uh, Danny Collins is um, making sure that he has proper footing as he moves around on board as well. If I were him, I remain in <laughs> I place. Remain I'll seated. sit still. But look at that! As the sun <laughs> shines on the pristine waters of the Grenadines. Oh my! Isn't Beckway that beautiful? Water. Oh, look at that! 
and the clouds are there now you see the clouds we didn't have that many of them earlier on we had mostly blue skies skies when we started this morning on the streets but now uh, the sun is out in all its glory as mm -hmm. you would say for the send off of sun measure <laughs> and uh, huh, pleasant conditions uh, it doesn't look too bad out there on the seas as you see um, back way in the distance it's back way in the distance yes yes, yes. Visibility an outline of back way yes of the, the haze and yes but i assume that once we get a little bit closer uh, so we have some uh, i see we're getting a little bit of encouragement um in terms of our broadcast and we thank you so Thanks much for much. your kind uh comments uh I recognize and and even those who, who have not been so kind we recognize you but it's just that our producer has just shared some with me um, I, I note that uh, comment about time the median SVG has gotten it together and I assume that we have gotten it together today because that's been uh, that's thank you so much we do try I recognize as well Nicola Williams thank you Dion and team of course this is a team effort VC3 NBC radio the agency for public information and of course course we have received the full support of the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines from the highest office that is the office of the Prime Minister who is the Minister of Information. Uh, Roslyn Aki, great job NBC VC3 API we thank you so much so much for your comment and uh, for as long as we're able to we'll continue we'll continue with the coverage. Uh, Ralph Stowe thank you so much uh, we Hope we will continue to provide those who are listening and viewing with the excellent coverage. Agnes Sampson says, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Wherever I see NBC, I'll say NBC, API, and VC3 because it is a joint production. Correct. Annette Boyne says, great job, great coverage. Thank you so much, Annette. Annette, you're cl my classmate, Annette Boyne. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, hmm, I see a comment here which I will not read because I, I don't particularly like to read comments about myself. So All right, they're, they're moving up, moving up quite quickly now. Uh, thank you very much, NBC. Another one says yes, it's it's a team effort. Uh, we're thankful for the visuals provided by the very competent staff at uh, VC3 Television and API. It's a joint effort of. All of us to make sure that we have the best possible coverage. Cheryl Ann, I see you. Uh, good to see you on the live stream this afternoon. And uh, she says, exceptional commentary. Thanks very much. We appreciate your feedback. Uh, great job. I, I think you read that one already. They're popping up sometimes so quickly. I can't keep track of them. Uh, viewing from Paramaribo, that's Suriname. Yes, ah. Suriname. And yes, uh, Suriname, Suriname is, a, is a. Yeah. So, Serena. you are viewing and listening. Of course, we have NBC Radio. We can't forget uh, our listeners by way of radio on 107.5 and 90.7, taking this feed live, uh, single broadcast spread across all the platforms, uh, both the visual and the audio portions uh, being captured here this afternoon. As we send off in the best possible way, Son Mitchell, okay. son of the soil, um, and uh, uh, even as we're here, uh, the the church has been emptied of all its occupants, but we are still seeing the the views on the big screen, and I suspect outside the big screens are still carrying our feeder yes. for those who want to stop by along the way in the Kingstown Methodist Church area and have a view of uh, what is happening. We, we recently had an opportunity to work with organizations in the U.S. Uh, who are intimately involved in ensuring that uh, they provide uh, support to St. Vincent Carry On SVG. And Sherilyn Haywood says uh, that she's always, uh, that, <laughs> that, she, that we are doing an exceptional job. Sorry. Thank you, NBC, VC3 and API. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. I do appreciate the comment, Heavy T. Bumper Petra. I, I, I do thank you so much and I will continue to do so as long as God continues to, God allows me to have this gift. Uh, good coverage uh, by the voices heard on live stream. Thank you so much, Vincy Powell. We do appreciate your comment. Uh, let's continue to support the work that we are trying to do here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, good coverage to the team. Congratulations, uh, Clyde Moffat. 
Uh, let's see what else. So we've got a uh, Branson Maskell who is looking on in the in the UK. Let's uh, let's uh, let's continue here. Um, uh, lots of the coverage is going to get away from us. Viewing from Cayman Islands. Cayman Thank Islands. You. Good afternoon. Hi to you, Dion. Cayman Islands. Hi Colvin. Wonderful broadcasting for Sir James. Uh, thank you. We are watching from Myro from the BVI, uh, Texas. Uh, where else are we? We have comments uh, coming there from uh, from Beckway. Folks in Beckway who are listening. Uh, again, the UK, Earl Bennett, that's Cabo, says that we've made him very proud. Uh, thank you so much. You really don't want to make us cry. Nah. Uh, you know, um, yeah, I think I, you've I done think some I've of that already. Yes, I, I, I'm just always letting out crying. a bit of a. a um, Ron the Penny there. James says, wonderful work, Dion and the team watching from the onset in St. Lucia. Thank you very much, uh, Ron the Penny James. I appreciate your comments and always happy to have your support. Brooklyn is here with us uh, watching uh, the Bronx is also here with us as we we from time to time we will uh, segue and bring you your comments uh, thank you so much for the live broadcast NBC radio VC3 API great commentary I'm proud of St. Vincent town the Grenadines uh, sad day but yet I am proud with the coverage from St. Vincent that was a very uh, another of the comments that we're seeing there uh, we're not meeting much in terms of what is happening is that uh, the ferry is on route to I believe Beckway. it's in the Becca channel and, around this uh, time. And, and, and we are praying for, for the safe arrival and for them to get down safely. Uh, Trinidad is in the house and they're looking on. Uh, Simone Davis is watching from Philadelphia. Uh, Renetha Otley from New York, awesome job team, New Jersey and Puerto Rico, the Netherlands, uh, you name it, uh, we have uh, a wide cross-section of people who have been impacted in one way or the other by the life of the former Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and we're happy to have you as part of our coverage. Dublin, Ireland is also here with us, you know, every time I try to hand back the phone to produce so there's another <laughs> message that comes up on the screen. Uh, British Columbia, Canada, and we note that Sir James actually studied in British Columbia, Canada yes, University yes. there, and we so we are happy to have you. We're so happy to have you with with us. Vincentians at home and abroad, we're pleased to bring this coverage to you as much as you are receptive of our coverage, and we thank you and we encourage your constant feedback. Uh, there's ongoing uh, support and comments from Manhattan. And we're happy that that you're here with us. Yes. Uh, USA is watching. Uh, someone says I'm, I'm watching from cyberspace. Yes. And we we're, we're still looking at live video for those who are thinking about what they're looking at. This is yes. actually still live video yes, from the Beckway Channel, yes. uh, which is which is breaking new Ground. grounds for us. Uh, not just at, at API, NBC, VC3, but it's generally a, a communication blackout as we head into. Uh, the the uh, Becky channel. I hope I'm not jinxing it no, now. No, so, so then not, we, no. we probably need to concentrate on. We we need to therefore concentrate on 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 some 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 some, some as to make sure that we don't as 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 the uh, the 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 pictures as well. We we've seen several pictures of Sir James uh, with uh, uh, Prime Minister Compton, former Prime Minister Compton, who's now deceased. Uh, the Iron Woman of the Caribbean, then uh, Eugenia Charles of uh, Dominica, and I think the only one who is basically remaining from the Windward Islands grouping would be uh, the Right Honourable Keith Mitchell. Yes. And he was here with us this morning, and he he he. And there's a photo on screen he, he, of him. He of course him. Uh, paid tribute to his friend. He did say that he will miss his friend, and it is in whom his friend he would call to find out the mood in Petit March, Nick and Karakou whenever there was an election in Grenada and he, he jokingly said this morning, who am I going to call now? <laughs> but I'm sure someone else will step up to the plate to for, for the Honourable Prime Minister See, to, to, to call Sir James and sitting on. in the front there? Sorry? The bro is it the brother of Sir James? Yes, I, 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 I believe I am... I, 
I hope we got that right. Yes, but it's it's the brother from what we were able to 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 gather from from yesterday's uh, yesterday's uh, uh, laying in state of the body of Sir James. It doesn't look like things are too bad on board the ferry at all. Persons are mingling and and seem to be speaking and chatting with each other and basically I believe bracing for the next part of the okay, about 30 service. minutes into the journey about yes now? about about 30 minutes it's just about 30 so minutes they should be so I anticipate in another now. 15 minutes or so they'll be in Beckway because I've, I've had a 45 minute trek with the boat with, with lots of uh, uh, vehicles a lot depends on, on, the, on, on the weather um, <laughs> I, I, believe that, I believe the, uh, that we would we, the, uh, we would be able to, 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 to bring you to bring you that. Uh, just bear with us if you hear a bit of a background noise. I believe the church, the church is doing um, some some other testing and we're trying to get them to to understand that we are still live and carrying on the broadcast as we're upstairs so they won't yeah, they, they won't, won't know won't unless us. you know that that we're upstairs unless someone tells them that we're upstairs yes yeah, so as we continue so, with our coverage uh here uh, live uh with live shots of you could see back there now that's there you go there's a close-up shot of yes of back way there so if uh, you can give us uh guys uh oh the, the uh, sea is beginning to look a little a bit little choppy, choppy now, so that yeah so it's, yes. it's getting a bit <laughs> Uh, I think we, I think we lost, lost. Okay, it. so we're gonna try and see. We know we haven't lost oh, it. We we're haven't. just, okay. uh, we're just trying to stabilize get Chris to stabilize his shot for a bit. Um, so Chris, uh, just, just try to stabilize that shot so that we would be able to show it properly, and we continue uh, our professional coverage that is, uh, that we started okay. from, There's from the this morning. As yes, as yeah. Beckwe looms in the distance. And uh, I believe oh. if we're, we're this far, that pretty shortly uh, we'll be getting an even closer look of Beckway while we're yes. live. Um, and then on, on the other side of your screen, some photographic moments yes. of Sir James while he was Prime Minister and Foreign Affairs Minister, some of his travels, meeting other regional leaders. And uh, uh, we see Sir John Compton. I, I recognize the late uh, uh, Gloria, Gloria Ballantyne, Ballantyne MBE as face. well from Netball. And I, I think I recognize in the previous picture the former wife, the, the wife of the former Governor General, Sir Charles Antrobus, yes. Lady Antrobus. Lady Antrobus. Yes. And uh, some, I see a, a photo there of the current Minister of Agriculture, Sir James. Uh, uh, Leader of the opposition, and uh, another photo of a family gathering. I know yeah. Sir James spent a lot of his post-retirement years spending time with his family, especially his, his daughters, his four daughters. He had all girls, but he was son Mitchell, that's what for sure. And uh, his grandchildren as well, uh, all uh, really feeling that loss today. Uh, it's indeed a, a loss that takes some time to to get past. We know that at some point in time we have to leave this earth behind, but no one is prepared for a, a departure, and and so today we are. Death is is, on the is train never line. death is 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 it's it's so final. It's never easy. You never get accustomed to it. Um, there are so many emotions that are involved and uh, everybody uh, moans and grieves differently. There is no set time in which you, you get over the death and depending on the relationship you've had with the person who's deceased, then, then it varies. Yes, and uh, it is not something ah, you that, you, that, you can, that you can say that happens within a specific period. Um, so it, it's, just, it's just never, never, never real. It's, it's always difficult. Yes. Uh, look at that. We have some huge waves oh, there. Beautiful shots, <laughs> some, some waves that they've got to... Yes, it's expected, I think uh, the yes. Met Office did indicate that sea's about Whoa. three meters. Um, that's the Beckway Channel for Whoa. you. <laughs> and, and just looking at it makes you a bit, a bit, uh, a bit woozy, but um, it feels as though you're actually on the boat. The shot that we're getting there now. Um, but we continue to encourage you to stay with us uh, as we prepare for our 
a transition to our Bekwe team. Um, oh. ITFX is on the ground in Bekwe handling that end of the coverage uh, with their uh, team of cameramen and our commentary team, Jennifer Richardson and uh, Donnie Collins. And they're expected to chime in later on as we arrive in Bekwe and take it from there. Uh, I think you've heard quite a lot out of us since we started just after 8 o'clock this morning. Well, I, I think you always have to put into context that we started this journey from yesterday. Uh, yeah, we did. Yes. We started you, yesterday, You seem actually. to be forgetting yeah, the much important... counting from this morning, but yes. yes. We did start the journey yesterday with some rest, and in, in between we had some planning, some back and forth with our technical team. We uh, had our setup last uh, night yes. for this. And the and testing, and the team was here last morning. night into the night. So there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Yes. You wouldn't, you would see us here and you would hear us, but our guys are always thinking of ways to, to make the broadcast as, as smooth and as uh, professional as possible. And we really appreciate the skill sets that we have, especially in this time where our country demands of us to deliver the best possible coverage for our nation builder, statesman, former prime minister, foreign minister, so many caps businessman and a family man we can't forget that part and we've heard quite a lot about his family life and the fact that um, he, was, he was very close to his daughters and his grandchildren and we also have a YouTube uh, comment section we're missing those as well. yes um, so we see comments here uh, Agnes Beth says SVG did a wonderful job uh, Dominica, Dominican Republic, sorry, is uh, is viewing. Uh, Union Island is on. Uh, greetings from Canada. Great, great broadcasting, guys, and rest in peace. Uh, Sir James, watching from Queens, New York. Thanks for the excellent coverage. Uh, Martha Jarvis says, watching from Dominica. United Sullivan is watching from London, and these are comments that we've received via YouTube. Uh, Karna Charles says the best Prime Minister ever lived and uh, Lucy Alf says she's watching from New York with the people from Beckley will miss you and Alves is a surname that you associate uh, somewhat with the Grenadines and uh, um, uh, thank you St. Vincent and the Grenadines and VC3 and the other members of the team for making this possible we're watching from from the US as we see things just getting a little bit uh, choppy on uh, the as expected on the board some persons are now scurrying to uh, you can uh, see to, the movements to sit. Yeah, yeah that yeah so we we recognize part some some part of that um pretty windy indeed it is windy as we see that comment uh, Kanawan is watching we're happy that you have joined us Kanawan and you're a part of our broadcast now, uh, wishing uh, the children and other family members of Sir James uh, all the best. May your soul rest in peace, Sir James. Uh, the sea is very choppy, however, the good Lord will get them there safely, and we do yes. agree that that will happen. Uh, someone is actually quoting the words of the anthem, St. Vincent, land is so beautiful, with joyful hearts we pledge to thee. Indeed, we have a beautiful country. Oh, as as we see continue to see the the uh, the layout of Beckway coming into focus and I, I certainly look forward to when the boat I uh, uh, when the boat rests in Beckway the shots and the scenery ah, that you'll oh, see. Look at that. Uh, so we, we're expecting all of that. Queens New York is here with us and is looking along. Lovely view, proud of my country. Thank you so much for the broadcast. We appreciate you and thank you so much for joining us. Those are some of the comments that are on YouTube. And we did utilize every available platform uh, this morning to make sure that we are able to reach you wherever you are in terms of our coverage. And as we get closer and closer to Beckway, the island of clouds, uh, that's the meaning from the ancient Arawak times and Bekwe, just to let you know, Bekwe is the largest island in the Grenadines at seven square miles. Uh, Bekwe is part of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and is approximately 15 kilometers, is a part of St. Vincent, sorry, and is 15 kilometers away Nine from miles. the capital, um, the, the, the capital St. Vincent. 
and uh, we we're we're happy to share our home with you we're happy to to, to share a part of this island paradise with you known for its beaches uh, whaling uh, boating and everything like that scuba diving snorkeling kayaking uh, you think about it of course the turtles in Bekwe by uh, the turtle sanctuary uh, every now and again there is a whale that is got that is part of our culture here yes um, as well uh, the the boating uh, the sailing the Easter regatta and we haven't had much of the Easter regatta because of COVID but this is uh, this the Easter regatta would bring hundreds of boats to Bekwe every Easter that is something that is looked forward to. Another um, uh, All Year's Night into New Year's is always looked forward to as well in, 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 in the Grenadine Island of Bekwe and in, uh, in particular all the other Grenadines Islands for that matter. And uh, we, we're making sure that uh, the occasion, though solemn, that we use the opportunity to bring to bring this to you yes. i'm i'm particularly pleased and, and breaking new ground in the process of, 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 of doing that and and that we're able to share this moment with you so that uh, you're not alone you get to see uh, you get to see all of this and this is a journey that uh, the gentleman uh, sir james Fitzalan mitchell our second prime minister who is uh, whose whose body has been transported to beckway on this uh, motor vessel that uh, he has taken on several countless, uh, sev countless uh, oh, times up and down spanning uh, the from the 1960s uh, and no official capacity right yes now. Yeah. and 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 this is something that you can't not can't not notice or pay attention to as beth uh, is becoming even shot. more larger yeah. in the background yes and, and closer uh, and closer we get closer and, and people are just finding spaces to ride on the ferry that they're most comfortable. Uh, not some, some, of, some persons can't afford to go inside in the AC because, uh, you know, some persons can't ride in there. Some persons prefer the open space. Some persons prefer to stay downstairs. Doing whatever you have to do to make this short trek across and over to Beckway as smooth and comfortable as possible. And as the Beckway Express 5 rides the waves through the Beckway Channel into uh, the awaiting flotilla at the wharf in Beckway. We expect the ceremonial aspect to begin right away as we head into the port in Beckway. Under the almond tree, we look forward to that as well. Uh, that should be rather interesting to see the performance there of Sir James, I say Sir James's favorite songs, as captured earlier. And we have some more comments, I believe, coming in. Our, our, our producer is bringing some more, uh, some more uh, comments to us. Uh, Michael Johnson says, "I'm proud of NBC and the rest of the guys on a wonderful job." Beulah Douglas says she's watching from New York. Wonderful view. Thanks for the broadcast. Rest in peace, sir. Uh, Marva. William says, Mr. Compton, I totally agree with you. I say it is the Library of Shakespeare. Condolences to the family of Sir James and the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Lovely and excellent coverage. Greg Dublin, who is watching from New York, uh, is from the USA, says very professional coverage. Myro has joined us and is a part of our broadcast. Very happy to have you with us. And now uh, we did hear of uh, yes. the former Prime Minister's rendezvous in uh, Beckway. Uh, Noreen Williams uh, says people were very much uh, prideful okay, during this man's era. Uh, Dexter Rose, a name that we're very familiar with. Great commentary, guys. Great coverage overall with lovely camera work. I wish to concur with the yes. sentiments indeed. Yes, Former yes, Ambassador yes. Rose, I'm, I'm happy uh, to have received your comments. I do agree that the team, especially the team on board the vessel, they do deserve uh, uh, to be commended. It's not easy. It's not an easy task it's to hold that. It's not an easy task maneuvering and stabilizing device uh, that device in period. light of the choppy seas, which are which 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 are being encountered in particular at this time. But uh, they they're holding their own. 
I must add they're holding their own and that's not a bad thing at all uh, so we're just a few minutes I think uh, from yes. Uh, from from getting into uh, Beckway, just we can a see few a minutes. View. Lovely Beckway, yes. the largest of the Grenadine Islands, and Nine we miles from look. We, we we're looking forward. We're definitely looking forward to the proceedings on the ground. It is expected that uh, our media team will be among the first to get off as well. That's that's one of the plans that we've had in terms of the recce leading into this broadcast so we expect that they will be able to facilitate a, a quick transition because we don't want to miss any of the proceedings that takes place on the wharf and and that is critical to to this afternoon's coverage for in terms of the transition that is being made uh colvin and dion we hmm, if if i had seen this before i had started to read it i wouldn't have read it ah. colvin and dion we tip our hats off to you congrats well coverage georgetown is here with us congratulations to the entire team thank you so much for your support and thanks for viewing and thank you for listening just as well uh, just the final moments into back when i can't help but get emotional i i, I mean look at that it's, view it's very emotional emotional time and it's smooth sailing now into Beckway, as you see a slight altering of the course, the line yes. up with what is waiting. Something about waiting, it has gotten say. just very Beckway. calm. It's, it's more calm yes. now. Yes, yes. I think we've gone through the Beckway channel already. Yes, we've gone through the works. So it's now smooth sailing into the bay and uh, onward to the next portion of the final send-off for Sir James where he's on home soil a place he called home all his life he was born in Beckway spent most of his professional life uh, based in in St. Vincent on mainland where the government uh, offices are but constantly in between the Grenadines of course he represented the entire Grenadines in Parliament as a parliamentarian and that time it wasn't Southern and Northern Grenadines, it was just the Grenadines. Yes. Um, and he did represent them from 1966 yes. to the year 2000. Yeah. With zero breaks in between. Mm. We must highlight that. So from 1966 yes. all the way to the year 2000, he was re-elected on all occasions to serve yeah. as a representative for the Grenadines. I, I see a comment here from Moulton Mares which says, Excellent broadcasting. I'm watching from Sheffield in the UK as of incension. My condolences and prayers to the entire family and all that, all that mourn and pay that their respect for Sir James Mitchell. Rest in peace, Sir James. Sir James Mitchell, absolutely, they, uh, they absolutely one of the best prime ministers. Uh, peace and love to you from Queens, New York. Um, the message for, that I'm receiving now from the Hugh Malzac SVG01, they're actually docking now in Beckway. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's the message that I am receiving from, from on board the Captain Hugh Malzac. Thank you so much for providing that information to my... Uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> well, to it's my a smaller vessel and, and <laughs> yes. it moves a bit faster than yes. the ferry. Uh, they, they, I'm just getting word that they took just about 40 minutes to sail 40? across the Beckway ah. on the Captain Hugh Malza. So we have another two minutes, uh, ten yes. minutes or so, I assume, yes. on this Yes, ferry? yes, yeah. yes. Um, I, I believe that they should be uh, getting there pretty shortly as well, those on the MV Beckway Express. Yeah. We started mm -hmm. the journey, was it about three minutes before two? Um, I'm not sure. I think I captured around that time that the boat left. And it's 2.42. Mm -hmm. which means that uh, we're close to the 50 minute general mark on the very good well you say see a much closer view of yes a tip of the island of beckway and we'll go around the bend soon into the sheltered area where we'll be uh, continuing with the coverage of course that area is not visible from the mainland because it has a, a bit of a sheltered uh, rock edifice as you head into to beckway and as you alter your course you see the sprawling area, Lower Bay, Port Elizabeth, and all of these wonderful views as you move into Beckway. 
Okay, so the general mood on the uh, the the the, the Coast Guard, the water is a bit choppy, but the ah. mood is good. So that's a report out uh, from the the SVG Coast Guard. Thank you yes. so much. I, I appreciate <laughs> your comments. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we see messages here from a former PS saying, um, "Great job, ah. uh, excellent, excellent coverage." And we recognize and thank you so much. What a view. Uh, messages from uh, St. Lucia across the region. Uh, thank you so much, Miss Llewellyn, for your message. I, I do appreciate that and I thank you for your support always. So I think we can safely say that our coverage will continue straight into the port of Peku. Uh, there's a very silent handover with the connectivity there uh, between uh, St. Vincent and Beckway. Uh, which uh, fortunately didn't interrupt the flow of our high quality stream coming up uh, from the Beckway Channel into Beckway. And some lovely views being captured now by our videographers as we sail into the island of clouds. We didn't see that many clouds when we started, no, but now not we're at seeing all. more clouds. Yes. So we're definitely arriving at the island of clouds. And uh, this particular part of Beckway is not really as populated as the other side. You notice the greenery. So you notice the greenery. Yes, yeah. you notice the greenery. You so recognize that from the As you the turn onset. the bend, you'd realize that you are yes. very close to port. Yes, basically, once, you, once, once, once it, it gets around the bend, uh, you, you will be, it, it would be safe to say that you have arrived safely in Beckway. I think for me, this is the best part of the journey. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's when you've for come me, out of the Beckway Channel the, and you're that just is the best. Into yes, there, there is a, a sense of calm and peace <laughs> that you get at that particular time. And that's when you start calling the taxis to say, well, I'm, I'm just a few minutes away. Can you please come around to collect me? <laughs> you know, um, or you but start in, in your way downstairs. Yes. Yeah, so or if you're upstairs, if you're providing that you don't have too large, too many large bags, uh, depending on your stay as well. Uh, Colvin and Dion, good coverage. Hats off to you both. Uh, John Road says that we're doing a great job. Thank you so much, Myra, and thanks for being a part of us part of our broadcast someone says SVG is the greatest country in the world that I will agree where else can you get this great coverage great job guys Mesa James rest in peace thank you so much so guys you see the comments you're hearing the comments it meant it means that we have started something a little bit different today so it means that we have to we have to keep this will. up and ensure that this is our standard from henceforth Okay, the members of the team are looking at me with <laughs> with, with an expression that I won't attempt yes. to describe. I think... Uh, There's a song that describes it. What Hungry was, Eyes. Hungry Eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that's the song that will amply describe it. So it says Colvin <laughs> Harry. But yes, so it's, it's called it's always, uh, <laughs> So James loved humor, by the way. So yes, um, and, and you, yes. We're, we're yes. making a lighter moment now because yes. we know that... Uh, I'd have been physically part of whatever was happening and he would take the opportunity to, to throw a little joke across. Yeah. Uh, something to make you smile. Mm -hmm. um, so it's as much as we, it's a sad day, we, we, we want to remember him in light of his humorous side. Someone um, is asking, why are they hearing an ambulance song in the background? Oh. Uh, let me, <laughs> let me try <laughs> to explain that. We are actually, the broadcast is still emanating from mainland. In fact, we are, we are in Kingstown the Methodist uh, Kingstown Methodist Church, nicely okay. positioned in the Which choir loft. Us, we'll see. But the uh. video that you are seeing is on board the... The video is on is on board the ah, the vessel. <laughs> so yes, just so to show you, we're Methodist still Church at the still. Kingstown Methodist Church. So this is the original background we started with shortly after eight this morning, and the video that you're seeing is video aboard the MV Beckway Express Five. So that's why you are hearing the sounds and the sirens in the background. And you're not and, hearing the ocean. Uh, and you're not necessarily hearing the ocean. I, I think once <laughs> we transition to our team in Beckway, you will you will that. hear yes. the you will hear the ocean. And uh, that's that's what technology has availed us ah, that, this that's afternoon. A view. Oh look at that. That's Classic a view we've been anticipating. Waters. 
lovely Isle of the Caribbean, beautiful St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I couldn't have said it better myself. I feel so proud today. Yes, this is a moment oh, and, in history to remember. And look at the remember. ships. They're you, lined you're up. seeing them? They're lined the up. The yachts are all lined there, waiting for the ferry to come closer and for the ceremonial welcome of the son of the soil, son Mitchell. Yes. yes. And, and, I, and, and that is the part, I think, of this that I'm looking forward to more. Shermel and Kirby, uh, Shermel and Kirby media, well-known media person, uh, now at the uh, ECCB, ECCB and St. Kitts. Kitts. Thank yes. you so much, Shermel Watching from St. Kitts and Nevis, happy to be able to be part of this historic event. Great work, Dion and team. Well, it's a, a group effort, and we <laughs> thank you so much just the faces, uh, for your comments. We're just the faces in front of the microphones the guys behind the scenes are the ones who are making this happen and we're so thankful for them and for their assistance today uh, we continue to receive uh, the messages great work uh, as the ship moves closer inland inland yes, in the distance we can see all the smooth sailing yachts and other small vessels preparing to welcome Sir James home yes for the final time and, and 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 i and i know i know that everybody in beckway who is able to who is who is physically able to will be will be if if they're not on the wharf they will be lining the streets to welcome their son of the soil i i know they will be lining the streets i know that they they're excited they can't wait to have him back he's finally coming home to us these are some of the comments that I am that that I'm that, that we're seeing here as we continue to bring this fine the final leg of this broadcast to you we anticipate that at this time that our team is is making their way down stay yes. so that they would be able to so to come off yes front once, and center. yeah once they're they're able to come off so we anticipate that that is happening someone says they're watching from Atlanta Georgia great broadcast uh, thank you so much Patricia uh, Lavinia Bino, I am proud Vincentian watching from New York. We have lost an excellent role model, impeccable Prime Minister Sir James Mitchell, so says Randolph Lynch, as we continue to bring you coverage of uh, this broadcast. I, I see Colvin is, is, is getting a little bit... Um, I, I don't no, know I, the word. Just, no, um, you're okay, Colvin? I, I'm, I'm looking for some visuals now um, from the team on the other side. Hopefully we'll see some of those. Oh, well, um, I, I assume team, too shortly. that they're tr probably trying to... Sorry? Oh, they're still relaying our feed, right. Yeah, so we're, we're we not... No, the switch, this, this switch doesn't take place on sea. No, it will ha happen right. on land, right. <laughs> Just making sure that they're ready for us. No, no, no. I, I, I assume there would be. The switch doesn't take place on sea, Colvin. Best so. boat builders and skilled seamen can be found on the beautiful island of Beckway. I wish to concur. We're approaching Excellent Port job. Elizabeth team of API VC3 and NBC Radio. Thank you so much. So James Mitchell did an excellent job for our nation. May God continue to strengthen his family at this time in grief. I'm proud of your excellent coverage watching from New Jersey. So says Dine Phillips. And thank you so much for your comments. Beckway Look is now looming largely and the sun on the, the hills sun. Ah. Beckway is green yes it is green we've had quite a lot of rain over the last couple of days and this can be attributed yes. uh, to this and the recent eruptions have offered some ash that has gone on to add to the greenery um, not just on the mainland but in the Grenadines as well uh, we've had very frequent rains in the last month or so. And I yes. Think that is one of the main factors in yes. the green welcome that you're now having at Port Elizabeth. Yes. Uh, hats off to the team at VC3, API and NBC Radio. This is a great production. Brooklyn is tuned in. Oh, look, 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 look at, at look at the, look at the ships. They are look at the boats as they, as they line up as they line up to receive their son of the soil. And I'm sure this is an emotional moment for yes, it would the be. people of Beckway, not just the family that we, we had with us earlier on here at Kingstown Methodist Church, but 
those who knew him well beyond the realms of politics, personally as a, as a friend, and as maybe as an employer, because uh, his business in Beckway uh, employed uh, quite a number of, of individuals, and uh, being part of the hotel industry, uh, he certainly added to the economic side and well-being of, of the people of Beckway, providing employment opportunities as a businessman. Yes, the uh, the. So as we get an excellent view now of the welcome area, uh, as we dock into Port Elizabeth, we see the beautifully painted houses yes. on the left of the screen. Yes. I hope we're not looking at a mirrored image, yes. but yes. Oh, center screen now. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's a lovely view of the beautiful structures. Placid, with the view placid waters, calm waters, serene. You see the blue sea. Yes, and all the yachts. Can you imagine what it's like to be sailing right now? The yachts are there. From his autobiography, oh, we learned that he traveled extensively throughout Europe and he was fascinated with the architecture and culture. He did that with his friend Philip Graves. And all the boats are now uh, lined up to welcome him. I'm seeing them in the distance there. Yes, they, the they're lined up the and, well. and welcoming him as we, as we speak. There's the flotilla, there's Ambience, uh, one of the yachts that generally traverse the Grenadines. Yes. You can see them well spaced and lying in the entry point, Port Elizabeth. They're very calm waters as you enter that sheltered area. Yes. And you'd see now the shot uh, even more stabilized as uh, yes. has a greater control over the stability of the footage. Smooth sailing into Equi. Yes, yeah. it is indeed. Minutes away from landing the mortal remains of Sir James. And uh, those ferries you're seeing in the distance, at some point, I suspect Sir James would have been any one of those in between. Yes, having fun mixing forth. with the people. In fact, yeah, when, we were everyone. When, when we were much younger and we traveled extensively for camps for the Anglican youth movement. I could remember we had a camp in Beckway one weekend and in fact a couple of friends and I gathered together this week and we were speaking about that. We had a camp in Beckway at the Anglican school in Beckway and on a Sunday afternoon we were coming up and Sir James was actually on the boat making his way up to return to work the Monday so um, he was you know he, he chatted and, and associated well with the people and uh, you you know in, in typical uh, you know spoke and sat and talked with everybody had a laugh and everything like that and if you if you if you didn't know if you were looking at him you you generally wouldn't have known that this is probably the prime minister because he was there mingling with his people and and having and having lots of fun I see SVG 01 in, uh, in the distance there already docked, um, yes it's it's docked already yes 15 20 minutes ago with the officials I, I think I see the uniform someone says uh, I wish the island could be like this every day with the unity and the togetherness that has been displayed today uh, thanks for your comments I, rem I remember our late Governor General Sir Frederick Bonantyne would frequent that beautiful island of Beckway as his favorite relaxation spot and there's no doubt as to the reason why Sir Frederick of blessed memory chose to relax and unwind in Beckway there's no better place to do so uh, than in the Grenadines and Beckway being one of the options uh, in the Grenadines that you can choose from, part of our multi-island state. And uh, this occasion being one, a very unique one, I'm not sure if we'll ever see a state funeral of this nature where you have a multi-island uh, formality, two mm -hmm. services spanning the entire day, and then the final interment on the private property at Mount Pleasant, of the family cemetery rather, of the Mitchell family at Mount Pleasant. As we see in the distance, the welcoming party, I believe. Yes, um, that's the welcoming party, and the members of our, our team uh, on route to Beckway. I, I've seen them downstairs already, 
which means that they will be jumping off ahead of uh, the senior protocol officer, uh, the chief protocol officer, Mozart Kai is also downstairs because we are aware of the transition that has yes, to be made. Yes. So they have to uh, come off to ensure that the police band is already in place because they've got a part to play in terms of the welcoming, uh, the welcoming on the wharf itself. So it's going to be berthed uh, just alongside the uh, the Captain Hugh Mulzak, SVG01. And you see the officials who were in Bekwe from uh, most of the officials who were involved were in Bekwe from since Thursday. Some went down on Wednesday, Thursday, and they're there. I'm not too sure if uh, Prime Minister Motley is is actually on the wharf or if she would have made her way directly to the church. And we're, we were trying to certain. see if we can get, we can get a member of our team to let us let us know that because, of course, she was also a great friend. Yes, of, uh, we've seen several pictures. One of the persons who was first out of the bat to express their sympathies and visited uh, him when he was at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in uh, Barbados. And that we did hear from the Prime Minister of Grenada, Keith Mitchell, that, uh, uh, that he did express that when uh, Prime Minister Motley visited with uh, Sir James at the hospital, she rang to say that uh, Prime Minister Guns. Prime Minister, former Prime Minister uh, Mitchell uh, says, remember you have to do a tribute at, 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 at the <laughs> funeral. So, you know, some, some stories, some, some, some little stories we, we got in between this morning, but all good stories. And we thank you so much uh, for sharing this historic moment with us as uh, the persons on board get ready to get ready to, to make their way off of the of the boat we see uh shafia london who may who did one of the readings and congratulations yes. are in order yes. for miss london after a stint one year they st vincent Bury as manager she will now be taking up uh, the senior uh senior position at uh, the bank fair i think yeah in, in abia barbados. banks Holdings barbados yes. yes and congratulations are indeed uh for for shafia congratulations we're certainly proud of you here in st vincent and the grenadines yes, so i i think i see uh donny out front yes they, 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 yes they heard I, us. I did say that they were out front because <laughs> I, I i i hopefully they won't them. jump off as you said but they will walk off as soon as the boat oh, then walks. no one does that right but you said jump off so <laughs> no. i'm just hoping that they don't I, do that i jump off in inverted commas figuratively and not in a literal sense right yes just wanted to make sure you can't say that yes so, figuratively uh, and not in a literal sense. I see other members of the media joining as well because, uh, of course, everyone wants to get that perfect shot. Mm. Um, uh, one of our, our camera guys are already down there, front and center. Simeon, I believe. Yes, Simeon. Yes. And uh, there we have a shot. Yeah, uh, so we, we see a shot. End to end coverage. That's, we say that's what we call it. To, uh, Valerie in uh, Valerie thank you so much for joining us this coverage is making me even more homesick and uh, I, I'll keep the other part of the message just for the two of us I, I won't okay. share that with everyone but thank you kindly yeah. well I guess it's better to be homesick than seasick um, mm -hmm. after a journey long to that way uh, everyone looks okay I believe um, yes. didn't see anyone trying to stay up yeah so that means that they had a fairly decent trek down on the yes. somewhat rough waters in between but everyone looks okay and ready to go for the next portion yes of what would be a very long day it has been so thus far and is expected to be well into tonight there's no doubt about uh, some lights being required for the latter part of the program uh, as the interment is done um, one of our cameras now capturing uh, the we did pray for a safe passage yes. down and, and God has granted us the, uh, the desires of our heart yes. through prayer and we are grateful that all two uh, the, from the MV Beckway Express 5 and from the Coast Guard uh, traveled and got down safely and we are grateful and we are thankful. Thank you God.
Yes. And uh, we noticed members of the media, as we expected, are among the first, and the security first is among the first to ensure that things are kept in order. There will be various uh, changes on route to the. Yeah, I suspect. Yeah, there will be changes the to the traffic. Service. Some have been converted to one lane, uh, one road, one lane traffic, just to facilitate uh, the funeral service. And with the anticipated uh, crowd it down in Beckway, we we that that is what has taken place. So. We're just uh, waiting for the signal from our team on the ground in Beckway before we hand over. So I think in all fairness, we can basically try to wrap things up here yes. until we hear from them. Colvin, it has been a long day, it has. but I would not change this for the world. What I am experience. happy that I have been a part of this experience where I've been able to witness our history. I might not have been around for the signing in uh, when he became Prime Minister at the age of 53. But I am happy that I've been a part of this significant and historic moment in the landscape of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Yes. And uh, to add to that, again, another groundbreaking moment has never been done before, where we have a continuous live national broadcast, radio, yes. television, social media, without interruption, Yes. from the mainland, to Excellent. a Grenadine Island Excellent. and uh, we're proud we're really proud of our technical guys T hats off to you guys and the providers whoever they are in ensuring that our connectivity remained as sound and stable as possible during the entire course of the transition kudos a to lot, you a lot was ex a lot was demanded and a lot was expected of us and and I'm able I am happy that delivered. so far we were able to deliver on our ability to, to do this and to do it with a certain level of professionalism. I, I note uh, Father, um, Father Ballantyne uh, is, is, is there and he would be coming off as the outriders in their ceremonial wear. You associate with, uh, with uh, events of this nature, solemn are just uh, coming off, uh, Father Junior Ballantyne. Yes, Father Ballantyne, the officiating minister. Make, yes, one of two Ballantyne, officiating sorry. ministers. I believe the Venerable Christian Glasgow, Archdeacon of St. Lucia, is at the church. For the reception of the body. Yes, and, and mm -hmm. Father, uh, Father Ballantyne has traveled down from mainland has traveled down from mainland as he was a part of this morning's uh, service as well. Yes, uh, the family is now uh, coming off. Okay, we've just got word that our team is in place. Yes. And uh, so, Colvin, uh, we, we're not really going to say goodbye, but we're going to transition. Uh, the API is Jennifer Richardson. Jennifer Richardson, do you copy? I believe she is hearing us we expect okay Jennifer we will continue until we we hear from you but we understand that you are in place uh, just once we once we have uh, the setup with you we will smoothly transition and uh, once our team let us know that uh, you're ready um, we would certainly do that so as we witness now the departure of uh, all those who traveled down on the chartered ferry. You see Senator uh, Siobhan John, John, who did one of the readings uh, this morning. Thank you. And uh, uh, we have all the others who came down on the ferry uh, in queue as well, waiting for the next formal path. In the distance, we can see uh, residents of Beckway lining along the beach. Yes, I, I did tell you that that was expected, and yeah. I and I and I would I I, I honestly would have been saddened mm. if, if that didn't happen because I expect that Beckway will give him the type of send off that uh, you didn't really see on mainland St. Vincent because I suppose mainlanders are aware that the culmination is on on the Grenadine Islands. Uh, we see a lot of the. Uh, the parliamentarians past and present of the new democratic party and you would understand and appreciate why they're there uh, we see we're receiving the that's drone the shots out of yeah that's the signal out of beckway ah, so now our team shot. itfx in on land in in beckway is now uh, powering up some shots uh, so just let us know when you're ready and we'll do the handover to you 
and we should do that uh, moments from now and uh, see now the formation being done with the outriders and the yes. hearse and uh, Bekwe, your son, is home for the final Finally. time. Finally. Our listeners in Bekwe, we are here with you. We know that this is a momentous occasion for you, a sad but momentous occasion as you send off your son of the soil, son Mitchell, uh, who would uh, be interred later on today. Uh, shot there, aerial shot there, coming in via ITFX uh, from Beckway as we get ready to hand over fully to our Beckway team. Jennifer Richardson and uh, Donnie Collins who would take it from there and provide you with continuous coverage radio television uh, we ask that you stay with us on all the platforms uh, and we're able to provide you with continuous coverage on the ground on the island of uh, Beckway as we see now some of the senior officers who join you down uh, also making their way to the exit point for the port and, of and we see the picture of Sir James yes, uh, which painting. was painted the, the painting sorry of Sir James done by Calvert uh, Calvert Jones, James Jones, Jones. Yes. why am I mixing why am I yes, mixing my Jones. names today I think it's uh, different factors but yes we'll <laughs> you, leave that there you, you don't want to say no <laughs> I think I mentioned it earlier but right. uh, the salute as expected the, the, the welcome ceremonial welcome with yes. the guards uh, that is a necessity even though we're running behind with time it has to be done as a formality uh, because of the nature of the and the personality that we are laying to rest today former prime minister uh, second the prime minister as a matter of fact and uh, additionally foreign minister for many years while he was in Parliament, a slow march proceeding now, we can see on the ground as we uh, await to hand things over with the audio and the video on that leg. Uh, senior, senior members of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force will lead the procession from this end, uh, involved in a slow march from the wharf in Beckway. And we are alternating now between our Beckway feed and the feed uh, from our, our team at the moment and until we've established uh, a full stable link and we'll continue with the commentary on that end uh, from that point onward but the procession has come to a brief pause and the officers are just being given additional instructions in terms of uh, formalities and making sure that they proper uh, process is followed as the mortal remains move to the almond tree. Uh, I suspect that is still in place. I'm not yes. sure if that has been yes. changed. It's still in place, right? So the next stop would be at the almond tree, under the almond tree, uh, a spot that Sir James and many from the island of Beckley. Uh, it's a symbolic part of, of being from Beckley. Uh, many events would happen under the almond tree. Mm -hmm. You would hear it on countless occasions. That was a community gathering point, or still is rather. Another visual shot as we continue with our coverage. And uh, momentarily we will hear from the team uh, in uh, Beckway as we await their audio. We already have their visuals. And uh, a view now as the procession halts for a moment. And the cameras on the ground there prepare for the team what would happen on the ground quickly. ready for us. We're just making sure that they're ready for us in terms of the commentary so we can have a, a seamless transfer of our commentary team from the Kingstown Methodist Church Master Control onto the production team of ITFX on the island of Beckway. Another area of shot here as we 
see the mark of respect being offered as the hearse slowly moves forward towards the gate and uh, on to the next stop, on to the almond tree. We hope that our, our visuals uh, will remain in place for us to continue with to continue with you. What is now a slow march as they're leaving the wharf in Beckway. All right, I think we're just making sure that we have some, some volume so we can hear our team. And uh, we await uh, the team in Beckway to pick up uh, from here onward with what is happening there. We do hope that you'll be able to stay with us for the remainder of the coverage. It is not the end of the coverage. This is just a portion of it that we're handing over the baton to the next broadcast team. And we're already seeing their visuals. Uh, we're just awaiting the commentary team to join in. And if you're just joining us for this leg of the broadcast, you are listening and viewing the state funeral of the late Sir James Fitzalan Mitchell, the second Prime Minister of St. Vincent Town, the Grenadines, born on the 15th of May 1931, dead at the age of 90 on Tuesday, November 23rd, 2021. The hearse bearing the body of the former Prime Minister is now making its way uh, through the streets of the Grenadine Island, Beckway, uh, island that he called home for all of his life, born in Beckway. And we just see the men and women, the sergeants and the station sergeants and sergeants of the Royal St. Vincent Town, the Grenadines Police Force, who are actually the pallbearers. Yes. They are walking alongside, they're processing, sorry, alongside the hearse as, it's make, as it makes its way to the almond tree where there will be a brief stop. Uh, two songs will be played by the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force Band. One, his favorite song, which is Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, which was uh, performed by the members of the Kingstown Chorale. And the hymn, Oh God, Our Help, in ages past, will be played. That is, his, of course, his favorite hymn, a hymn which he, he used at, the, at all of his political meetings, uh, at the start of his political meetings. And we heard his daughter, uh, Sarah Louise Mitchell, quip this morning that she ensured that he was finished singing that before she attended his meetings because uh, her father, her father, well, what, what do I say? Her father cannot sing or couldn't sing? Oh, uh, she, yes. <laughs> yes. He but tried. He, he tried. tried. He tried. Yes, I, I remember them too when they sang as the parliamentarians in the Nina We and them when NBC ah, yes, had Carolyn. Yes, yes. I remember they, they were much looked forward to uh, the parliamentarians uh, when um, when they sang We Three Kings of Orienta. They had the voices of the late uh, John Horn, the late uh, Q, QC Panel Campbell and, and Sir James. They were featured. Uh, they were very well featured. Um, in their performances as, as the streets of Beckway are uh, right and left aligned uh, by the people of Beckway who now gets an opportunity to pay tribute and to serenade their hero, their local hero as he comes, uh, as he comes home to them in Beckway. Remember this is joint coverage of the production of the Agency for Public Information, the National Broadcasting Corporation and VC3 Television. We are uh, from our broadcast hub at the Methodist Church in Kingstown. We're still we're here still with here. you. Yes, the church and uh, uh, we, uh, we're still here and we have some visuals of what's taking place in Beckway. The transition has been made to Beckway in terms of the service. The hearse is now on the Grenadine Island of Beckway. So we are waiting now for our team on the ground in Beckway to pick up and to um, to basically uh, to, to, to continue with the rest with the remainder of the broadcast. 
uh, we it's been a historic and significant yes. occasion and we've told you all of this but one continue cannot continue to emphasize the importance of this I, I, I do feel proud as a Vincentian of of what we are able to 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 the, the send off that I, I think it's a quite a fitting send off that we're able to give to this great statesman and we heard a lot about him in the tributes which were paid uh, this morning he was eulogized extensively by the former speaker who served during his tenure that is uh, Monty Moore and uh, was, was, was eulogized by him and we also heard tribute there now on the almond tree and the police band Sounds led like by Inspector band, Vaughan up. Miller is out front and I am, I, I am, we, we still, we, we have, we have visuals but we haven't had audio but we don't have audio as yet. No, I'm so, um, the audio there. we will try, we will try, but we can let you know that they would be playing Don't Cry For Me Argentina, and the other song is Oh God, oh God Our Help, help In Ages Past. Ages past. Okay, they the have audio, so now. we go in a go straight over. James, his favorite, and we are awaiting what would happen next. There is a stage here set up with a microphone, so we're anticipating that something else is going to happen here. So we are waiting to, to see that. And I must say that it is quite a, a, a calm and a very serene afternoon in Beckway. The people are just really quiet and observant. Caribbean man and he, he looked out for the region and something that 
some folks will not know is that Sir James worked as a cocoa agronomist in St. Lucia in 1957. <laughs> so he didn't just work in St. Vincent, he did work in, in, in St. Lucia in 1957. And then he came back to St. Vincent here where he worked as a, as a agriculture research officer from 1958 to 1961. Yeah. So we're making our way over to the church where the second church service Looking at the folks who are here, just looking on, and I'm reading their faces, I'm reading their emotions, they are witnessing something that we probably would not see again for a long, long time. Jennifer mentioned that the state spared no pennies in getting this together. It was a huge effort logistically. Um, we are right in the middle of it. And uh, seeing all the pieces moving, and everybody really could come in there. But what we are witnessing here, as we head towards the church, right in the harbor, is nothing but spectacular. Um, Sir James, uh, as he left his remains, left the boat with all of the sound on the other boats. It was just an amazing thing to see all the uniforms, all the high ranking officials, all lined up, all decked out. So we are making our way in to the front of the church where all the folks from the Anglican church are lined up already awaiting the entrance of Sir James. The police band is going a little further beyond and it seems they are making a block around the, around the area here. They are making a block around and they are turning and they are coming back down to the church.
Of course, we are now at the Anglican Church, the St. Mary's Anglican Church in, in Beckway and the Anglican priest and all of the other attendants are aligned in the front of the church and they are awaiting his arrival. At the side of the church we have the tents, several tents with seats so that persons can be comfortably seated and of course on both sides of the church we have seating. I want to take a, a glimpse of what the church looks like inside before the folks start filing in. Of course, the band has stopped playing now, and we are waiting the purse to line up in front of the church so that the ticket can be retrieved and brought into the church. The persons are filing in, and whoa, the church is beautifully decorated. Beautifully decorated. That's all you share. I think you guys have outdone yourselves. It is quite a lovely sight. And all of the protocol folks from the foreign affairs, they are here and they are busy and they are doing a wonderful job. So it's a little bit quiet now as we await the arrival of the casket out of the hearth and into, and into the church. And Donnie, the police officers here on duty are doing a wonderful job, you know, ensuring that the, the crowd is properly controlled and that nothing gets done as far as obstruction is concerned. One of the, one of the things I noticed recently was the effort to maintain the COVID-19 protocols. I'm seeing the big screens, I'm seeing the extra seating around so that there'll be minimal overcrowding inside the church building and folks will still be able to um, safely social distance and uh, see what is happening inside. Screens all around. And uh, we are now going to see um, Another setup. Um, these guys are quite skillful. They are turning, they are maneuvering. Because look, the roadway is, is quite small, but they are, they are making a good run of it, um, maneuvering nicely and skillfully. So the next thing to happen will be uh, the casket. And this is happening right now, wrapped in the national flag. And there are the officers having it on their shoulders and they are marking time slowly making their way towards the church the guard of honor is there and they are going to proceed between it as they make their way into the church spectacular spectacular beautifully wrapped in the national flag befitting a man who has loved this country for so many years you know so it was one of the longest serving prime ministers we have had now we have um prime minister gonzalez who has gone a little longer than him but he was the longest serving prime minister up to 2001 right or 2000 up to 2000. the interesting thing beyond just serving the longest he shaped uh, the political scene in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, maneuvered skillfully the political scene in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and came out on top on numerous occasions. Sir James was a skillful politician, as he was a humble man. And he, he had vision, he was a visionary. He saw what, a lot of what would happen later on in the life of this country, and he tried his best to put things in place to ensure that we will, we will not be carried away with the time, but that we would really, you know, rise to the occasion and we could be productive as a country. So, so well, they are entering the church now, and uh, they are going to place him on uh, the contraption that we place uh, the, caskets the caskets on a stand. Uh, it's probably a fancy name for it, but uh, that's the next move. And these guys are now going to maneuver again. The police band is still in place, and uh, the official ceremony now can begin.
dreams. We thank you for giving him to us as family and friends to know and love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see the gate of eternal life so that in quiet confidence we may continue course on earth until by your call we are united those who have gone before through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant eternal rest unto him, O Lord. Let thy perpetual shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me, though he die, Yet shall he live, and whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His compassion never fails. Every morning they are renewed. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to, the, for to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the living and the dead. We brought nothing into the world, and we take nothing out. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to the service of Thanksgiving as we celebrate the life and witness of James Fitzalan. This Service continues with the singing of the hymn, Will Your Anchor Hold?
Johnny Dewey had it. The will your anchor hold? And the service is going to move right along. So we have the daughter of Sir James, Miss Sabrina Mitchell. She is going to be doing her tribute now. And that her tribute will be followed by the tribute of Lady Janice Compton and then Mrs. Gretel Mitchell Buyab, the daughter also of Sir James. So we go to the microphone. For Sabrina's tribute. As you can tell, it's an emotional time How do I put for into her. Words the depth of the loss in my soul. How do I capture all of the thoughts and the memories in my head about this man, this superhuman, this remarkable, kind, genuine, compassionate, extraordinary person that was my father? This man, who to others was Sir James, Miss Mitchell, son, PM, Pops, Papa Michi, Grandpa, G Dog, Anansi, Gramps, but to me, Daddy. We have heard already today and will continue to hear so many, many wonderful and poignant tributes and comments about Sir James our second prime minister, the statesman, the great leader, the legend. But let me give you the version of Sir James from me. When I think about daddy, who has been the most important person in my entire life, I feel so incredibly honored and privileged to have been his daughter. I don't just feel this appreciation today, I have always felt it. Being around him, I always had a sense of wonder and amazement, even when he was doing the most mundane of daily tasks because he was always larger than life. Everyone who knew him knew what we were to each other. I was the closest human to him and him to me, certainly in my lifetime. We were confidants, best friends, business partners, partners in crime, 
We were each other's rock, emotional support, and much more. We talked a lot, several times a day. We laughed, we planned, we schemed, we cried, we despaired, we consoled each other, but most of all, we shared. Being the daughter who's closest to him, especially in the past 25 years, I was the one taking care of his daily needs, experiencing his deepest fears, his political strategies, his greatest wishes, and most of all, that vision for SVG that was his life's purpose. I had so many roles, I couldn't keep track. I was secretary, editor-in-chief, travel agent, banker, accountant, laundress, maid, caterer, nursemaid, phone fixer, listener, and whatever task he needed of me. I always knew how important my role was to him, so I gave him my all. I dropped whatever he was doing when he needed me, and that was often. However, it was not always like that. When he was a young politician and I a child growing up in our home on the waterfront of Admiralty Bay, beside and then later behind the frangipani, being his daughter was not easy. Not because he wasn't a good father, at least not intentionally, but because he was a man on a mission. His life's purpose was dedicated to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and everything centered around this lofty goal to improve the lives of his people. He returned to Beckway as a young newlywed with my mother, Pat, having traveled home with all of their possessions, a set of dishes on the geese boat from England to start the Frangipani Hotel. His intention was to go into politics to help St. Vincent, and this guided his life, his choices, and therefore ours by extension. And so it was and remained. The Frangipani was started as a means to finance his political ambition. He was relentless in his pursuit of power, ruthless at times, focused, driven, determined, but above all else to succeed. This defined who he was. As children, Greta Louise and I were terrified of him. His booming, powerful voice, barking instructions, combined with his constant pursuit of excellence, made life as his daughters very challenging. For him, mediocrity was not an option. Being late, never an option. We knew this well. No B's and C's for us in school, and worst of all, poor excuses. We had to get an A as far as he, he was concerned. All it took was hard work, discipline, and effort. So what was stopping you? Nothing for him, for sure. This strict upbringing, discipline, and attitude to life rubbed off on all of us. But it wasn't just the discipline he is instilled into us. He led by example. He valued hard work, and he lived his life that way. He never relented in pursuing his vision. He worked constantly. He was often not at home when we were young. He was away for days on end, sometimes weeks, sailing the Grenadines with Robbie and Kelvin, his best mates, and often Uncle John Compton campaigning and building his support. Traveling to the mainland, driving his yellow Volkswagen Beetle, learning the country, every village, understanding his people, listening to their stories, their needs, their trials and tribulations. He was a man with a vision for SVG. I got glimpses of this as a child, but much of it didn't resonate until later in life when it all became clear. We learned, however, to live with the long absences and maybe there was some resentment, perhaps, but the re reality of being the family of a great man with a purpose and vision men meant that you had to be without him, simply put. Those early years, dedicating his life to getting elected not, meant not just sharing him, but our home. The downstairs of our house was a political space. People came to see him, talk to him, ask for its, his help at all hours of the night and day. He always welcomed him, them. We grew up with politics 
and the politician's life was part of our daily existence. At one point, there was even a printing press in our house. I think it was called the Grenadines Gazette, spreading the word of his vision. He made small progress in those early years, earning the respect of the country. He earned it through grit, tenacity, and determination, combined with his genuine love and affection for the people. He worked in the Ministry of Agriculture as a young scientist, and this paved the way for many of the policies that he would eventually be able to put into practice when he was Prime Minister. His profession as a scientist affected his life and our lives as a family. His greatest passion was planting trees. I can't tell you how many trees my sisters and I planted with him over his lifetime. He believed in planting a tree under whose shade you may never sit, have the pleasure to sit. He believed that giving and nourishing something, whether a tree, a friendship, a business, meant that you had to give in order to receive. He became famous for once for saying that Vincentians have a breadfruit mentality. A lot of people were offended by this, but I don't think many of them understood what he meant. Simply, the breadfruit tree you never plant. It grows on its own. It pops up everywhere. But you can reap from it still, even though you didn't plant it. And so he planted trees, hundreds of them all over St. Vincent. He gave many people tree saplings as gifts. Many of you who admire the yellow puy trees in Beckway and Bloom in April and the red flamboyants in July don't even know that he planted those trees for your enjoyment. In mango season, my backyard has a sampling of Julie Imperial cotton Ceylon mangoes, which he planted. And many people enjoy the mangoes and raid my tree on a daily basis. Remember him next time you eat a mango from my yard. He planted for others to reap. Being so close to him, I had a front row seat to his character and his impact on the lives of so many people. He had a brilliant mind and, of course, what he was famous for, his charm and charisma. He had a unique gift. He connected with people in an inexplainable and rare way. It didn't matter if you were rich or poor, a local, a visitor, a gardener, a laborer, a banker, a businessman, a farmer, or a fisherman. He could reach you and touch you in an unforgettable way. People who met my father never forgot him. I witnessed this over and over. He always left an impression. It slowly became clear to me as a young woman after he won the election in 1984 as prime minister that this was not just my father. I had a responsibility to share him and indeed we did with our nation, my sisters and I. There were times when that hurt when I missed his presence, but adulthood brought me to accept the salient truth that to want him as our daddy alone was selfish. He had to serve his country and to fulfill his destiny to, to lead because he was a born leader and to deprive him of that would have been wrong. And so we accepted the politician that was our father. It never ceased to amaze me right up until he died. Any age, a child or an old person, it was fascinating to watch the faces of people. He just touched people's hearts. He was a man of the people and for the people. After he retired from politics, often on a Thursday night at the Frangipani when the steel band was playing or during breakfast time, he would walk around chatting to our guests finding out where they were from and what brought them to Beckway, telling them stories of his travels, his experiences, discussing local politics, world affairs. People fascinated him. He loved people. I think he gave a piece of himself to all that he knew. And they would tell me afterwards, your father is so char charming. What amazed me most were the persons who he spoke to, complete strangers, chatted them up. They would come up to me after and say, who was that nice man? 
He was so kind and interesting. He never told people who he was. I was the one who had to say. He's, he was the former Prime Minister of St. Vincent. They were amazed as, at his humility. He made them feel welcome in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. That was Sir James, one of our greatest ambassadors. Many people tell me how much I'm like him. I talk like him, I think like him, I look like him, I sound like him, but I have always felt that I never measured up. He certainly, except maybe in the last year or two, never told me that he admired me. Others would tell me this. He would brag about my sisters, his grandchildren and me, but we didn't know this. If I am even half or a fraction of the metal of this man, then surely I will be okay because he was just that, a giant, one of a kind. The sacrifices my father made for me to give me a good ed education and later for my own children, Undine and Ella, he helped me to pay their fees when I couldn't. He truly believed that money spent on education was the best investment in life. Well, that and buying land, of course. <laughs> he guided me in business. He helped me make every single dis business decision I ever made. When I started my own company, Vintages, I was terrified he would not approve. I smile when I think of what he told me when I was going into the liquor business. But these are words I cannot repeat in this venue. <laughs> he believed in me and he was my biggest fan. He held me up when I fell, when others drug, dragged me down. He gave me strength when I had no one and nowhere to turn and I owe him more than my life. There was one side of my father that never changed. Anyone who is naive enough to think so misunderstood this man. He was a politician through and through, a brilliant one. His blood ran yellow. He loved to campaign. He loved the thrill of the rostrum and the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And he loved to win. Even in the most recent elections, he strategized, he raised money, he designed t-shirts, he planned and he plotted and he schemed. His mind was never far from his beloved NDP, the party he cre created at the Frangipani in, in 1975, a decision that would shape the political landscape of SVG for eternity. He didn't want NDP to win just because it was his party. He truly believed that this was the medium in which he could solve St. Vincent's problems. And he did for many years. He served his country well and proudly and his legacy will endure. He was passionate about democracy. The creation of the NDP and the land reform, pro reform program was his greatest achievement in his mind. He believed in capitalism and the free market. He believed that people were inherently good and they just needed a chance to own something. His politics was that of the middle class. He didn't believe in just giving a man money. He believed in giving a man a job to earn his own money, to have his own self-worth and to own something. The creation of the middle class, it helped to grow. He helped it to grow and thrive and drive our economy to great levels of success. To him, it meant giving people a great life in, from every part of this country, from Ashton to Fancy. I speak mostly about my experience with my father, but each person who knew him have their own version of him. So James was a faithful friend to many and enjoyed, and many enjoyed his company, his fascinating stories, his humor and his humility. He cherished loyalty as the bastion of friendship. He taught me that. Never turn your back on a loyal friend. He drilled it into my head. Not all who claimed to be his friend were faithful friends to him. And being his confidant, I can tell you there are many who abandoned him and brought great disappointment and pain and heartbreak. 
but Sir James was a realist. He never got caught up in dreams of what could never be. When a situation occurred, he analyzed it, formed an opinion, took action or not, but he adapted. He was not afraid of change. He embraced technology and the changing face of our planet and its realities. For a 90-year-old man, he could send a WhatsApp message and include an attachment, as many of you who got his messages and emails can attest to. But I think it is most important to mention that he understood power and its elusiveness. He knew when to step down. He felt that he saved St. Vincent from violence when he retired as prime minister. He knew that power could be transient, and he accepted it graciously. I cannot speak about my father without mentioning his unwav unwavering commitment and adv advocacy of St. Vincent getting vaccinated. He will turn in his grave if I don't mention it. As a scientist by profession, he believed in facts. He believed firmly that the vaccine was our best option in this crisis, this COVID-19 crisis. He got his two vaccines imme immediately as they became available. He was very proud of this. He was deeply saddened, worried, and pained by the hesitancy in some of us. He spoke to me about it every day. It mattered to him that we save St. Vincent from ruin. The nurse on duty in the Beckway Hospital, the night before he passed, told me in one of his last conversations that he wants St. Vincent to be vaccinated. Tell them, do it for me. Above all, my father taught me to show gratitude, that small gestures matter, that words matter, effort matters, and saying thank you matters. It would amaze me when some nobody would call him, or even a big shot, no matter who. He always said one thing at the end of the conversation, thank you for calling. He so ingrained it in me as we spent so much time together. I have so much to be grateful for having this amazing father. I have my discipline, my work ethic, my kind heart, my sense of fun, and even loving red wine, and our favorite drink in the last few years, our rum and ginger. Many times when financial struggles hit us, we went hungry, my daddy and I, on many nights, sacrificing our money for education. I remember at a real low point in September, in the off season, a few years ago, when there's no money and no business. We had just spent a lot of money on school fees. And he called me about 8 o'clock the night, really pleased with himself. I answered the phone. He was chuckling. What's up, Daddy? He said, I found a tin of corned beef. I made some rice. Do you want any? I said, sure, I'm hungry. He drove down from Mount Pleasant about 9 o'clock the night to bring corned beef and rice for me. My father never let me give up. He used to say, we haven't crossed the Rubicon yet, Sabrina. Don't give up, darling. We will make it. And then some miracle would happen. And he would say, I tell you, they can't beat us, Sabrina, not me and you together. Hold your head up and we will make it. My father was a voracious reader of nonfiction. He appreciated literature and the written word. He had a special bond with my youngest daughter, Ella, who recently graduated with a literature degree. She wrote a poem many years ago on 9-11, and I was amazed her grandfather sent this poem to so many people. I worked on his first book with him, Beyond the Islands, and now he has entrusted Ella to editing his latest book. He said it was his final agenda, writing his last book. He would tell me almost every night as he read me a passage, and often to my daughter Undine and others, I'm sure, 
that he had to finish it before he died. There was a great sense of urgency in him. He would wake at 5 a.m., write and rewrite, crumble up paper, start over, rewrite, call me, can you go buy me a pack of paper, just to get a single sentence right. He worked with Ella in the final weeks of his life before he passed, completing his book, giving her instructions from his hospital bed. So James loved all of his grandchildren. He changed a lot in his retirement years. The softer side of him, surely hidden in my youth, came to light. When I watched him interact with Ty, James, Chavez, Isla, Nile, Ondine, and Ella, and of course, my youngest sister, Gabia, who brought him great, great joy in his later years, I would smile to myself. Sometimes I had to pinch myself because in my head he was this scary, aggressive, take no nonsense kind of man, not the smiling, kind grandpa. I still imagined him as larger than life, but there were many sides to this unusual man. When he was in the ICU in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Barbados, I knew he was in the departure lounge, as he would say. We had some wonderful moments then. We said our goodbyes. He still was giving me instructions of what he wanted me to do when he was gone. For me, the family, the frangipani. He told me in Barbados, Sabrina, I'm crossing the Rubicon. The day after he got to Beckway Hospital, a few days before he passed, he looked around the hospital room and he said, Sabrina, where am I? I said, Daddy, you're in Beckway. He gave a huge sigh. Thank God, he said. I am so glad that he was here. He died on his own terms. He waited for me that morning when he passed. Thank you for that, Daddy. So James's legacy will endure the test of time of that, I am sure. Not only in the dedicated service to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but most importantly in the lives that he touched. He helped so many people in so many ways. I have heard so many stories in the last few days of the people's lives he touched that he made better. He was kind to a fault. Help others before you help yourself. The footprint he leaves behind is indelible. He will rem be remembered most, I think, in the hearts and minds of the lives he touched. I think that will be his greatest legacy. There will never be another like him. Beckway has lost a son of our soil, a great, great man. There is one of three things that you can do to honor this man. Read a book, get vaccinated, or plant a tree. Do something for yourself, for SVG, and for all of humanity. Goodbye, my friend, my rock, my everything, my daddy. I miss you more than words can express. I want to call you to tell you that the Admiral is back just to see you smile, to ask your advice, to get your reassurance, and just to talk. I will be talking to you, Daddy, to tell you what's happening in your beloved Beckway. So when those trees are in bloom in their wondrous beauty, think of him, remember him, and cherish his legacy. You are here forever in my heart, my soul, and those of my children and sisters and our family. And 
his beloved NDP family, and I am sure all of St. Vincent. I will continue to honor all that you wanted to my best ability. I promise you that. Sleep well, my daddy. I love you. Lady Janice, I crave your indulgence to fast track the feature tribute, and I therefore invite. A beautiful tribute by his daughter, Sabrina Mitchell. Powerful indeed. Her last few words stuck with me. Plant a tree. Get vaccinated. Read a book. I wish we all can take that message from that tribute. Um, I think we're going to jump ahead uh, to our feature tribute. I, I was just about to mention that she is here. She made a trip down. Uh, the Honorable Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, will deliver the feature tribute this afternoon. Leader of the Opposition Friday, Assistant Secretary General of CARICOM, Douglas Slater, Minister of Foreign Affairs from Trinidad and Tobago, Amy Brown, the daughters of Sir James, the family and friends of Sir James, the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Sabrina, I have to confess that. I almost wish I wasn't speaking now because your tribute is easily one of the most touching and comprehensive tributes that I've heard any daughter give to her father. The sincerity of your feelings and the awe in which you all held him came through in every word and the commitment to ensuring that his legacy remains vibrant with the simplicity of the requests. Plant a tree, get a vaccination and read a book. And as simple as they may sound, they reflect the essence of what is necessary for us to move on, to be viable, and to always be able to move to the next level. Sir James and I were not of the same generation. We're not even of the same politics. But we developed a bond that I came to whom? cherish in a very real way. I knew, obviously, of the great politician who with one seat would become premier of this country. I knew of the exploits of him on the Commonwealth stage as we would, as children, read the newspapers and follow all of the work of the great Caribbean leaders of the time, of which Sir James was one. My first memory of him was when I came home, having just completed the bar, came home to the funeral of the right excellent Earl Walton Barrow, the first Prime Minister of Barbados, who was his very close and dear friend. Little did I know that the man who gave this wonderful tribute at the funeral of the right excellent Earl Walton Barrow in what was then to become my constituency at the National Stadium would be a man who would come to guide me on my own journey later on in life. It was ironic that while I was a young minister of government and he was prime minister, Lowly ministers did not get the opportunity to meet and engage with prime ministers at the time. So it wasn't with him in government that I knew him. But it became when I entered opposition again, and he, as a retired prime minister, running 
Afan Japani, and my love of this island brought us together year after year after year. And it was significant for me that his commitment to Caribbean civilization always, always, always gave me the inspiration that our generation needed to carry on from that which had been done and built by those who went before us. The truth is, we shared a passion for this Caribbean and we shared a passion for the Caribbean Sea. I would swim with him most afternoons and after that he would come and we would have a few drinks and the stories would continue. And I would go in the morning, buy gingerbread, and we would sit for hours and talk and talk. And in particular, when I was going through some of the difficult times in opposition, it was Sir James Mitchell who anchored me and allowed me to summon the courage and to stay the course and to do that which was necessary. I therefore would not know how not to be here today. On the 18th, on the 14th of November, I left the Remembrance Day Parade and went to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital to spend some time with Sir James. Ironically, they told me I'm not sure that he would be able to recall you or to be able to speak with you. I said, don't worry. I go in and spend time. And as I walked into the room, he was sleeping. And I just touched his foot. I said, Sir James. And his eyes started to open. I said, yes, Sir James, you know who it is? And the mask was on. And he looked again. Mia Matli, what are you doing here? And I said, you told me that he wasn't going to recognize me. And we had a wonderful conversation that morning for just under an hour. His clarity was unbelievable, especially given what I had been told. And in fact, I'm sorry that I missed Keith, our brother Keith, this morning in his tribute, because it was on that morning that I first learned that he said, you know, I asked Keith many, 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 many years ago to do my tribute. And he paused. He said, but it was one condition. And he paused again. I said, well, what, what was that? He has to stay alive. <laughs> <laughs> and with his usual wit, he broke all of the angst in the room. And that was the man that we knew. I want to say, that in this region, we have been blessed. We have been truly blessed. And your country has been blessed. Your country has produced, as has other islands in this region, but continues to produce people who, in spite of our smallness, in spite of the limited size, continue to show the world that we can be some of the greatest contributors to the global story and to the global civilization. Anyone who spoke to Sir James knew of the many exploits in the Commonwealth, his involvement in situations in Africa, his being present when the Commonwealth took the decision to suspend Nigeria and the role that he played in trying to hold the Gambia and Sierra Leone within the Commonwealth family of nations at the time. Those who can speak about his ability to do as Errol Barrow reflected for our own foreign policy in Barbados to be friends of all and satellites of none, with him ranging from Fidel Castro right back to Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. This is who we are as a Caribbean people. For we do not have the luxury of taking sides that will put our people at risk. 
And Prime Minister Gonzalez, the ability to have that sense of practicality that puts people at the center of all that you do is what must continue to drive us as a Caribbean civilization. Our smallness, our smallness shall never define us. And perhaps in his own way, the power of one and the power of smallness were best represented by Sir James. And the story that he will never give up until the time when he could no longer do, as has happened, is that inspiration that we must always have. For him, as you said, he was not ready to cross the Rubicon until he had to. It is significant for me that this region has produced more and more people who have made that defining difference to global civilization. When the Cold War ended, Sir James contended with prescience that the next major battles would be religious. The radicalization of Islam, the radicalization of Christianity, and that the world would find itself trying to maneuver those divisions in ways that most people did not expect yet again at this point in our history. I ask all of us in this region to recognize that we have a duty to tell the stories of our leaders, not just within the geographic boundaries of our individual islands, but across this Caribbean civilization. We have been able to produce persons of great renown, and Sir James Mitchell stood as one of the great Caribbean Renaissance men. I say Renaissance because you could not know the man without being taken in by his charm and his charisma. You could not know the man without understanding his appreciation for beauty. You could not know the man without understanding the extent to which he could equally be happy with the very basic things of life as he could be, as he told Nina Clark on one of his last days, please don't let them give me chipped ice on my lips. A little frozen champagne chipped up would do a better job. Such was the nature of the man. And I therefore ask us, as I say this afternoon, to remember that we have a duty to tell these stories and to define our region more in terms of what unites us rather than what divides us. I believe that his family would do well to recognize that in the same way he spoke to others and in the same way he led that he always, always, always spoke about you guys. I knew of you before I knew any of you. And for me as a child of a former politician as well, this was a significant thing for me because too many children of the political class in this region suffer from the absence of their parents. It is a difficult burden to bear. I understand it well. In my own instance, I was saved from the full extent of it, but I understood it because I saw it with the others. And I ask you to remember that his absence from you was simply to help to build a better place for you and for all of the rest of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. When Sir James spoke at the funeral of Earl Walton Barrow, he quoted Lord Tennyson. I'm not going to quote the poem that he used, but I want to take the excerpt from In Memoriam and to remind you, as I'm sure he would if he was standing here, I hold it true, whatever befall, I feel it when I sorrow most. Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved 
at all. There can be no truer words. There can be no truer words. And all who have loved today will know that the best tribute I can give to Sir James as we close is to anchor it in that place where we spent most of our time in the ocean. But equally, to use his words for this final farewell. And I do so poignantly because that final paragraph that he has left to the world in that book of his, of his autobiography says it all. As you came across from St. Vincent in the last hour and a half, and I quote, and so always, back home, rounding the corner into Admiralty Bay, a feeling special only to the lovers of the rock, our diamond, our Beckway. And as he reflected how wonderful it is to rise and discover beyond the islands the dawn, we will reflect how wonderful it will be for him to rise in glory when the time comes. Sir so James, you were a Caribbean Renaissance man of note. You added to this Caribbean civilization. But above all else, you did well to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines who raised you, who nurtured you, who inspired you, and who gave you the opportunity to be that voice way beyond, way beyond the size of this nation. May God bless you always. Thank you. Powerful words from the Prime Minister of the Republic of Barbados, Mia Amor Motley. And she spoke about an intimate relationship with Sir James, a man of many hats, perhaps. Uh, we will now hear from Lady Janice Campton, who will bring a tribute. Also here is uh, Dr. Godwin Friday and his wife, and they are being greeted now by Lady Janice Campton before she go to the podium. Quite a few dignitaries here, Jennifer, quite a few. Uh, well, this morning had the cream of the crop, but many made the trip down yes. to be with Sir James here in Beckway. She's at the mic, so we go. To Sabrina, who was so eloquent. But to come after Mia Motley and Sabrina is a hell of a task now. <laughs> Honorable Prime Minister Gonzales, Prime Minister of St. Vincent. Honorable Leader of the Opposition, Dr. Friday and Mrs. Friday. Ministers of Government of St. Vincent, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Honorable Mian Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, Reverend Canon Ballantyne, and my own minister, Archdeacon Glasgow of St. Vincent and St. Lucia. <laughs> Sabrina, Louise, Gretti, Gabby, and all your families. All the rest of the family of Sir James, and all the people of the Grenadines that we all love so much, and of St. Vincent. I'm truly honored to be here today. Of course, we all know that had my dear husband, Sir John Compton, been here, he would be the one speaking. I may not be able to measure up to him, but I'll do my best. There are many persons who will speak today, and some who have spoken, about the dis different aspects of Sir James Mitchell's life and of his amazing contribution to the development of, not only of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but also of the wider Caribbean, and especially the Eastern Caribbean. 
and so I shall speak a little of his enduring friendship with my husband. When my husband, the late Sir John Compton, passed away, among the many messages of sympathy I received was a short but very touching letter that has stayed with me. It was from Lee Kuan Yew, the late Prime Minister of Singapore. Harry Lee, as we knew him, had studied in the UK around the same time as John. And Harry's letter would speak of how, and I quote, our common colonial heritage made for good friendships. And so it is in similar vein in these small islands where our stories are so interwoven, our shared histories have created these ties that bind us together. Son Mitchell and John Compton were friends to the end. They grew up in the Grenadines knowing the hardships of life in these islands. But they also grew up loving the sheer beauty of them, loving the strength and determination and togetherness of those who never forgot that these little gems are the place where their navel strings are buried. John would end up living in St. Lucia and make his main contribution there. But he never abandoned St. Vincent and the Grenadines returning time and again to revel in the pursuits of his childhood, swimming, sailing, fishing, and the camaraderie he enjoyed here. Their early shared experiences would stand them in good stead in the years that followed and would influence them both in their roles as Prime Minister of St. Vincent and of St. Lucia. Son and John shared another history as well. In the first part of the 19th century, Sir William Snag, who owned Carinage Estate in Canawan, brought out a gentleman from East Meon in the county of Hampshire in the UK to teach shipbuilding. His name was Benjamin Compton. He would teach shipbuilding from Anguilla in the north to Cariacou in the south. And one young gentleman from Bekwe would go to Canawan to learn from him. His name was William Alexander Mitchell. And he would fall in love with Benjamin's daughter and would marry her. And so began the rich history of this boating and boat building that the Mitchells and the Comptons are so well known for. In the ensuing years, Son and John never lost their love for a nice sail. At one time, as Sabrina mentioned, they, along with son's brother, Reginald, owned a yacht together called Colibri, which was then sold for a bigger one, Sapphire. In these casual times together, it was possible to share their dreams and hopes for these islands and to plan how they could make a difference. And sometimes they were joined by the right excellent, the or the Honorable Errol Barrow, then Prime Minister of Barbados. I can remember them racing in the carrier Kuragata one year. What a crew. On these occasions, Dipper Barrow, as he was commonly known, was the cook. And gourmet cook he was, for that was one of his passions. On another occasion, because I was very privileged to be present on many of these thing, occasions. And on another occasion, I remember them meeting in Petit St. Vincent with the then Prime Minister of Grenada, Sir Eric Gary, to discuss freedom of movement. The first steps in their dream of political union for these islands. something about which they were both very passionate, as has been mentioned before. Believing that in unity came strength, and from that strength would come our natural progression. In later years, Along came Dame Eugenia Charles from Dominica, 
and Sir Kennedy Simmons from St. Kitts, and they all became first firm friends. Eugenia, John, and Son were all born under the sign of Taurus. In fact, Son and Eugenia shared the same birthday. It made for a strong and lasting friendship between the three because they understood each other and their goals for these islands were similar. In the words of the late Chedi Jagan, towards one common goal of democracy, regional integration, unity and diversity, and social progress. Together they crisscrossed Europe to explain the plight of our bananas, fighting the might of the Latin American lobby and some European countries. They weighed all the problems of the OECS together, as they did when Grenada went through her terrible, her terrible trials and Guyana. And they worked together to support deve developmental projects in their respective countries. So strong was their bond that Sun could say that their faith and confidence in each other allowed them, and I quote, to trust the destinies of our respective countries to the hands of a colleague, as Sir Keith Mitchell said in his words today. After Eugenia's retirement, we all headed to Dominica to attend the dinner in her honor. And I recall a young lady singing a song explaining that OECS meant only Eugenia, Compton, and Son. I always added Kennedy Simmons to the S. To quote Sun once again, one of the greatest things we have going for us in the Caribbean is the fraternity among the leadership. Sun would always say in those years that people will look back on these days as the halcyon days of the OECS. It was a time when we had less, but we had much more, simply because we had more time for each other were more respectful of one another, when we seemed more responsible and, and giving rather than endlessly demanding rights that should be earned. When John and I married, we decided to sail to Beckway for our honeymoon. The weather was foul, and at daylight we discovered that we had passed Beckway and that she was to starboard a way back. Sun had, as a mariner would, stayed up the night to check to see if we had arrived. How idyllic Beckway was, it still is. The only vehicle on the island in those days was Gough Wallace's Land Rover, and he used to drive along the beach at Frangie every morning. You could leave your house open and go out because everything would be safe. In those days, I got to know Sun more and more as we sailed to Mustique and spent time together. In the years that followed, he would arrive at our house with kind gifts into which he put so much thought, a jacaranda plant. Or one time he arrived with a coffee, t coffee table and beamed with pride that it, it had been made by Vincentian craftsmen, for he was always so proud of his Vincentian people and of their ability. His friendship with John would continue long after John retired as Prime Minister because the two of them never gave up their love and their commitment to these islands. They would speak frequently. As a matter of fact, we almost missed our last flight to New York because John was on the phone to Sun. After John's passing, Sun continued to look out for me. It is something I shall never forget. His words of advice, his endeavors on my behalf, his WhatsApps to keep in touch, telling me about his book and how the children are doing and so on. One thing is certain, he loved his St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the people of St. Vincent with a passion. His last WhatsApp to me was to celebrate St. Vincent's Independence Day on October the 27th. Sons of the Passion, was his children, as many of you have said, and his grandchildren. He always glowed with immense pride whenever he spoke of any of them. I never ever heard a word of criticism, regret, or disappointment when speaking of them. 
Today we are here mourning this terrible loss, but today we must also celebrate his life and his untiring efforts and achievements on behalf of these islands, the fruits of which we all enjoy. Today we give thanks that he came and touched our lives, and we know that his legacy will long remain with us because it is all around us and cannot be encapsulated in a simple obituary. In closing, I would like to borrow a few words from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing, leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. Footprints that another sailing all life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing. It is what son would have wished for, uh, of us. Rest in peace, my friend. I thank you. The words of Lady Janice Compton. It is important to note that her husband, the late John Compton, is also a son of the soil, Vincentian from the beautiful Grenadine Island of Union. To take the podium now is our Prime Minister, Dr. Ralph E. Gonzalez. Your Excellencies, inclusive of our friends who have come to us from overseas, members of the clergy, the family and friends of Sir James, and our brothers and sisters in Christ, the members of our community. Before I say something briefly today, this, this evening, this afternoon. I want to say that we have listened to three of the most engaging and powerful tributes I've ever had the pleasure, the honor to listen to those preceding by Sabrina and Mia and Lady Janice. I want to go further and say that in respect of Sabrina's, that I hope it is published and be published very widely. It's simply the most brilliant and moving tribute of a daughter to a father and and indeed thus far from the time Sir James died on the 23rd it is the tribute which in my humble opinion best captured the man son Mitchell and I hope that people for generations would read it. Uh, congrats. It's a labor of love. Fantastic. I have paid a mountain of tributes to Sir James Mitchell since his sad passing on the 23rd of November. I've done so numerous times on radio. I did so in Parliament on Monday the 13th. I did so too at the Alba Summit in Havana, Cuba on Tuesday the 14th. I wrote a tribute which was published in the Searchlight newspaper on Friday, December the 17th. And earlier today I delivered a tribute at his state funeral in Kingstown. Thus, in the interest of time, and it's getting very late, 
and for an avoidance of repetition by me, I shall make four brief but salient points. First, Sir James made a significant contribution to nation building, and he did so with love for the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and our Caribbean. And accordingly, he leaves a towering legacy as a true servant of the people. Secondly, Sir James touched for the better the lives of countless numbers of persons, and he did so selflessly. And thirdly, he was a family man who loved his daughters and grandchildren dearly. I would tell you, Sabrina, almost every time that he spoke to me, and which, as you know, was quite often, particularly since he demitted office in 2000 and then after the 2001 elections. And everything that you all have been doing, whatever, he will take his time and explain to me, and he would be so proud. For instance, he's the first person who drew to my attention that the role which you have not just in the regional, but in the International Basketball Federation, was one which was not equaled by anyone else in any other sport in the Caribbean. And he was quite correct about that. Every one of you, I, I know what you have been doing over the years, the last 20 years. Believe me, Gabby, I'm telling you, <laughs> he is, he is Fill me with all of it. And I repeat, your accomplishments gave him immense joy. So even though he didn't tell you, believe me, the good Lord knew what was in his heart and what he gave out. And fourthly, despite the fact that we were political combatants around along partisan political lines. As you know, we respected and admired each other. And never on one occasion that we resorted to any act of malice against each other. He was generous with his time to me and otherwise. And I believe I myself to him. And in time, we became friends. And because each of us held the office of prime minister for very long periods of time, we knew and understood each other's challenges and actions. And as you know, he jokingly called the two of us, both of us, a club of two. And I would say, well, it's a club of three because there's Arnim. He said, yes, we, we, we love and admire Arnim. He said, but you and I have won elections and we have been prime minister for so long. So we had a club of two. Now my other club member has gone. I feel a little bit lonely, as I said today. And, um, but there's Arnim, and we will continue to do our work. And we remember Arnim, he has gotten I don't think he's here. Well, he couldn't be here. He has got, he's gotten a broken ankle. And we remember him with, with love. So instead of... You know, we were, we were here.
and the sea. As children, we got to live and experience his special interests. Our dad's love of sailing meant that we as kids spent our summers sailing to the Southern Grenadines as well as to Martinique on our yacht Sapphire. Our dad was passionate about introducing us to new things like French perfume and French cheese and croissants. We were too young then to enjoy the wine, but he certainly did. This early introduction to French culture stayed with me, and later in my life, I studied design in France, which is where I met my husband. During these sailing trips to Martinique, we would stop off at St. Lucia and spend time with his brother Reginald, Uncle Junior as he was better known, and with his sister Auntie Gloria, as well as with our cousins and our grandmother, Louis Baines. Our dad had a close friendship with his cousin Sir John Compton and Lady Janice, and so did we with their children. During the later years, our dad spent much time on Beckway with his younger brother, Uncle George. In fact, during my time away from Beckway in the last three years, my husband Hysam enjoyed frequent Sunday lunches at Helianthus with my dad, Uncle George, and Auntie Dagren. Hysam's close friendship with my dad always kept me close, even when I was not in Beckway. Our dad was born in room one at the French Penny Hotel in Beque, which back then was his family home. His mother was from Mount Pleasant, and as such, we always had a strong connection to this part of the island. One of my earliest childhood memories was being waken up, woken up before the sun came up to water plants in our small farmhouse. That's what Daddy called it. We would huddle into the beat-up Land Rover and make our way up the winding roads to Mount Pleasant. If by chance we didn't get out of bed fast enough to make it to the Jeep on time, he would leave without us. We would then have to run or jog up the hill, uh, which was of course at 5.30 a.m. quite challenging. Once there, we'd have to pump the water with the handheld pump as there was no electricity in the house. The tall grass would scratch our legs as we dragged a heavy hose watering plant, and plant after plant. I didn't particularly enjoy this task, and at such a young age, I didn't get it. Why so much effort to keep a small plant alive? Often we would spend weekends at the little house. I loved it when we slept there, as this meant I didn't have to wake up at 5.30, but could wake up at a reasonable hour, have cocoa tea, and then watch the sun rise before watering the plants. A reasonable hour for my dad would have been probably 6 a.m. During the day, he would teach us how to graft trees. We would look at insects and leaves under his microscope. He was eager for us to learn. Knowledge was important for him. He shared a deep respect and passion for learning, along with our mom, and we were fortunate to learn much from them both. As night fell, the kerosene lamps would come out, and so did the poems. We would enjoy reciting poetry. Our dad would cook dinner, and our mom would sit at the old-fashioned typewriter, typing and editing his political speeches. These, these were the days of his journey before becoming prime minister. Fast forward years later, many of those trees are still alive at what is now Villa Helianthus and bear fruit. The watering of the trees in the dry season all made sense. 
the, the ones that did not make it were replanted and looked after by his gardener, Isa. Our dad would often remind us of the days we spent watering the trees as children, and to put it simply, if you want to reap the benefits of something, you have to work hard at it and never give up. If one tree dies in the drought, the next rainy season, you plant another. He did not believe in giving up. Such a thing did not exist for him. If I were in Bekwe, he would call me and insist immediately that I come and pick the fruit that were ready. If I couldn't make it that day, he would scold me. Sometimes he would even go as far as looking at the weather forecast and letting me know the risk of the rain and the wind of blowing the trees off at, the fruit off at night. When my daughter showed interest in his fruit trees, he was thrilled. It then all became about them picking the fruit. We were not the only ones that enjoyed his produce. Our dad enjoyed sharing whatever he had, and many of his friends and our friends enjoyed him showing up for a visit always with something to offer. He made friends of all ages. I realized later on that he wasn't planting those fruit trees for himself. He enjoyed giving. All year round, he had something to give someone special. He also enjoyed giving small plants he had propagated in his nursery. Our dad's garden wasn't only filled with fruit trees. He enjoyed the beauty in nature and had a great selection of hibiscus flowers. On my birthday earlier this year, he showed up with a huge smile and a basket of hibiscus flowers he had picked from his garden. He said, I know like me, you appreciate the beauty in nature. Our dad gave to his country, to his friends, to his children and his grandchildren. What I learned much later in life was that for my dad, love, love was about giving. I shall miss those moments. My daughter, Isla, will now read a poem. Great Trees Fall by Maya Angelou. When great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder. Lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly, our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity. Our memory, suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws unkind words left unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die, and our reality bound to them takes leave of us. Our souls, dependent upon their nurture, now shrink, wizened. Our minds, formed and informed by their radiance, fall away. And we are not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable ignorance of dark, cold caves. And when great souls die, the air around, um, after a period, 
teaspoons slowly and always regularly spaces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration our senses restored never to be the same whisper to us they existed they existed we can be be and be better for they existed That was the granddaughter of Sir James, the later James, Miss Ella Mitchell, and we went directly from uh, we went directly from the daughter right into the granddaughter, and now we have Sir James, um, that's Prime Minister Dr. Rav Gonzalez, who is exiting the church at this time, and the Honourable Mia Motley also, they are exiting at this time. But the tributes continue here at the St. Mary's Anglican Church in Beckway for in honor of the late Sir James Mitchell. At the next tribute that we have lined up to go is Miss Ella Mitchell Sutton, a granddaughter of Sir James, followed by Mrs. Violetta Alvarez, a friend of Sir James. And we still do have to wait to see if all of these will take place as we are running way behind time as Dr. Rav Gonzalez and Prime Minister Mayor Motley bid farewell to Lady Janice Compton, the wife of the late Sir John Compton. They are exiting the church at this time and of course they are exchanging pleasantries as they bid farewell and goodbye. So they are leaving the church and Miss Ella Mitchell Sutton, the granddaughter of Sir James, is already at the microphone and she will be rendering her tribute at this time. So far, the Donny, they, they, they are going well, but still quite way behind time. So we look to see if everything will happen as per the program or if they will drop some things. So we go to the mic. Life. He was a son, a sailor, a father, a train worker, a politician, an agronomist, a student, a teacher, a grandfather, a friend, a joker, and an inspiration. And though I shall always treasure him as my grandpa, I shall also treasure the writer within him. I wish to talk about the bond that he and I shared with our passion for reading and writing, and how that bond took us to the very end of his days. When I was a child, Grandpa always brought back a new book for me to read from his travels, specifically when he came back from England. Don's bookstore was his favorite place to shop. Though he came to be well versed in the age of technology, Grandpa always refused a Kindle to make book shopping easier. There's nothing quite like the smell of a fresh book, he would say. I guess I get that from him. Don's bookstore served as a location for his first book launching party. A few years ago, en route to England, he and I stopped there to go book shopping. The result was our suitcases being much heavier than when we first had arrived. I still have the last book he chose for me, The Silence of the Girls, a strong tale on women in ancient Greece. For a man that preferred facts over fiction, he always had excellent taste in the fictional novels that I preferred. He had an eye for all sorts of genres. After all, it was him that brought me my first copy of Harry Potter when I was a little girl. Though he preferred Ernest Hemingway and I preferred Jane Austen, we still found a bond in our, um, in our favorite types of literature. He was surprised and proud that my favorite novel was Animal Farm by George Orwell. It was not something that I usually liked, but he appreciated its take on society. In high school, I was battling the decision on what to major in for university. English literature, my favorite subject, and to help me on the path of becoming a writer or business management, a practical subject that might gain me a more successful career. Throughout my entire education abroad, Grandpa and I would email each other frequently. I told him of my dilemma, and he did not tell me what path to take. His only response was, my dear, a little boy from a shipbuilding family became prime minister. And so I applied to universities in Canada to study English. In 2017, I accompanied him to Dublin, Ireland, to a conference of former prime ministers and ex-presidents, of which he was an esteemed member. Thousands of miles away from home, Grandpa whipped out a printed copy of a poem I had written for class. 
I had no idea he brought this silly thing of mine across the Atlantic Ocean, but he had. Amongst these heavy intellects, Grandpa had me read my lengthy poem aloud. Apparently, it was irrelevant that former Russian Prime Minister Viktor Zubkov couldn't understand a word of English. Grandpa had a solution for this. I was to read my poem to the translator, who would in turn translate it to Russian for the Prime Minister to understand. He was so proud of me, and he would boast and tell everyone that we would encounter that I was accepted into all my choices of universities and was granted a scholarship, and that put my decision at ease. And that education of mine, of which would not be possible without him and his sacrifices, brought us closer than ever. Grandpa devoted the final year of his life to writing a final novel, a final autobiography. He would tell anyone he would encounter about this tremendous task he was undertaking. And absolutely no one was surprised this 90-year-old man was writing another book. All who knew him knew how sharp his mind was right until the end. While I was finishing up the last year of my undergraduate degree in Canada, Grandpa sent, would send me short snippets of his writing progress, along with title ideas, cover ideas, and tales of how he read chapters to his friends over dinner. My entire family can attest to how much he spoke of this book, his friends as well. Always have an agenda were the words he lived by. I wholeheartedly believe that when he finally finished writing, Writing his book, his life agenda was over. was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then I did a life.
company and asked me to sit at the back, be quiet and listen. In the end, being the only child there, I interacted more closely with this wonderfully energetic, enthusiastic, wise, tall, elegant, charming man that some called Son Mitchell, others like myself called him PM. These simple two letters, P and M, are a reflection of who he was, a prime man. He was also a prime father. Every time that he spoke of his daughters, his eyes shone with the sparkle of pride of a dad who loves them, cares for them, and wants